Looks like we're almost ready to go. See everybody but Karen, here she comes. Okay. Thank you. It is now 5.30 and I would like to call this to order the Malibu City Council regular meeting of October the 24th, 2022. This meeting is being held by teleconference due to the COVID-19 pandemic and we appreciate everyone's patience as we navigate this Zoom meeting process. Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. At this screen, you can click on the tab to either just watch the meeting or to sign up to speak on a particular item. Those who wish to speak during the meeting should follow the instructions at malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. Please make sure you visit malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting early to sign up to speak and download the Zoom application. The city clerk will call on those who have signed up to speak when the item is called, so you must be present in a Zoom meeting to be recognized. May I have a roll call? Councilmember Fair? Here. Councilmember Pearson? Here. Councilmember Yearing? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Here. Mayor Grisanti? Here. You have a quorum. Do we have any public speakers on the closed session item? I am checking right now, and no, you don't have any public speakers on the closed session item. We will now recess to the closed session to discuss the item listed on the closed session agenda. We will reconvene at 6.30 p.m. to begin the regular session and hear the closed session report. So I'll see you all in a moment.
Thank you for letting me in. Maybe I'll get a glass of water. Hi, Karen. Steve and Mikey will be here in a moment. I'm here. Wouldn't let me unmute. I understand. The same thing happened to me. Yeah. Okay. Are we ready? I'd like to call to order the Malibu City Council regular meeting of October 24th, 2022. This meeting is being held by teleconference due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And we appreciate everyone's patience as we navigate the Zoom meeting process. Council members and city staff are participating from remote locations and all votes will be taken by roll call. Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. At this screen, you can click on the tab to either just watch the meeting or to sign up to speak on particular items. Those who wish to speak during the meeting should follow the instructions at malibucity.org forward slash virtual meeting. Please make sure you visit malibucity.org virtual meeting early to sign up to speak and download the Zoom application. The city clerk will call on those who have signed up to speak when the item is called, so you must be present in the Zoom meeting to be recognized. Council members, if you have comments to make during the meeting, please raise your hand or, and I will call on you in turn so we can make our discussion clear for the record and the public. May I have a roll call? Council member Fair. Here. Council member Pearson. Here. Councilmember Uring? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Here. Mayor Grisanti? Here. You have a quorum. May I have a uh, lead the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to, 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 to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and, to, and the to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God. God Indivisible, indivisible with liberty, with liberty and, justice. and justice for all. Okay. May I have a closed session report? Yes, at 5.30 p.m., the council convened an open session and then recessed a closed session for the items listed on the posted agenda. All five council members were present and took no reportable action. Okay. Okay. Uh, May I have an approval of the agenda? I move to approve the agenda. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the agenda. May I have a roll, please? Council Member Fair? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Council Member Pearson? Yes. Council Member Uring? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. May I have a report on the posting of the agenda? The agenda for this meeting was properly posted on October 14th, 2022, with the amended agenda posted on October 21st, 2022. Perfect. Okay. Uh, item one, we have an item 1A today. Actually, we have more than one. Uh, we're going to start with a presentation of a commendation to Jeff Jennings. Whereas since moving to Malibu in the 1970s, Jeff Jennings has been an active member of the Malibu community. And whereas since Mr. Jennings served three terms on the city council from April 1994 to April 1998 and April 2000 to April 2008 and has served on the planning commission since June of 2008. And whereas, whereas in addition to his roles with the city, Mr. Jennings has served us as vice chair of the LA County Beach Commission President of the Governing Body of the Las Virginas Malibu Council of Government and Chair of the Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District Advisory Committee on Malibu High School. And whereas his community contributions go well beyond his service as an elected and appointed official and includes serving as a board member and referee for Malibu AYSO, an officer and board member of Malibu Little League, a board member and officer of the Malibu High School Athletic Boosters Club, a board member of the Friends of Malibu Urgent Care, and a member of the Malibu Rotary Club, 
And whereas his contributions have been recognized by several community business and professional awards, including the California Parent Teacher Association's Dignus by Distinguished Service Award, the Ventura Business Digest Best in Business Award, and the Malibu Times Citizen of the Year Award. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the City Council of the City of Malibu commends Jeff Jennings for his public service. And if this were an in-person, we would have wonderful grip and grin with Jeff. Jeff, are you going to respond to us? Um, I'm trying to, yeah. Any way we can put a camera on Jeff? I don't think that happens. Okay. Um, no, thanks very much. It, uh, it's sort of like having somebody read your obituary to you. Um, <laughs> appreciate it. Um, oh, I can't start the video. No, the host has stopped it. Um, yeah, I, I have been around the city for a long time, and I have watched and been an observer of the city process, and, and um, I know you've got a heavy agenda, and, and if, if you will indulge me for a few minutes, there's a couple of comments I want to make relative to um, a something I see as a problem a little bit. I think others do too. It's a, an issue of staffing, staff retention, um, and um, I want to try to express what I, the way I tried to look at that problem when I was back in the position of being able to deal with that problem. Um, and the first thing I tried to realize was that Malibu is not a very great place for people to come to work. It's the housing is impossible. The uh, commute is can be terrible. Um, there's not really a young person sort of social scene where you can go out and have a drink with uh, your coworkers after work or go to lunch with them. There's sort of if you're going to commute, you get back in your car and you go back home. So it, it makes it difficult to build staff. Esprit de corps, I guess. Um, and what I realized was that I needed them a lot more than they needed me. Um, in when the city first started, there was an idea that, oh, well, we don't really need staff. We can just have volunteer citizens come in and run the city. And that that lasted uh, an exposure, you know, maybe 15 minutes exposure to reality. And uh, and at the same time, Malibu, may, while it may be a difficult place to work, it's a great place to be from. I can remember when Vince Bertoni arrived here uh, as a young planner, and now he's the head of the uh, LA City Planning Department, the largest planning department in the, in the country, I believe. Um, so one of the things that I did, the way I approached it was to look at the organization chart. And I realized that in all of City Hall, there were only three people that worked for me, the city manager, the city attorney, and the city treasurer. And actually, none of them worked for me as an individual. As an individual, a council member is boss of no one, but only when you're acting together in a group are you, in fact, uh, the, somebody's boss. Um, everybody else in the city works for your city manager. And so I tried to take it that if I had a complaint about a a particular staff action or a staff individual, I made it my point to try to go to the city manager and, and let him deal with the problem. Uh, this is important for a couple of reasons. For one, it enhances the city manager's position with regard to his staff. It, it, it makes him the figure that they look to because he is, after all, their boss. And um, at, at the same time, the city manager has to be in a position to protect his staff. We've had city managers in this city that were so protective that communication between individual council members and any staff member below the city manager was prohibited. He just wouldn't allow it. I'm not suggesting that that was a great idea, but but it, it, you get the idea. Um, and, and so I, 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 I think that, you know, we're in the middle of an election season. Everybody's going to be talking about policy, but I think that, that enhancing staff is should be on everybody, the top of everybody's list, because your administration is going to stand or fall based upon your staff, not on what you do, not on your decision. It's going to be based on your staff. So thank you for the commendation. I appreciate it. Um, I'll try to pretend it wasn't my obituary, and I will let you get on with your meeting. Thanks very much. Thank you, Craig. Thank you so much, Joe.
Okay, that takes us to item 1B, which is a presentation of a commendation to Craig Foster. And by the way, I have Jeff's commendation. I'll drop it off to him. And I've got this commendation also for Craig. Jeff Jennings, I'll drop off Jeff's to him, and I'm going to drop off Craig's to his. Whereas Craig Foster has devoted himself to serving the Malibu community and Malibu students in many capacities, and whereas Mr. Foster has served as a founding member and first president of Advocates for Malibu Public Schools, AMPS, and been a leader in the long pursuit of the community's goal of achieving an independent, locally controlled school district, and whereas Mr. Foster was elected to the Santa Monica Malibu Unified School Board of Education in 2014, and has served as a sole board member from Malibu for the past eight years while also serving on the SMM USD Financial Oversight Committee and numerous other ad hoc committees. He has been an ardent supporter of improving the education of all students in SMM USD. And whereas Mr. Foster has served as a PTA president and parliamentarian and has been awarded California State PTAs highest honor, the Golden Oak Award, and he has also been involved in the passage and oversight of Measure M, the first ever Malibu-specific bond facilities measure. And whereas Mr. Foster has served as a GATE math teacher at Webster Elementary School, as well as a certified teacher in, and teacher specializing in home instruction for public school children unable to attend school in person, now, therefore, be it resolved that the City Council of the City of Malibu commends Craig Foster for his dedication to public education and thanks him for his service to the Malibu community. And Craig, I'd also like to say on a personal level, you're the best neighbor I've ever had. So is Craig available to accept? Craig is available. Thank you, Mayor Grisanti. Um, it's been just an incredible honor to serve the people of Malibu these past eight years and for some time before that. And it's been a joy to work with all of you on the council and in city leadership and all the members of Malibu City's councils throughout those years. You have all been stalwart protectors of our students and their families through what seems like and kind of really was crisis after crisis. And I thank you for that on behalf of the students and their parents and all of our community. And you've also generously granted me your trust and faith. And that has made all the difference in my ability to do my job. And I thank you for that as well. Um, I also would be remiss if I did not take this opportunity to ask every Malibu resident to vote for Stacy Rouse in, on November 8th so that she can replace me as Malibu's lone school board member. Um, it's incredibly important, as you all know, that uh, we elect a Malibu school board member. Great schools make for great communities and great schools require great leadership. So please, please, please remember to vote for Stacy Rouse on November 8th. And also please remember to vote for Esther Hickman, Miles Warner, Angela DiGaetano in that same election. Not only do they have my full support, but as you all know, they have your full support and the support of every single person running for city council in Malibu this election. Um, the school district and the residents of Malibu would be very well served by an overdue change in school district leadership. And we absolutely need to make Malibu's voice heard in this election. And the way we do that is by making sure to vote in the council election, uh, sorry, the school board election, which is on the front page of the mail-in ballot. So it makes it really easy. Um, so with that important bit aside, I thank you again, Mayor Grisanti, Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein, Council Members Ferrer, Pearson, and Euring. Thank you. And many, many thanks to the residents of Malibu who trusted me for so long and given me so much love. I am deeply grateful for all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. 
Okay, that brings us to item 1C, which is a proclamation recognizing November the 9th, 2022 as Malibu's annual day of preparedness. Receiving the proclamation will be Public Safety Director Susan Duenas. Whereas the city of Malibu is vulnerable to fires, floods, earthquake, rock slides, tsunamis, and other natural disasters, and whereas in November 2018, the city experienced the most damaging wildfire in the city's history, and whereas four, four years since the Woolsey fire, the community is still recovering from the physical and emotional damage the fire inflicted, and whereas it is important to remember our vulnerability to natural disasters and how critical it is to be prepared. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Malibu City Council does hereby proclaim November 9th at Malib as Malibu's annual day of preparedness and encourages its citizens to take at least one action on this day to become more prepared for disasters. Susan, do you have anything to say to that? Uh, just a few things. Thank you, Mayor. Um, as you know, the day of preparedness is, it's really meant to both acknowledge the and honor the work that is already being done every day. I recognize that people do things every day, um, but we also, you know, want to take this day and encourage everyone to take one action on November 9th as part like a big community effort to further the preparedness effort. Um, some ideas might be to uh, schedule a home ignition zone assessment with one of our fire safety liaisons. Refresh your emergency food and water supplies. Um, frequently, you forget about that. You make a kit and years go by. <laughs> so you might want to check out your food and water supplies. Check the batteries in your flashlights and smoke detectors. Create a preparedness kit for your car. That's always a big one uh, that I always suggest because your car is almost always with you. So you're not always at home. You could be anywhere when disaster strikes. So it's great to have some stuff in your car. Um, take pictures of your home and your valuables. Now, date and time stamped, as I'm sure many people can attest to. If you have damage to your home, if you have pictures, date and time stamped, that could help you with any claim you have to pursue. And then talk to your family and your friends about what you're going to do during an emergency. Review your evacuation and reunification plans. Um, so these are just a few simple ideas, things that everybody could do in just one day. And it makes a difference when disaster strikes. Uh, no action is too small. It all adds up to more prepared Malibu. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. Okay, for item 1B, we have a presentation from West Basin Municipal Water District Drought and Programs Update. Uh, the District Director, Scott Houston, will present the update. Well, Are good you evening. Available, Scott? Yeah, can you hear me? We can hear you. Excellent. I don't think you'll get to see me. I don't know if I try to start the video, it says I can't to see my face, but I am here. And uh, just want to say thank you for having me. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Also on the call with me is our Assistant General Manager, E.J. Caldwell. Um, but I will be running through this presentation. I'll try to be efficient. We've got a number of slides, but I thought it was very warranted to give you all an update. So um, uh, if you'll move to the next slide, we'll get started. Okay, so West Basin is your regional uh, public water district, and our mission is quite simple. We provide a safe and reliable supply of high quality water to the communities we serve. Next slide. And the great thing about this year is we are celebrating 75 years of service. Uh, in 1947, residents of our beach cities areas found that they were over pumping groundwater, they were getting saltwater intrusion. And because of that, they need to look at a new water supply. So this is again after World War II. And the only option at the time was to basically form a regional water district and join Metropolitan Water District and buy water from the Colorado River Aqueduct. So uh, you'll see in a little bit, our, our portfolio has diversified over the years, but our mission remains the same uh, coming on 75 years later. Uh, next slide. 
And so these are my colleagues. There are five directors, just like uh, you all on city council, there are five of you. Uh, I do send my greetings or bring my greetings from uh, directors Williams, director Gray, director Alvarez, and director Deer. As a matter of fact, earlier today, we had our uh, monthly board meeting, which went to uh, probably three or four hours uh, on our own. But um, I'm very proud of our, of our colleagues that get to serve with. Each of us represent different areas on your behalf. So the next slide will showcase our service area. Uh, we are large. We are uh, non-contiguous. Uh, we are a special district under California water law. Uh, we serve 17 cities, almost a million residents, and uh, I represent Division 4, which is shown here in red. And uh, so from Rosecrans Boulevard down El Segundo all the way up to you all in Malibu and Topanga, I'm very, very happy to uh, be your public servant. Next slide. We are a member of the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, and I'm sure most of the council is aware of that, but Metropolitan, uh, it, it entails 26 member agencies, and West Basin is one of those, and we're the fourth largest agency by assessed value. Uh, so we play a very big role in local California water. As a matter of fact, Director Gray on our board, she is the current chair of the Metropolitan Water District. She is coming to the end of her tenure of four years in that role. And the other thing I wanna highlight about this map is basically this represents, yes, the 26 member agencies that all pull water from metropolitan, particularly through our two aqueduct systems, but also this is about 19 million residents of the state of California. So almost half of the residents in our state rely in some way, shape or form on metropolitan system. I think that's tremendously significant. Next slide. And the great question, of course, is where does our imported water come from? And in California, about two thirds of our precipitation falls to the north, while about two thirds of the population lives in the south. And uh, in the metropolitan system, we have two aqueducts that feed us. So we obviously have the Colorado River Aqueduct bringing water in from the state line, as well as the state water project that brings water in from the Delta region up north, basically what you see along the five freeways. So these two, systems are, um, they are lifeblood into Southern California. What we have not put on here, of course, is the Los Angeles aqueduct that is owned and operated by the city of Los Angeles. So, you know, we do not have access to that water, that's for Angelinos. But those of us in the other independent cities and in the county areas, we're very dependent obviously on MET for some of our water. Next slide. And as you know, California, this is the third year of consecutive drought, uh, basically, 98% of our state is in a, uh, in a drought condition. Um, all 58 counties at this point um, have you know, mandated drought emergencies uh, in place. Um, and this is a, a sobering statistic, but January through June 2022 of this year were the driest uh, first six months on record in California history. So um, you know, obviously we have a lot of uh, things that are taking place right now. I know everyone's aware of it, but uh, it never hurts to really put that back out to the public so they understand. Next. Uh, this is a fairly recent September 8th uh, picture of the drought monitor. Once again, shows you uh, the drought conditions, severe to extreme drought, especially down uh, into our area, just a little bit north of us. Next. Now, this is one of the ones I wanted to take a moment just to explain. So Lake Mead storage levels, obviously this is extremely important. Uh, it was uh, the first ever shortage level one on the Colorado River was declared in August of 2021. And that resulted in the water supply allocation cuts to Arizona and Nevada that took effect in 2022. And I uh, also wanna let you know that the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation 24-month uh, study shows that Lake Mead elevations projected to end this year, 2022, at approximately 1,047.6 feet. 1,047.6 feet. So that would trigger a level 2A shortage condition, and that would impose additional water allocation cuts on Arizona and Nevada, along with cuts to Mexico in 2023. And uh, the one other thing I'm gonna mention is that the seven states that rely on the Colorado River, we must present a plan to uh, USBR, Bureau of Reclamation, to reduce use by two to four million acre feet 
over the next couple of years. Otherwise, the federal government will implement its own measures. And there's been a lot of uh, coverage on that in the local newspapers recently. So uh, there's, there's a lot of um, dialogue and discussions going on with the seven states and the federal government because obviously we would love to work on every way we can do this uh, on our own in a way that uh, that the government would support rather than have them come in and dictate uh, what we do. So we are all working diligently on that as we speak. Next. One thing I'm very proud of at West Basin is, uh, you know, we always try to be ahead of the curve and really think long term. And so uh, ironically, it's been almost a year, but uh, back in November of 2021, our board ratcheted things up for the West Basin service area, uh, what we call a level three shortage response. And that means we were asking our constituents, including Malibu and Topanga, to look at voluntarily conserving 21 to 30%. Uh, you know, the governor obviously had called for a 15% voluntary reduction. Um, what we were looking at in our area, as well as looking at the water conditions from both the State Water Project and the Colorado River, uh, our board had a lot of foresight and uh, we wanted to just make sure that we are ahead of this curve. So we did that. And then secondarily, um, with everything that happened to the north of you all with uh, Las Virgenes, uh, who is supplied just by State Water Project water. Uh, meanwhile, at West Basin, our pipeline coming into your area uh, to you all, Malibu and Topanga is serviced by the Colorado River water. So on the one hand, we were a little bit more insulated than your neighbors to the north, but on the other hand, we wanted to make sure that all of us understand that we need to share in this, uh, in this uh, effort together. So uh, that's what we took that action. I'm very pleased to say our retailers, including uh, District 29, have been working diligently with us. But uh, again, that's very important that uh, we've been trying to make sure we're ahead of this, uh, this curve for our constituents. Next slide. Uh, and now obviously now we have statewide prohibitions on wasteful water uses uh, coming from, of course, the State Water Board. So I'm not gonna read the whole list, but I'll just say obviously there's some simple ones that we all pretty well get. Outdoor watering that allows water running off in the sidewalks and goes out into the storm drains. You know, washing hard surfaces like driveways and sidewalks that don't absorb water. Washing your car on the street without a shutoff in nozzle. I mean, these are things that unfortunately people were moving back into that old behavior after the last big drought. One other one's very important is the last one, watering ornamental turf on public medians. And that's a, a difficult one because if you have recycled water to utilize, you know, there's no restrictions. But if you do not, if you're using potable water, uh, the state obviously is asking you not to do that. And so we're working with all of our cities and, and unincorporated areas to do that to the best of their ability while also maintaining the trees, the tree health. Next slide. And uh, in Malibu, of course, uh, under our level three shortage, we've been asking for that target of 30%, but uh, your area has responded. So two days per week on outdoor watering. Um, it looks like here it says Monday and Thursdays for odd number addresses, Tuesdays and Fridays for even number addresses. Um, but the point is, is that as things were shifting, different water districts have different resources, but West Basin, we aligned with the city of Los Angeles, our next door neighbors, to try and ease some of the confusion with everyone and just say, look, two days per week, 15 minutes or less, that should be an adequate uh, amount for us. Um, thankfully, we're not quite in the restriction of Los Virginis or those other neighbors, if you will. Um, and also, I want to note number three, which is removal of ornamental, excuse me, municipal ornamental turf. We have a program for that, too, for where um, cities, school districts, special districts can take out grass, and we work with you all on a rebate program um, that's a little different than those that we have for our um, residential commercial. And so I encourage your staff to make sure you talk to our staff, I'm sure they've been talking, uh, to look at options in Malibu. Next. But what I also want to showcase is, you know, it's not all gloom and doom at the same time because, you know, this district, West Basin, which you all are a part of, we have worked diligently over the years to reduce our imported water use. And so, as you see, uh, back in 1990, we could have been up to 200,000 acre feet a year of imported water. And we have significantly reduced that uh, as of even the year 2020 and beyond. 
that uh, we uh, use a lot less water in our service area, even as the population has grown. And the next slide, the next slide shows uh, LA County Water Works District 29 water use, which I have to tell you that includes Malibu, Topanga, and Maria Del Rey. That's the, the system in our network that serves those three areas. Obviously, you all are the largest one, but uh, for what it's worth, again, significant water savings over the years. Uh, obviously, some fits and starts, but if you look at the big picture, we're really happy to see the progress that's been made in your area. Next slide. And this is just a number of more recent data. You compare this to the year 2020, that's what we're looking at right now versus the current. So you can see that in District 29, you all, um, you've had some ups and some downs relative to 2020, but you have to look at 2020 as well uh, on that barometer, meaning, you know, there were, some dry periods, um, or excuse me, some wet periods back in uh, in uh, March of 2020. There was a lot of rainfall, for example. So that can make these numbers look a little hairy, if you will. But in the big picture, especially you look toward August, you look at July and August, even June, you all have been doing really, really well to reduce the water usage up there. Next. Okay, water recycling. And I'll try and go through this quickly as well. One of the things that West Basin is known for is our recycled water program. So next slide. For those who haven't visited us, we do have a major water recycling facility in the city of El Segundo, just south of LAX. We produce 30 to 40 million gallons a day of recycled water. Uh, we're basically taking treated water from the Hyperion plant uh, in Los Angeles by the airport. And we recycle that water and then put that out into our community. So that saves water that would have gone to the Santa Monica Bay otherwise. Uh, we are very unique. We make five specific types of recycled water. Uh, I think I'll talk about that in one second. Uh, we do host visitors throughout the year. So 13,000 visitors throughout the year between uh, the school kids that get to come and visit, which we pay for those field trips, as well as members of the public on our public tours. Uh, and uh, we certainly host a number of different groups, organizations, and even delegations from around the world who want to see the plant. And we also have over 100 miles of purple pipe in our system down in the South Bay region, as well as multiple satellite facilities. Next slide. And these are the five types of water. Um, we do outdoor irrigation. We do groundwater replenishment water. So that basically we continue to put recycled water into the barrier to keep out saltwater intrusion. And that water is potable water. It's drinking water quality that we produce at our facility. You actually can come visit us. You can drink the water. Um, and that has to at this time go into the ground. And again, it, it, it achieves our original mission, which was making sure that we're not overdrafting our um, salt, or excuse me, our ocean, uh, our ocean aquifer over here getting saltwater intrusion. So to this day, we continue working on that. And then we do have three refineries in the service area that utilize recycled water as, as well as a number of industrial uses. So that's why we have cooling tower, low pressure and high pressure boiler feed water at our plant. It's a, it again is a very unique facility. Next slide. Um, but recycling, of course, saves water for drinking. So every drop of water that we can recycle from Hyperion allows us to buy less water from Metropolitan. It frees water up from the Colorado River and from the Delta for other agencies that don't have a plant like ours. It also, as I mentioned, helps to protect that discharge going out into the Santa Monica Bay. And so as we look at the future of recycled water and growing our facility and the operations, that's going to continue to secure our water in this region, but also help those who do not have the assets that we do. Next slide. Okay, I'm getting a little toward the end here and talk about conservation and water use efficiency, which I think is, is the biggest thing we can talk about today. And so we'll go on to the next slide. Um, Super Cali frugalistic. That is the expression that we have come up with at West Basin. We've been working with all of our retailers to get that message out. We're reducing water use and waste. We, of course, are doing more with less, but we're also helping to preserve our environment and contribute to a thriving community and economy here in the West Basin service area. Next slide. 
Uh, one of the great programs, and I'm going to give you a couple statistics. We couldn't fit them on this slide, but I want to read a couple things to you all, is Malibu Smart. And so back in 2017, West Basin entered into a partnership with the city of Malibu, you all, and LA County Waterworks District 29 to implement the Malibu Smart program. And the partners applied to the Department of Water Resources for a state grant, we were awarded $1 million to look at uh, different rebates and conservation programs to our communities. So one of the things I wanna mention, for example, the Malibu Smart program provided free installation of smart sprinkler timers and a, up to $5 a square foot rebate for grass replacement. And its project's goal was to conserve 28 million gallons of water per year. And I'm happy to say that we have exceeded that goal. We have conserved up to 31 million gallons of water per year. Um, also, I wanna just say thank you to the mayor and the members of the city council, how, how you all and your staff have been so wonderful to work with in promoting this program. And we had a lot of fits and starts, as you know, because obviously the Woolsey fire hit in the midst of that, as well as the pandemic, but uh, it's a tremendous program we're proud of. Let me give you two other statistics. Grass replacement with this program, and this does include both Malibu and Topanga, but we have replaced over 72,000 square feet of grass in your area. And we also have installed drip irrigation mm -hmm. that covers up to 32,800 square feet. So that's pretty amazing. And uh, I'm very, very proud of this program um, as it has been a pilot program for us. And you all have been a huge part of that. Next slide. Our conservation accomplishments since 2015, um, West Basin works on a lot of ways to make sure that uh, our residents and businesses can save water. And so I am proud to say that uh, we have provided more than 12,000 free rain barrels since the year 2015 to the residents of our service area. And we provided residents with free water conservation kits. We have worked on uh, water use efficiency surveys and devices for industrial and commercial kitchens. Um, and one other thing I'm very proud of on the upper right is our residents have removed over 3 million square feet of grass since the year 2015. So West Basin has been a leader on taking out grass and putting in drought tolerant landscapes. Next slide. So once again, our grass replacement rebate program is in full force. Uh, everyone who lives in the West Basin service area and businesses as well, you can get up to $3 per square foot to remove grass. And in some areas, you could qualify for more. Everything is at our website, westbasin.org. Um, remember, about half of the water that we use in this region is for outdoor irrigation. So every drop that we can save on outdoor watering is significant. Next. Our free rain barrel programs continue. We have three more events as we get through the fall season. Uh, so I'm, I don't have one as close to you all this year, but uh, at the same time, our residents can register for these. They are first come, first served on the mornings that these are offered. Um, but we will have uh, Division 4 will be on November 19th right here at our Ed C. Little Water Cycling Facility in El Segundo. But residents can go to any one of these, but you do need to pre-register free rain barrels. Next. One of the great things that I think did come out of um, dealing with fire and fire risk and certainly was actually residents up in Malibu talking to me after the Woolsey fire was looking at firescaping. And so West Basin did do a series of workshops on that. Uh, some of these were held during the pandemic and they were virtual and we still have those online. So if you go to our website, westbasin.org slash firescaping, you can find that information. I can also share with you all that it inspired us at West Basin. We also rolled this out to the Palos Verdes Peninsula, which has a very similar client, climate uh, to Malibu, Topanga. So um, this has been a very beneficial program to our residents and businesses. Next. Uh, another thing that we have done coming out of the pandemic is a lot of things went virtual. We're trying to maintain some of that. So we call these West Basin chats. Uh, if you sign up to a West Basin chat, these are hosted live by a uh, staff person from West Basin. They usually about 30 to 40 minutes, but you can get your questions answered when it comes to our grass replacement rebate program. And uh, that's been extremely uh, beneficial 
to our residents uh, as they've tuned in. Next. These are conservation resources, our website, Metropolitan's website, and SoCal WaterSmart. Also, uh, District 29, I believe, has a lot of resources on their website. So we just want to make sure the public has these different resources to look at. Next. And with that, that concludes my presentation. Uh, I do want to say thank you so much to the city of Malibu, uh, the residents and businesses of Malibu, to, yes, the city council. You have been wonderfully supportive of West Basin, the work we do, but also your staff and our staff work hand in glove together. Uh, it's an extremely strong partnership over the years, and um, I'm proud to be a piece of that. This is my email, info at scotthouston.org, info at scotthouston.org. That goes straight to me. I am always in touch with communities, so feel free to reach out to me. Uh, so I just want to say thank you so much. I'm happy to answer any questions, and uh, myself and EJ Caldwell are here if you have any questions. So thank you, Mayor Gasanti. Thank you, Scott. Okay, that brings us to item 2A, communications from the public concerning matters which are not on the agenda, but for which the City Council has subject matter jurisdiction. Do we have any public speakers who've signed up? Yes, you have 18 speakers signed up for this item. The first few are Don Schmitz, Ark Fashad Munaim, Chris Delo, Scott Haley, and Deborah Bianco. We'll hear from Don Schmitz first. Hey, Don, Thank are you. you in the room? I am, uh, Mayor Brasante. I have two slides I'd like to show the council, please. Sure. So I'm speaking to you tonight in regards to a change of policy that the Planning Department has implemented as it pertains to the calculation for impermeable lock coverage uh, on any application for a new home or a significant remodel. And this is a, a pretty big departure uh, for decades, literally. The city has considered pools to be permeable because they have enough freeboard to retain uh, rainwater. In fact, you can see uh, from the city's webpage uh, taken last Friday that swimming pools and spas are not counted in impermeable uh, coverage calculations. This has dramatic implications on folks. Uh, there's uh, uh, calculations which are done down to the decimal point and folks who have been working with the planning department for a number of years. It would also knock out a number of existing homes from ever aspiring to have a pool on their property if they are already over the impermeable lock coverage calculations. Uh, next slide, please. So I would just urge that uh, this be something that uh, uh, be vetted through the public process. I'd note that the municipal code specifies that applications accepted by the city shall be processed and approved subject to the provisions of this title that were in effect at the time that the application was completed. But it's more than that. I mean, this is a very, very dramatic departure. And I think it's something that ought to be looked at uh, uh, with a lot of public input by uh, perhaps the RACES and the Planning Commission. And uh, the best that we can tell, this was something that was done unilaterally. So uh, I'm sure that uh, the Planning Department has uh, rationale for why they've taken this step, but it really ought to be something that has a lot of public input. So with that, I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Schmitz. Our next speakers are Krishad Munayim, followed by Chris Delo, Scott Haley, Deborah Bianco, and Marilyn Costantino. Krishad, are you available? Yes, I am. Thank you. Uh, good evening to the Honorable Mayor, Council Members, and Members of the Public. My name is Arfakashad Bunaim. I go by AK for short. Uh, I am one of the project managers at Schmitz & Associates, and I work on a number of uh, projects in the city, specifically for property owners who wish to have a pool as one of their outdoor amenities. So I'm speaking on behalf of the same topic that Don Schmitz talked about, as uh, for pools being considered as uh, per permeable lot coverage calculations. I've worked on a number of applications, uh, coastal development permits, APRs, where swimming pools have never been considered as part of impermeable lot coverage uh, until October of this year. Uh, additionally, I've submitted applications and when there has been no activity for months and months, no reviews, no incomplete letters or formal determinations have been made. Uh, we understand that the city does not have all the resources to complete their reviews in time. And at those such times, we don't receive any kind of determination. We make our re resubmittal, 
But then we hear about these changes in policy that renders our projects useless. So we are essentially restarting the application process when we have submitted our applications for months over months. Furthermore, it's very hard to understand that without any prior notice and without codifying or providing any kind of written agreement uh, passed by our legislative bodies that can just change our projects. You cannot just justify an application with unwritten policies and codes without some kind of formal discussion or notice. It's, in this sense, it's a little difficult to understand on what scale or justification there, there are, are, are application reviews without having any kind of unwritten policies in place. And on, on this basis to, to conclude, it's important to have some kind of deliberation among staff, commission, commissioners or council members and then better educating the public about instituting such changes. Uh, second, uh, codifying it and making it transparent in the Malibu Municipal Code or uh, the local coastal program. And this also helps the public understand the direction that the city is going in. Uh, instead, staff has been informing us unilaterally with no headlines that there has been changes to such projects. With that, I'd just like to conclude my statement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Chris Delo, followed by Scott Haley, Deborah Bianco, Marilyn Costantino, and Evan Contino. Hey, Mr. Delo, are you available? Chris, you should see a pop-up asking you to unmute. Thank you, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, wonderful. Uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor Grisani, Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein, and esteemed council members. Uh, my name is Chris Delo, and I work with Schmitz & Associates. Many of you know me. Uh, I've been working in Malibu for 20 years as a professional land use planner and attorney. Um, Don, uh, my associates, my colleagues Don and, and AK, have already uh, gone in depth uh, on this subject tonight, which I wish to speak about, but I, I do wish to add a couple comments to what they had said. Um, you know, as a, a permit expediter and, and, and land use planner, I, I think the most frustrating thing for me is not having a, a stringent code. Malibu is well known for having a stringent code. And, and then, you know what, I, I don't object to that because the general plan vision statement says that Malibu is a unique place and it needs to be protected. And I agree with that. And, you know, this firm has never come uh, forward advocating for uh, 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 you know, less stringent development standards. Um, and that's saying something. And I think what, what the problem here is not the standards, it's the fact that it's when I have a client that's had a, a project in for three to four years, okay? And, and they do come in for three to four years. And then at the very end, the day before a hearing, I get told that uh, the project is not in compliance with the LCP and my client has to change their whole project and that delays the project another year. That's the thing that drives me up the wall. Um, and I think that this was, Jeff Jennings was speaking to this the other night at the, the planning commission uh, and, and Commissioner Jennings made some really good points. And this was one of the things that he raised was the pool policy change. Um, and, you know, it's, it is affecting several of our clients uh, and it's affecting them in a way where, you know, again, they have pools already in and if you change this policy, it's going to make their, their development uh, application infeasible. Um, I just don't think it's fair. The, these, you know, when you have long established written policies such as this one, which has been in effect since the beginning of cityhood and the IZO, and you change it without any written notification whatsoever. I mean, it, like, I, like Dawn said, the, the policy still notes on the website that pools are considered permeable. Uh, when you make changes and you don't tell people about them, I, it's not fair to the residents of Malibu. It's not fair to the to the professionals such as myself who work in this business and, and who try and explain to our clients what the rules are before they come into the permit uh, for the permit process. So I would uh, I would join my colleagues in asking you to please uh, direct uh, uh, staff uh, to apply the codes and the policies as they exist. And if 
changes are desired, then uh, to take those changes through the process of, uh, of Zoraces and a local coast program amendment. Thank you very much for your time tonight. Thank you, Mr. DeLone. May, are you having issues with your camera? I, I turned my camera off because I was having issues with my connectivity. And when we have a break, I'm gonna hook, a, hook it up to a hard line because the Wi-Fi is not great. Understood. Our next speaker is Scott Haley, followed by Deborah Bianco, Marilyn Costantino, Evan Contino, and E. Barry Haldeman. Hello, Mr. Hello. Haley, are you available? I love when you call me Mr. Haley too. That's really great. Um, I signed up to, the, to speak uh, to y'all today. I'm a small business owner now for the past 45 years in the construction business. <clears throat> I've had four projects put on hold recently in the last month. I have never seen uh, things as bad in the past 45 years. Projects are being stopped because of the falling effects. COVID, the Woolsey fire, inflation running, I feel between 10 and 30% in my business. Supply chain delays three years, three months up to a year, back order materials months, and, and the rising interest rates um, in, in the construction business. <clears throat> I'm looking for a pathway to get some relief for Malibu residents in the process of developing or building a sing single family homes. Some of the examples of delays and price uh, increases are, are, are such. For instance, to order a sub zero refrigerator, I have to have a 12 month lead time. To order Anderson windows, it takes a nine month lead time. Fleetwood doors and windows, it takes uh, another nine months. Um, I recently have a project I'm under construction on and in 2021, the lumber quote was $68,000. In 22, the increase went to $139,000. The price increased by 50%. These are a few items. I, I could have hundreds of these items, by the way, I could, I could quote, but I just picked a few just, to, just that stuck out. A 10 foot piece of gray uh, electrical PVC pipe was $28 last year. It's 87 this year, a $59 increase. Uh, 10 foot schedule 40 uh, uh, half inch pipe was $1.50, now it's $7.20. A 40 amp service panel was $900, now it's $2,100. Um, the, the, what the residents have gone through the, with the, with the, with the uh, Put to for the uh, the following. The, they they had to in the in the Woolsey fire. They had to find temporary housing, deal with the seed processing, deal with insurance companies, deal with Edison, hire architects, and engineering consultants, go through the whole permitting process, uh, bid their house to a contractor, and after that time, at, and after all that time, they realize they cannot afford to build their house. This process affects not only Woolsey fire projects but similar projects. It also adds two year uh, similar projects that not in the Woolsey that were in the Woods Valley. That's uh, added two years of pro they went through two years of the process of getting permits in the first place. Considering all this, I think it would be reasonable, fair, uh, and decent for the city of Malibu uh, to allow the city of Malibu's residents to have a one year stay in their op uh, opening, keeping their permits open. Some relief is so some relief would be provided them. After we have been through through so much in the last four years, I feel this is not a lot to ask. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Scott. Our next speaker is Deborah Bianco, followed by Barron Cosentino, Evan Contino, E. Barry Haldeman, and Noah Topley. Hi, Deborah. Are you available? Deborah, you should see a pop-up. Uh, there you go. Deborah, you are unmuted if you want to speak. Deborah, are you there? You may be having issues with your microphone. Mayor, if Deborah is unavailable, we could move on to the next speaker we and try move to circle on back. And then you can go back. We can check back. Our next speaker is Marilyn Costantino, followed by Evan Contino, E. Barry Haldeman, and Noah Topley. Marilyn, are you available? Um, I am. Hold on. Hi, this is Deborah. I'm speaking on her phone. Can you hear me? Yeah. This is Deborah Bianco. We're trying to fix my phone, and we happen to be in the same place. Thank you, Mayor. 
I'm on the, I'd like to first thank the mayor and the rest of the city council because the last two city council meetings, everybody was in favor of helping the Malibu farmers market. I'm not gonna to go too far into the past, but one thing I think everybody's aware of, unfortunately, this, um, the county or the college hasn't heard Malibu's voice. I just heard Craig Swarster say Malibu's voice. Um, you know, the, the county and the college made a promise to the city of Malibu, and they have, that the farmer's market would go untouched. And not so much untouched, but untouched, okay? Last week, well, you, everybody knows, little by little by little, they're taking more and more property away, okay? There should be enough for us to at least put our vendors there. We had to turn around. We had to let go of 15 vendors, now what's left, we've been surviving. I had a meeting at two o'clock, I think it was last Friday with um, the city manager the, uh, and uh, as well as the deputy city. And one of the things that I asked them uh, to find out from the county if they're gonna take away more, if there's something that's gonna be the way, at least I could be prepared. And, um, and the city manager reassured me. He says, well, we spoke to them, Deb. Everything's going to be okay this weekend, which was a week ago. He says, and they promise, promise, how well that word promise, that they'll let us know if uh, something's going to come up. I arrived there, and don't you know, there's this huge truck. I sent you, I, I, I'm sending you guys pictures. I'm sure it'll be in the newspaper. Again. I mean, God, when is Malibu going to stand up for Malibu, for the residents? We voted you in. You know, I lived in Malibu for over 19 years. I'm not there now because of the fires, but shortly I will return. Okay. I get there on Sunday. We have 60 vendors. Where do we go? Anyway, that's not the issue now. You know what the issue? You know why I'm here now, guys? I'm here because you all said, hey. Let's support the Malibu farmers market. And you told that to staff and staff could only do what you allow them to do. So I'm asking you, some of you won't be here for the next city council meeting, I'm sorry to say, but unite as one tonight. The clock is ticking. We don't have much more time. You guys are all, you, all of you are, are, are business savvy. You should understand when, when the clock is ticking on business, we could go down fast. Our, I feel like I'm drowning and our hands keep bouncing up, yet we have the best damn food in Malibu there. We've been there 22 years, guys. We're good. No, actually 24 years, okay? We need you to unite as one and agree tonight, please agree tonight, to get us adjacent to Legacy Park. Sure, there are the obstacles in the way. In the way. Thank you, That's Deborah. All right, Mary. Our next speaker will be Marilyn Costantino on the same line. Marilyn, I'm sorry, you do have to unmute again. Okay, I'm here. And I would like to give Deborah two more minutes. No, that isn't how it works, Marilyn. I'm sorry. Well, but I did it last uh, week. I gave, min I gave some of my minutes away. Marilyn, do you wish to speak? Speak, Marilyn, go ahead. It's gonna cut you off. Speak. Okay, all right, Deborah says speak. I will speak. Okay, can I start? Yes. Okay. So uh, my name is Marilyn Cosentino. I'm speaking in support of the Malibu Farmers Market. All I have to say is I'm appalled. I worked in the corporate world for many years. No one has followed the chain of command as far as this particular incident is concerned. Why didn't the college notify the county manager, Maria Chan Castillo, about their intentions? Or did they just think that they could do whatever they wanted with no regard for the farmer's market? Ms. Castillo and or the college should have notified the city and or Deborah that they were taking half of what's left of the farmer's market, then had the gall to park a huge piece of equipment on the other end and not notify the city or Deborah beforehand. Every Sunday, she has no idea what to expect or how to set up the market. And I, I just can't understand how this, this has been going on now eight weeks and she gets there and doesn't have a clue because she's never told ahead of time, come on, she had a contract. 
that none of this stuff was supposed to happen. There would be disturbances, but this is goes far beyond disturbances. No communication whatsoever ahead of time. This could have been planned before all of this. We could they could have all sat down together and come up with some solutions before the college just one day went in there and took took over half of the market. So this is my concern. You know, I like Deborah is saying, I was uh, I'm praying that you guys can really come up with some solutions. It's very frustrating. The farmers are losing money. Deborah's. Uh, having a hard time here to c trying to deal with all this stuff because there's no communication. And I don't understand why this is all happening. Why has the county not communicated with the city? And why has the city not communicated to Deb what they were doing? Every week she goes there and she doesn't know what to expect. And this time she'll send you the photo of the huge piece of equipment that was at the other end, not even where they started, it's at the other end and she's supposed to squeeze in there. It's crazy. So I really hope that uh, after eight weeks, this is going on the eighth week, that you can please come up with a decision so that this does not have to continue. Get us over there. Yeah. So please, you know, the only thing we can see reasonable at this point is what they, she's proposing is to get to the perimeter of Legacy Park. I don't see any other options. And you're not going to let me talk, right, Paul? Not gonna. You already did. Thank I you know, very but much. I wasn't going to get another minute. No. Nobody could. Somebody's here to give me another minute. You know that, right? You're done. I'm done. I have been with you. Our next speaker is Evan Contino, followed by E. Barry Haldeman, Noah Toplieb, and Lester Tobias. Hi, Evan. Are you available? I am. Uh, this is Evan Contino with Burge Architects, and I'm speaking on behalf of my office uh, regarding the pool policy that Schmitz and Associates um, office and associates have brought up. Uh, I trust and, and know that there's always good reason to change uh, the code or interpretation to the code, but there needs to be a more formal legislative process to do so. As mentioned, you know, we all know that Malibu is a geological and biological sensitive area, and it takes us architects along with other consultants and engineers to uh, plan to plan a project and make sure that it is feasible before it's submitted. And then in the submittal process, having changes to the code that can appeal your project is just catastrophic to the owner and they begin to have little faith in the process, which hurts all of us. Our job is to help uh, homeowners in Malibu get their projects, whether it's uh, new additions, new structures, or new homes built following the code and the rules in place. And there, there needs to be more uh, of a formal process to, uh, to change the code um, and notify the public and also not have it either retroactive to projects that are in that currently are in the process um or also have information about what would happen what happens to projects that are in in the process to give people time to plan around this that, that's it for me thank you very much Evan. Our next speaker is E. Barry Haldeman, followed by Noah Topley, Lester Tobias, Candace Brown, and Jefferson Wagner. Can Hi, you Barry. hear me? Yes. We can hear you. Okay, great. I want to talk about two quick things tonight. The first one is the MRCA, as many of you know, has a giant plan to put in a lot of campsites all over Malibu and also just outside of Malibu. They're having a scoping meeting virtually on Thursday, uh, Thursday, and I think the city has sent out some information, but I urge people to show up and also send in written comments over the next couple of weeks after that, because this could change all of Malibu. The other thing I wanted to talk about was the Film Society. As many of you know, we've been looking for a location since we left the Malibu Jewish Center, and we surveyed every venue in Malibu, and the only place that we can currently run the films in the way they should be run is the Malibu Pacific Church. Studios only give us first-run films when they can be shown in a pristine manner, and unfortunately, a lot of people have said, why don't you use the City Hall Theater, 
the City Hall Theater is not equipped in the right way to run these films, and we won't get them from studios. So uh, we're happy to help redesign uh, it, but that'll take some time, and it'll take a, a fair amount of reconstruction from Malibu. So in the meantime, we we really urge the city to please help us get into the church. I was very disappointed at a recent uh, Zoracis meeting, which was talking about changing the the zoning requirements when Councilman Uring indicated that there is no way that he would allow us to run our full schedule in the Malibu church. Um, and that, uh, and he also indicated that in his belief, if you had a Boy Scout meeting or Alcoholics Anonymous or any other kind of event, they would all need a temporary use permit. That's ridiculous. Um, this may be because um, he did disclose at the meeting that he lives close to the church, uh, but I don't know. So we're we're asking that that um, a city based on artistic uh, people living here, people in the business, etc., that doesn't even have a, a a theater, be allowed to run the film society in a place that is perfect for it. It's designed for that kind of thing. So we really ask the city to cut through all this stuff and just let us do it as they have for 12 years. I want to close with a quote from Councilman Uring that's in the Malibu Times. He said, we need gathering places. The fire changed our community. These community gathering places are extremely important because it gives you a chance to meet your neighbors. You can swap a beer. You can tell stories. You can complain about stuff or say how good everything is. It helps build community. Please, would the council cut through all this stuff and allow us to run our films Barry, where we're your time. Thank you, Barry. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Noah Topley, followed by Lester Tobias, Candace Brown, Jefferson Wagner, and Hap Henry. Hi, Noah. Are you available? Yes, I yes I am. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Uh, hello. <clears throat> now I will. Um, I'm also speaking about the concern with the Malibu Farmers Market. I would volunteer to give my time to Deborah, but I prepared my own words. So my name is Noah Taubley. And I am majorly concerned about the potential removal of the Malibu Farmers Market. I've been a resident of Malibu for about 20 years, 20 plus years, during which time me and my family have been shopping at the Malibu Farmers Market virtually every Sunday. And we spend obscene amounts on the best bread you can ever buy. I was devastated to learn that the market was being forcefully relocated from Legacy Park. And I've been following up with Deborah Bianco as you know, the farmer's market manager, on the status of this issue. Um, she's informed me that she had a phone meeting with the city of Malibu beforehand regarding the relocating of the market, and she learned that half the parking space is considered to be Legacy Park. Me, my family, and many other families, both in and surrounding Malibu, treasure, the, treasure this market, both as a source of fresh produce, really good bread, and as well as an integral social gathering hub. I guess from a personal perspective, in a town that relies mostly on and caters to the whims of tourists, given their finan our financial need of it, the Sunday market was one of the is one of the few regularly occurring events in the town that I has always felt has been for the people of Malibu themselves, and not as much for an external force. So I ask you, the city, can anything be done to resolve this issue and prevent the Malibu farmers market from relocating? That is my those are all my comments. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Noah. Our next speaker is Lester Tobias, followed by Candace Brown, Jefferson Wagner, Hap Henry, and Lindsay Horvath. Mr. Tobias, are you available? I am. Can you guys hear me? We can hear you. All right. Good evening. Uh, the bulk of the presentation that you guys received from me over the weekend was generated in 2014 when staff proposed a permanent policy on remodels and additions. Their work product was based on the premise that the actual code for remodels was unworkable. Now, this assertion couldn't have been further from the truth, but at the time, I felt it best to attempt to write a workable policy without challenging the premise. But it's eight years later, and the results are in. And the only good part of the policy is that they wrote the premise and the anticipated results into the document. So we have our metrics. 
It was sold as a solution to a part of the LIP that staff claimed to be indecipherable. Yet if we read the code, it says very clearly that if you remove for any reason more than half of the exterior existing walls of a structure, you must obtain a coastal development permit and you must bring the structure into conformance with the current LIP. So the premise for the policy is false. The first promise of the policy was that it would improve efficiency of processing projects, yet all it has done is add another layer of review to remodels and additions and another means of challenging otherwise decent projects, further delaying the review process. Now, the document goes on to state that it would promote project transparency when in practice, what it has done is to grant the planning department purview over things like hidden existing structural systems, buried concrete, and questions regarding construction methodologies for no discernible purpose. It forces full structural plans to be generated at the planning stage of the project. Finally, the, po the policy states that it will reduce staff time and cost when in reality, the policy has dragged the building department into the equation, requires additional meetings between applicants and city officials, and has been adding hours to commission hearings. We went from a simple analysis of an applicant showing how much wall they were gonna remove in a two-dimensional plan view to all sorts of calculations and machinations and discussions about adding opening, changing the structural characteristics of an existing wall, and perhaps most egregiously, refusing to let homeowners strengthen existing undersized foundations to any degree. So point number one, this is not a code. It's a policy that can be removed as quickly as it was implemented. Point number two, none of the restrictions in the policy can be found in the LCP or LIP. Point number three, the policy has not benefited homeowners, neighbors, or the city of Malibu in any way. Point number four, and this is important, there's no way that any remodel or addition can somehow increase a structure's nonconformity. Point number five, if Richard ended the policy tonight, Malibu would still have a remodel policy in place, and more importantly, it would be fully codified. It's completely understandable and workable. It would eliminate all the problems and costs noted above. Projects would be better built, use fewer resources and cost less. I would love to see Richard reach this conclusion on his own tonight, or failing that, I'm asking three of you to tell him to end it. This was a totally self- Thank you, Lester. Thank you, Lester. And we need to be healed, it needs to be revealed, removed at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Lester. Our next speaker is Candace Brown, followed by Jefferson Wagner, Hap Henry, Lindsay Horvath, and Annie Ellis. Hi, Candace. are you available? Candice, you should see a pop-up. Um, yes. There you go. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to give my time to Jefferson Wagner. You signed up for Jefferson is what you're saying? Uh, can I, I'll explain it. Yeah. Candace is here. I'm sorry, Mayor. Um, we had a video that Parker has uh, already downloaded. The video is about two minutes. And my speaking time is about two minutes. That's why I had somebody here with me to help furnish the extra minute that I will need. So Candace is here with me and I'm ready to go. We, we, we don't do the time donation, but she could play the video for her for her uh, three minutes that she gets and then you can speak Jefferson for three minutes. Perfect. Thank, thank perfect. you, thank, thank you very much. Um, can I go first and then the video, is that possible? Sure. Thank you, Paul, I appreciate it very much. Thank you, council members. Thank you very much for your commitment and best efforts for the benefit of our community. Several months ago, an agendized discussion about the nearly $17 million Malibu set aside funds for 90265 in Malibu libraries was a topic. Particular emphasis was about a creative library foundation uh, to serve uh, the benefit of other communities outside our area. Jefferson, and, uh, the library agreement is on the agenda for tonight. I'm afraid you're at the wrong place. In the agenda. Yes, Paul. Yes, you are correct. That's the only mention I'm making of the library at this point. I'm moving on to the video, which is not related to the future part of the meeting. Is that okay? No, it's not okay. If it's about the library, it belongs in the library. Okay. Well, how would you suggest I move forward, Paul? I would suggest that you thank us very much and go back on and sign up to speak during the library issue, if that's what you wanna talk about. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. That's what I'll do. I'm sorry, that was the only mention of the library is what I just said though. Excuse me, 
this is not the first time that this has occurred with the mayor cutting a, a member of the public off. The library provision later tonight is a very specific provision about what we're going to do with the set aside fund to propose to do in the coming year. A member of the public is permitted to speak broadly about the library funds in public comment, as long as they're not speaking specifically about the item that is later tonight. And this has happened before. So I, I object to cutting off um, Jefferson and Candace, and I think they have every right to speak now. Communications from the public concerning matters which are not on the agenda, but for which the city council has subject matter jurisdiction. This is not on the agenda. We have jurisdiction over it. Can, can we just clarify with, with Jefferson and Candace if this is about the library item or if this is something different? I'm confused as to what, what they want to speak about. Candace, Jefferson, we're asking you to unmute again. There's a pop up on your screen. Yes, um, thank you to the city attorney, Paul and Bruce. Thank you very much. What I'm trying to express here is future use for library. It has nothing to do after what I've just told you. It's really a very positive way to look at the future for anything in the city of Malibu for the constituents. It's actually a CBS Sunday morning piece, which is very neutral and fun to watch. And that's all I wanted to get to. I don't know where to head, but it's it's not polarized in any way, Paul. It's not Terrific. about the it's not about the allocation that that's on the agenda later. This is a different no issue. Okay. Okay. Wait. I have to say unmute. I have to wait till they unmute me. You're unmuted. Oh, I'm sorry. I I thought I okay. Jefferson no. was going to uh, well, submit this it. last meeting. Okay. Um, sorry. I, I'll do whatever council tells me. So to where's do, the video? It, this, uh, Parker has it uh, pre-downloaded. Uh, pre, uh, Would you like us to play the video, Mayor? Sure, let's play the video. Okay, then I'll. Then can I have just a minute after that? Because the whole presentation only takes three and a half minutes. Fine, let's just, let's move forward. Parker, is it available? Okay, thank you, Paul. Time uh, to check out the library, 2022. On a recent Monday morning, the citizens of Kanawha County, West Virginia, came to check out a new chapter in the life of an old institution. These are no longer warehouses of books. These are marketplaces of ideas. This is a community's living room. Inside, visitors discovered a brand new cafe, a tool lending library, an idea lab full of the latest technology. Are we beyond the age we're, of shushing? We're beyond the age of that, yeah. From podcasting booths to computerized sewing machines to augmented reality screens, the facility has been updated for the modern age. While there are still plenty of books, the redesign allowed the staff to rethink how they were displayed. Across the country, library attendance has declined at 21% from 2009 to 2019. But borrowing has actually increased. It's just moved online as collections have shifted from physical to digital material. That's caused libraries to shift their thinking in terms of what might bring people through the doors. People come to Austin's library to play board games, Thank you. video games, games of giant chess. Alongside the actual books, there are Chromebooks and MacBooks to check out. The teen area hosts jam sessions featuring the library's collection of guitars. What do you think is the most unexpected physical item that you can check out at the library? Seeds. Seeds? Yes, if you want to plant a garden, we have seeds that you can check out. Modern libraries are attempting to meet the needs of today while staying flexible for the future. In one room, recent immigrants practice English. In another, first-time computer users learn how to navigate the internet. The internet, an always-on, limitless hub of information, didn't replace libraries. It may have made them more essential. There's been a recent slew of grand openings. Newly renovated libraries have popped up everywhere from Flint, Michigan to Fayetteville, Arkansas from Spokane, Washington, to Washington, D.C. Jefferson, we're coming back to you and ask you to unmute. Okay, thank you very much. I'll be very brief. I just want to mention, thank you for the, that moment. I hope it's in, invigorating for everybody to think about the future of Malibu libraries. Uh, just on a local note, uh, if you'd like to consult um, Thursday, July 28th, 2022, Malibu Times, page four, 
refers to the classes in good health and good eating habits. That was at our local library. That's how things are changing. They're, they're internally changing and we're progressing. And that's what I was trying to express. That's why it's not about the future expenditures. Another article in the Malibu Times, the week of um, August 18th, 2022, section B, page one, the Boys and Girls Club of Malibu, uh, the high school also furnishing classes in good manners, good social manners. So our library can adapt to the specific needs if the community puts that wish forward. Our city council has been very proactive in the past, and I wanna congratulate Mikey and Karen and thank them for their participation at the city level. And hopefully that, that we can go out of this meeting tonight with something positive for our community, possibly at Point Doom. Uh, several weeks ago. Thank time. you, Jefferson. Okay, thank you. Our next speaker is Hap Henry, followed by Lindsay Horvath, Annie Ellis, uh, Helene Mudman, and Barbara Burke. Hi, Hap, are you available? I am, thank you, Mayor Grisanti, Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein and honorable members of our city council. My name is Hap Henry, and I'm speaking tonight to throw my full support behind our farmer's market, behind our, behind our film society and behind our Malibu Little League, who I know are all some of the organizations experiencing difficulties right now. Um, I'd like to see a solution oriented approach to solving all the issues that these groups are facing. They provide valuable public resources for us all in this community, and I'd like to see them thrive. Um, it's unfortunate when government gets in the way of, of people enjoying the community, but this seems to be the case at the moment. On another note, there will be a candidates forum um, during the same time as the MRCA hearing this, this coming Thursday, but I'd like to express my firm opposition to to camping at bluffs park and just outside the city limits at ramirez um it's reckless it's irresponsible and it's not what we want or need here in malibu and uh let's do all we can to unite in opposition to that thank you for my time thank you very much Al. our next speaker is lindsay horvath followed by annie ellis helene mudderman barbara burke and norm haney Ms. Har Horvath, are you available? I am. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, City Council. Uh, this is Lindsay Horvath, Council Member in the City of West Hollywood and your candidate for LA County Supervisor. I was invited by Council Member Yoring tonight to speak with you a bit about fire safety. And we know that Malibu and the Santa Monica Mountains region needs a champion for local control, for our environment, for our future, and for fire safety. Uh, I recognize we have uh, the, a critical need for wildfire preparation, education, and further funding to prevent another devastating Woolsey fire or a fire of any kind. We have amazing people, first responders on the ground doing critical work to harden homes, to invest in firefighting capabilities and prepare for the worst. And I'm prepared to work with you to bring my local government experience and perspective to invest in advanced technology, to communicate, prevent, and fight any fires that come to your community or any community, working together every day to ensure that every community member is safe and prepared for the worst, including computer-aided dispatch center upgrades and investment uh, for our fire command and control, increased dispatchers. Right now, we have the same staffing levels as 25 years ago. Obviously, that needs to change. A new CAD system uh, with in full implementation in August 2024 as the goal to dispatch off of GPS and full integration with Orange and Ventura counties uh, to invest in borderless dispatching. We need to invest in large animal rescue coordination through LA County Fire, super scooper helicopter access that is no longer seasonal, but um, but actually moving beyond seasonal because we know fires are no longer fire seasons, but happening all too frequently. Malibu has a lot of territory that CAL FIRE is responsible for, but they delegate to LA County through cooperative agreements. We need to make sure that LA County FIRE has their backup still and making sure that our first responders have preeminence in telecommunications and LA RICS. 
As far as prevention, uh, I understand the need for pre investment in prevention, including road maintenance and infrastructure utilities, as well as a zone haven evacuation plan, including pre-designated evacuation routes and repopulation plan and training through LA County Fire and Law Enforcement. Investing in the undergrounding of utility equipment, which I have personal experience fighting uh, Southern California Edison at the PUC to ensure that we maintain local control in doing that. Investing in public education programs and more boots on the ground for wildfire safety and clearance, including proactive clearing around homes about a 200 to 300 foot radius, not whole scale, of course, because that can cause other issues and we want LA County Division of Forestry to lead on in balancing those priorities, making sure that residents are prepared on their own. Um, including investment in sprinklers, helping to address insurance costs. And I know there was a recent bill that's passed, so making sure that gets implemented in your community and you have the resources you need, as well as further investment in home hardening. And of Lindsay, course- Lindsay, that's your yes. time. Oh, apologies. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Annie Ellis, followed by Helene Mudderman, Barbara Burke, Norm Haney, and Bill Sampson. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hi, Paul. Hello. Hi, Annie. Annie. How are you? Fabulous people. Um, I just wanted to talk tonight. You know, there's so many things that I agree with. Um, what's already been said about many items, the fire safety, definitely. Um, library, you know, our movies. Really sad when we saw that movie theater leave. Would love to see that getting up and going again. Um, but what I've heard said several times tonight is um, how slowly things seem to go. Not only for many of my friends that still have not gotten a permit to rebuild the same house. Um, but, you know, there's got to be a way if we really buckle down to... You know, get all through the red tape. I know there's a ton of it, guys. And thank you for all the work you do. Um, but for things that are so important to people like me, I grew up here. I've been here 65 years. Okay. And, and so many of our most favorite things are taken away. And the, the, <laughs> The Sunday, uh, you know, farmer's market is huge. And, um, you know, there's been different ideas of where to move it and stuff. And they said we couldn't put it on the chili cook-off site because you can't uh, serve the food on the dirt, which are, I didn't understand that one. They serve chili there. Uh, but but the, the best idea that has been done in the past, I believe you guys were sent pictures of that, and it's actually a perfect idea, it, and it's just temporary, you know, to, to keep them going through the season coming up and everything, um, is to move it across adjacent to the Legacy Park in the parking spaces on that side of the street. Um, it, it actually is a perfect, perfect thing to do, and it, it's the optimum solution for our farmers market and the vendors and everybody loves it. So I'm hoping that you guys can work together with our manager and everybody involved to try to cut through the red tape and get it done quickly so we don't lose all the vendors. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. Our next speaker is Helene Mudderman, followed by Barbara Burke, Norm Haney, and Bill Sampson. Helene, are you available? I am, and I'm apologizing if I'm speaking not on the right subject matter, because I'm here to speak about Dreamland. That is item number 4A, I believe. I'm not sure how I got registered to, to speak at this point, and I apologize. So could I be put moved to that item? Yes, I'll make sure you're signed up for that item. Our I apologize. Speaker? Thank you. Our Thank you, Helene. Is Barbara Thank Burke. Barbara Burke, are you available? Is He's Barbara Burke in the here. meeting? I don't see Barbara. She's in not here. I'm... So we'll hear from Norm Haney next. Okay. Norm, are you here? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, yes. now can you hear me? We can hear you now. Okay, all right. Um, with regard to the swimming pool issue that was raised by um, Crystal Lowe and Don Schmitz, um, there is some real reasonable, logical uh, facts about why swimming pools are considered permeable. The reason is simple. The reason that there, there is limited limitations on how much impermeable surface you can have is because we want to limit the amount of water that's running off your property and ending up in the drainage facilities and ultimately uh, in the natural drainage courses. Uh, we want to keep that uh, as natural as possible. When water falls into a swimming pool, there's normally a three to four inch uh, free, uh, free bar there so that it doesn't flow down uh, away from the property. It stays right there in the pool. As a matter of fact, uh, it has absolutely nothing. It, it, it does just the opposite of, of having an impermeable surface. Uh, when you look at a swimming pool, you say, yeah, it's, it's not really permeable. But the logic behind not including it uh, in the impermeable surface is that the water does not run off. It stays there. And very few rains are over one inch. Uh, I can't remember any that were two inches uh, of, of uh, rainfall. And so it all stays in the pool. It doesn't run off the property. Ultimately, it evaporates. So that's the logic behind the original concept that pools would not be included uh, in the impermeable surface calculation. Thank you, that's it. Thank you, Norm. Our next speaker is Bill Sampson. Mr. Sampson, are you available? Yes, I am. I, I think um, Cap unintentionally misspoke and said that the Public Safety Forum for Candidates and the Merca scoping meeting were at the same time. The Public Candidate Forum Thursday is from three to five at the new bar next to the Tranca Starbucks and the scoping meeting is at six to eight. Feel free to correct me, but that's what I have on my calendar at the moment. Some of that stuff has moved. Um, I'm sure that there's no way anybody was trying to mislead you, nor am I, but you can go to both if you were so inclined. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Bill. And Mayor, I still don't see Barbara Burke in the meeting, so that concludes public comment. Very good. Do we have any commission or committee updates? No, you don't have any commission or committee updates this evening. Is city manager Steve McClary available? Yes, I am, Mr. Mayor. Um, Mayor and members of the council, happy to give you my report tonight. Um, well, uh, we narrowly avoided going into a, a, a public safety power shutoff uh, today, uh, really the, the first warning of the season. Uh, we were put on a, a watch, as many of you know, uh, and fortunately, uh, it did not necessitate a power shutoff, so we we're fortunate for that. Uh, but it is obviously an indicator that we have finally reached that time of the year, uh, a little bit later than perhaps in other years, but uh, just a good reminder that for the next few months, uh, we're definitely in a uh, higher risk for wildfires. Um, thank you for uh, reading the proclamation and noting the November 9th day of preparedness. Again, a good reminder for folks, if you haven't already, uh, to make sure that you've prepared your plan for this season. Uh, there's a lot of good information on the Malibu City website. You can go to the public safety page. Uh, good information on how you can get your household and your family ready. Uh, and you can also sign up for city alerts and announcements. Uh, regarding COVID, uh, not much change there. Um, still uh, pretty stable in terms of the uh, community transmission rates and the hospitalization rates. Uh, County Health is reporting that there are some new subvariants, uh, which could cause some increases this winter. Um, but right now, uh, there, there are three cases of, of uh, different subvariants in the county, none of them causing immediate concerns. 
uh, but there are, are possibility, there's some concern that these sublineages could, could be more contagious than, uh, than what has been circulating more recently. Uh, they're seeing some increasing trends in Europe in terms of uh, COVID numbers there. Uh, County Health is also reminding those that if it's been uh, more than two months uh, to go in and get your booster. Uh, also, the County Health reported that over 80% in LA County have had uh, their initial vaccine series and 7% uh, have received their bivalent booster. Uh, moving on, and uh, I know a couple of the speakers did note um, earlier today, uh, early this evening, about um, the uh, Notice of Preparation Environmental Impact Report that we received um, regarding this project that is being proposed uh, by MRCA. Uh, it's titled the Malibu Lower Cost Accommodations Public Works Plan Project. Uh, it includes two sites. One is the Malibu Bluffs which of course is in the city, and the other one is Ramirez Canyon Park, which is right at the edge of the city. Uh, Malibu Plus Park is located at 24250 Pacific Coast Highway. Uh, it's an 84 acre property. And Ramirez Canyon Park is located uh, at 5350 Canyon Doom Road uh, on unincorporated land just north of the Malibu city limits. Um, we did put some information out to the community last week regarding uh, the scoping meeting, uh, which is going to be held this Thursday, October 27th at 6 p.m. Uh, that's a virtual meeting. Uh, that will There is a 60-day scoping period. Uh, the city will be preparing a comment letter uh, on the matter. And uh, just to remind everybody that uh, there is a 60-day written comment period, and that comment period ends December 16th. Also wanted to note that the um, uh, governor did announce uh, that they are intending to end the COVID-19 state of emergency on February 28th, 2023. Uh, for us, uh, for in terms of immediate impacts, that will mean that we'll need to make a, a decision in terms of returning to in-person meeting at the end of that period. Um, and then it was also going to trigger um, the uh, the end of the allowance for the outdoor dining, uh, which is currently in place in the city. Uh, this last weekend, I want to uh, thank uh, the Big Rock Mesa Property Owners Association for uh, inviting me to their um, annual event and uh, had some great tasting homemade chili. So uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to the event there. I uh, got to meet some new people and uh, learn a little bit more about Malibu. So thank you for that. Also want to note that uh, we have uh, upcoming uh, tentative items for future city council meetings. Uh, there is a break, a three week break because we have uh, five Tuesdays in October. Uh, so the next council meeting will be three weeks from today on November 14th. Uh, tentatively for that meeting, we have um, the Malibu Triathlon Agreement, a report on the day use impound lot, also known as the tow yard, and um, then at the next meeting, uh, at the end of November, we are planning to bring forward a contract uh, to begin the work on the Pacific Coast Highway signal synchronization program. And then in January, we're looking to bring to council a discussion on uh, short-term rentals, and also, uh, as I just alluded to, returning to in-person meetings. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Malika to give a brief report on some items from the planning department. Uh, and then from there, if we could go to uh, Lieutenant Carr for a report from the police department. Thank you very much. Mr. Good Malika. Good evening, Mayor and members of the council. Uh, wanted to give you a quick update about the snack shack that is located at bluffs park per the city zoning ordinance the existing snack shack at bluffs park is an existing non-conforming use uh, the city zoning ordinances identify that refreshment stands require a conditional use permit and are only conditionally permitted in our uh, three of our commercial districts uh, refreshment stands are not identified as a permitted or conditionally permitted use in the open space district, and that happens to be 
uh, Legacy Park, uh, excuse me, Bluffs Park. Uh, the existing snack shack, of course, could be maintained under our non-conforming uses and structures section of the code, uh, but from speaking with the folks in community uh, services, they've explained to us that the maintenance of that structure would not meet the needs of what they're, uh, the, uh, the comments that they're receiving and the, and the goals for the project. Um, so with that, uh, we definitely are working with our community services uh, department to see what we can do in the meantime, because uh, the options here, of course, are to look at perhaps another way to have food service at the park or uh, to process a, a code change if, if that becomes the direction that the city wishes to pursue. Uh, also would like to provide a quick update uh, because of the interest in the city's wireless local coastal program amendment that is with the, the Coastal Commission. Um, the city is limited, and I, I don't know how many folks know this, but the city is limited in the number of local coastal program submittals, amendment submittals it can make in any given year uh, to the California Coastal Commission. And because of that, we often bundle uh, amendments to our code together as one submittal, because we're allowed a total of three submittals. Um, the wireless ordinance was bundled with the beachfront signage amendment to the LCPA. Um, I believe that the council is most likely aware that um, about a, a month and a half ago or so, two months ago, we responded to the corrections uh, that were given to us from the Coastal Commission with respect to the wireless LCPA. The Coastal Commission was waiting on the response to the beach signage LCPA, those corrections, before they would start review of the packet again and provide comment to the city. So today, we, this morning, we formally resubmitted the beach signage LCPA responses. So at this time, we've responded to all comments from the Coastal Commission, and we will follow up with the Coastal Commission uh, soon on this matter, uh, just to ping them again and remind them that we are looking for some comment on our wireless LCPA so that we can uh, pursue the, uh, the corrections that were brought up at the last meeting um, by the, uh, Malibu for Safe Technology and also to see if we can obtain a hearing date for this, because as I mentioned, now we've responded to everything and they have a complete package. And uh, also, I know that there's been a lot of interest in the city's housing element. And just to give you a quick update on that, as some of you may recall that the city of Malibu City Council adopted the 21 through 2029 housing element update uh, January 10th of this year. And we then, after adoption by this council, we formally submitted uh, to the Department of Housing and Community Development uh, as required by law. We have been going back and forth with HCD uh, as they have requested some uh, clarification on topics that are in the adopted housing element. Our city consultants uh, are working on that and uh, our consultant actually has gotten a few housing elements certified uh, these past couple months, and so he's using the lessons learned in those certifications uh, to respond to HCD so that we can wrap up uh, the remaining issues and ideally get this certified, and that, that is our goal. Um, I know there was some concern because of a deadline uh, on the 15th of this month, but that deadline was specific to jurisdictions where uh, rezoning was necessary in order to make up for the shortfall in capacity uh, to accommodate their arena numbers. Uh, we did not fall into that category. We, we processed um, all of our zone changes as part of our last uh, housing element update, and those zone changes uh, were process by this council for the local approvals. And then we also completed that process with the Coastal Commission so that those parcels were rezoned and that was accepted by HCD. But we are uh, diligently pursuing it and ideally we'll have this wrapped up shortly. And then it just, in, I know there was a lot of comment tonight about swimming pools. Um, it is not the new issue that it was made out to be under public comment, I should say. And I've been looking into this matter uh, because ideally 
uh, I don't want to make any decisions that haven't gone by our commissions or committees. And actually in looking into this, I find that this is an issue that goes about uh, back about a decade ago to a couple of planning directors. Uh, it wasn't the last planning director, it was the one before her. And the reason for it was that there was a discrepancy that was found between the city's stormwater runoff requirements and how in the engineering uh, world, pools are considered to be a impermeable surface because today uh, we're seeing a lot of rim flow pools or, or pools that are infinity edge. And uh, those pools uh, do apparently, uh, I'm not an engineer, but from talking to our engineers, apparently those pools do discharge the water during a storm event uh, so that they don't overflow. And so that's why uh, our public works folks in the engineering sense, uh, in the city stormwater runoff requirements, pools have to be looked at. And so it seems that from what I'm finding is that, as I mentioned a couple of planning directors ago, uh, she wanted that identified so that the public works engineers understood when a project was coming their way, if there were changes uh, being made to what would be considered the impermeable surfaces for the purposes of stormwater runoff requirements. I'm not aware of any projects being denied, but as I mentioned, this is an issue we'll look into and then also try to see how can this be adjusted because uh, the handout you saw earlier this evening, that uh, predates 2004. And uh, historically, yes, uh, pools have been seen as permeable surfaces in the planning department. But as I mentioned, we'll, we'll continue to look at this and better understand. And as I mentioned, it is something that's about a decade old. I'm available for any questions if there are. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. I don't see any hands. Is Ms. Is Lieutenant Carr available? Yes, good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. I'll begin this evening um, with a couple of quality of life issues I wanted to address. Uh, one was, uh, you know, I got a significant number of emails and uh, we had a significant response regarding there was a lady experiencing homelessness. She was living in her car on a vacant property on Gray Fox near uh, Malibu Elementary School. Um, she has since left. Um, apparently uh, her vehicle ran out of gas and the battery also died. Um, it took a big collaboration between the property owner and um, and some members, some kind members of the city, but we were able to get that that resolved uh, with uh, no incident. However, she was, um, she was frightening a lot of the people on the way to school and everything else. I wanted to know the public, we took this very seriously and uh, the property owner was extremely cooperative and so were members of the city. So I wanted to thank everybody for their help uh, in resolving that issue. There was another uh, issue brought up uh, on the last meeting regarding a uh, possible uh, car show at Zuma Beach on November 6, 2022. Now the uh, Run Malibu uh, Kids Run uh, Half Marathon is gonna be occurring that day. I consulted with our traffic unit and they had said uh, early in the morning on uh, on November 6th, uh, even late at night on November 5th, they're already going to be setting up barricades near Zuma Beach and much of that parking lot's going to be blocked off for that event. So it'll be quite difficult to have a car show then, but there will also be increased uh, personnel there. Uh, and I, and uh, there will be zero tolerance for putting anybody in danger um, or any kind of exhibition of speed or anything like that during that event. So I, I wanted to let everybody know that I have addressed that issue and um, and uh, there, there should be minimal impact. Um, as you know, just uh, September 30th uh, ended another quarter in the year. So I just kind of wanted to give an update on how Malibu sits just regarding their uh, part one crime statistics and then I'll go into traffic after that. Um, the good news is, is uh, aggravated assaults were down 14%, uh, robberies were down 33%, armed robberies down 57%, um, auto theft down 54%, petty theft down 33%. So overall, the statistics are looking good. Burglary, residential burglaries specifically are an area of concern. Those, were, those numbers were up 75%. 
but I wanted to put some context onto that because our our station put out a public safety bulletin on Instagram regarding burglaries and uh, people climbing up hills and uh, entering properties to the hills. None of those have actually occurred in Malibu. Most of them have occurred on the other side of the hill in Calabasas. But there was a couple of things I wanted to note regarding the burglaries in Malibu. Uh, many of them were vacant properties that are uh, probably possibly vacation homes. Uh, many of them, uh, many of the burglaries occurred when transients went in and trespassed on the property. However, because they used the utility, it counts as a residential burglary. Also, um, uh, many of the uh, many of the burglaries occurred on unlocked properties. So I do encourage everybody to lock your property, especially when you're leaving and at night. Um, and then, um, uh, also there were some, uh, some properties that are being rebuilt because of the Woosley, Woosley fire. Uh, they were entered in and tools were stolen from the construction site from within the property that also counted as a residential burglary. Uh, many of these burglaries, there were suspects in custody. One in particular, I mentioned in the last meeting was, um, a group of, I, they were, they were, uh, early twenties, I would call them. Um, they had entered a property. They had, um, they had uh, partied in there, it appears, but it, they also stole an item from the uh, from the victim. So that was also a burglary. So I just wanted to put some context on those numbers. Uh, there were no burglaries that uh, occurred with a high value loss or, or, or significant law, uh, loss of property in there. So I did want to put some context is regarding that. Now, um, uh, also, I, I encourage the everybody to lock their doors again, consider a video security system and um, and uh, also if you do keep high valued items in your home, consider a quality safe with a professional installation. Those are just some some pointers I'd like to point out. Now regarding traffic, traffic, although collisions are up in the uh, city overall uh, year to date, uh, we're looking at a 50% reduction in fatal collisions. Um, which is also good news. And uh, with that, if there's any questions, I am available. Thank you, Lieutenant. Anybody else? Thank you for everything you're doing to keep us safe. Thank you. Okay. That brings us to the City Council subcommittee reports and then the Mayor and Council member meetings reports. Are there, do we have any subcommittees? to report. Karen? Uh, no, I don't have any subcommittee uh, report to make, but I have my report. Please do give your report. Okay, thank you. Right. Um, I, I do wanna thank all the public speakers. Yeah, it seems like we've got to be able to find a solution with the farmer's market. Um, if, the, if the county and the college are not holding up uh, their commitments, what's our leverage is my question. Um, the next thing, and I'll just leave it at that because this is a continuing conversation. There's, there's gotta be a resolution. This is silly. Uh, the next thing I'll say is, uh, thank you, Richard Mollica, uh, regarding the pools. I was, uh, perhaps, uh, I had the wrong impression, uh, that a, uh, a change had been made midstream, uh, for projects, um, if that's not the case, I'm happy to know that. And if we do need changes codified, then then let's go through that process. Uh, regarding the MRCA, the scoping meeting on Thursday night, um, I've already signed up for it. Uh, if anybody wants to know how, uh, if you haven't seen the city notice or gotten the postcard that I got in the mail at home, uh, you can sign up online for that scoping meeting at tinyurl.com slash Malibu PWP. For people who are unhappy about uh, the prospect of a campground at what has been called the 50 yard line of the city, I agree with you. And it was a very sad day for me when in 2019, there was a two, three vote. Uh, I was on the losing side of that vote to end the five-year Bluffs Park swap 
and return that property to the MRCA. That's how we ended up where we are today. And I think that's one of the worst things that's happened since I've been on the council. So that's where we are. I don't want a campground there either. Um, as far as the Little League Snack Shack, yeah, if we need code changes, if we can make that compliant, great, let's do that. If not, I assume there's another solution like a recurring food truck. Uh, I don't know. There's got to be, there's got to be something. Um, I just want to say that um, at the COG meeting uh, this past week, uh, we didn't have a report from LA County Fire this evening, but it was announced uh, that the county, uh, county fire was announcing new evacuation zones. Uh, we were told that was going to be today. Apparently, uh, I spoke to, with my contact there this afternoon, Megan Courier. That announcement is gonna be made tomorrow. So LA County Fire is coming out with evacuation zones for our area, the COG area, uh, and possibly beyond that. Um, I do wanna also note, uh, last week there was a fascinating, or the week before, library speaker series event with a shark attack survivor who is now a, um, a shark conservation champion and a motivational speaker about overcoming obstacles, seeing as he lost both his right arm and leg in a shark attack while working for the Australian Navy. That's one of the things that we do with library uh, excess funds and there are fascinating speakers on a lot of topics, and I would encourage people to try to attend. The next one is November 29th at the library. It's an author. I'm sorry, I don't know the person's name. Uh, yeah, I'm very happy we've avoided a PSPS today. We all know that won't be the last one. So, yes, we need to be ready. Um, I think that's about it for my public comments, so thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. Mr. Uring. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I would also like to thank the speakers. Um, Lindsay Horwath and I had been talking about, you know, the fires and fires up in the, the hillsides and camping up there. Uh, and she has was, had given me some information. She's going to help us try and fight that program. Uh, so I didn't, I didn't want to introduce her to the council and ever go through some of that. So thank you very much for that. Um, I attended the Santa Monica Bay Restoration Commission meeting. And once again, they're all very interesting. And some good news to Mr. Houston from the Water District. Every one of the meetings we have with them, uh, there was some discussion talking about how to recapture rainwater, all right, and save it, and or you know, to come up with some program to clean up some of the, the water that is that is the uh, the recycling plants and using that water uh, to, to reduce the use of portable water. So there's a lot of activity and a lot of interest in trying to follow up on some of the things Mr. Houston talked about. Uh, dark sky, over the course of this week, I left one of these little booklets in the slots for each one of the city managers and hope uh, city council people. I hope you had a chance to take a look at it. Uh, it Don Navarro did a heck of a job on these things. And what she's going to do, she's going to put together a program to distribute them to the schools in Malibu, along with a uh, curriculum for the teachers. And so what I've got, I'm going to leave a letter at the, the uh, receptionist desk in City Hall uh, that talks about releasing this stuff. And if possible, you guys could just stop and sign the letter. So when these things go out to the schools, it'll be accompanied by a letter signed by all the city council people. And I think that's a good thing to have happen. So I'm going to encourage you to do that. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. uh, Barry Haldeman, Haldeman, the, you did, you did my quote better than I did. So thank you very much for that. And just so you understand, I'm with working with Bruce, we've been talking to Scott Talal, uh, and, you know, and trying to find the solution that works, uh, and, and, you know, what, and, you know, Bruce can probably respond to this better than I can, but the communications we're seeing coming back from some of the studios are not a hard no, I don't want to use City Hall. They prefer maybe to get someplace else. So there may be something we can do with that, which will enable us to use City Hall. Maybe we got to make some modifications to it, but it'll give us the ability to run as many movies as you guys want here in the city. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. 
uh, just to Steve McClary with COVID. There were two articles, one in the Boston Globe and one in the New York Times this weekend. Both of the, the COVID numbers are rising back east. Now, whether that is because it's winter back there or getting close to being winter, I can't tell you. Uh, but at least the word I'm getting out of there, it's not over yet. So just got to be careful of that. Um, farmer's market. Got, I mean, you know, we knew it was going to start heating up and it's starting to do that. Uh, and I'm just wondering, has anybody tried to, you know, the reason we can't use the Legacy Park is because you can only do six events there a year. Has anyone ever tried to get a hold of John Parencio? He lives in the same housing unit or the same community as Barry uh, Haldeman. Uh, and maybe he can give us a waiver to last for a couple a month or whatever heck it is till they finish the school. Allow them to put the, the farmer's market over there uh, and, you know, take care. Because I, I think the, the comments you're hearing are correct. I mean, if this thing just keeps getting squeezed and squeezed and squeezed, and sooner or later, you know, the vendors are going to say, hell, I'm going to go someplace else. So anything we can do to help them, I sure would appreciate. And, you know, Barry Haldeman can maybe get us the number for John Parencio, and he maybe will get, like I say, give us a quick waiver, let us run it for a couple of weeks till they get through the, the construction, and we can keep that farmer's market going. Okay, Paul, back to you. Thank you, Steve. Mikey, you're on. Okie dokie. Well, I think the two in front of me have pretty much uh, gone through pretty much everything you could ask for, but I want to hit on a few things. First of all, big congratulations to Jeff Jennings and Craig Foster. Um, truly amazing service to the to the city, to the community. Um, Jeff, I just have no clue how you've done it as long as you have. It just blows me away. And uh, and unwillingly or unwillingly you were my mentor on planning for a long time um so thank you for that because i as you know constantly would ask you questions <laughs> on how you remember and how we got there um so thank you both scott houston thank you for your presentation on water i when people ask me what the next big disaster is in malibu and to me in long range it's water whether it's rising sea levels or the inability to get water in Malibu, um, the one thing that occurs to me now, I would love to talk to you about is getting more um, more water pumps, more generators here in Malibu. And uh, I've asked the mayor to continue on that crusade while, when I'm gone, because uh, that was a promise that was made a while ago. And so far we have three, and as far as I hear, they may or may not be in Malibu. They may be moving around. So that's a big one. Um, Karen touched on it. Um, she touched on it, then I forget what it was. It's right here in my huge pool of notes. The PSPS that uh, Steve McClary talked about. What's very clear from that PSPS, and especially maybe from the side as an elected official, where we got a boatload of emails with a ton of information in them, all sorts of bureaucratic covering their ass gobbledygook not mad at it i mean it's their job but it went on and on and on i'm you know the thing ended i must have deleted 20 plus emails with links to 200 different places and everything in the world my point is this my opinion is they are going to shut off our power very quickly this entire fire season it's they are very very afraid particularly the cuthbert circuit um because it's an older circuit that hasn't been fully upgraded and they're very worried about potential liability. That's my opinion. That's how it looks to me. And so be ready. Be ready for that. I couldn't be happier that I finally got solar, as I've talked about a few times. And a couple of shutoffs we've had, I haven't even noticed. And that feels really, really good. So please, everybody, be very ready for that. Um, farmer's Market, I'm with everyone else. I mean, I'm one of the people who fought so hard to figure it out to get it where it was. And that took forever and was really hard. And now here we are again. And, you know, it's a deal that, the you know, I know the city needs to help figure it out. We want to. It's an agreement we're not even a party to. But no excuses. It doesn't make it any easier. And surrounded by land, that is challenging to use for that purpose. So we run into code issues. No excuses. We need to figure this out. I don't have a brilliant idea right now. I just don't. Um, other than shutting down the road, which has its own issues. And I don't know. I don't know. Um, and speaking of code issues, 
Um, the word is our Zeracious meeting where Steve and I had a really wonderful, friendly chat about our codes, um, TUPs in particular. Apparently, we have to redo that. Is that still the case, Mr. McClary? Um, yes, we're going to need to reschedule that and bring it back. And why? Because of a power outage. <laughs> so um, too bad every house in that area didn't have solar, I guess. Um, I'm being facetious now. That makes no sense. So I don't know if we have a date. I can't remember what it is right now. Lots of dates. So that's going to come back around for people that are interested in that issue. Um, there's a lot of issues around our TUPs, many of which Steve and I agree on and a couple we don't. So we're still working our way through that to get it to council. Um, as far as the MRCA plans, yes, that's Thursday. Very important. And, and Karen was just so polite not to name me as the deciding vote on the fact that we own Charmley. I would not change that vote for the world because if a fire starts in Charmley, it's going to burn down a ton of West Malibu before we can stop it. I don't want to sacrifice the middle of Malibu, but I think we can keep an eye on it better. But I am horrified that they want to try and put camping there. No win situation, but that, you know, I grew up on the west side. I saw what those fires do. And up there, it's all, I'm up there a lot. A lot of places to run and hide. And uh, camping up there scares me absolutely to the ends of the earth. Um, thank you, Richard, for your report and Lieutenant Carr for your report. And, um, and Candace uh, for playing that video. That was a great video um, talking about what libraries do. That was a really well done piece. I had not seen it. I'd heard about it. And um, I love what, what libraries are capable of and, and the new things are doing. That was worth, I think, everyone seeing that cares about that. I'm sure I'm missing a couple of things, but I want to thank you all. Thank you, Mikey. Bruce? Okay, I'll try to be non-duplicative as best I can. First of all, everyone, um, this is the last city council meeting before the election. We'll be having two new council members because two of our sitting council members are not sitting for, re are not, seeking re-election, so get out and vote. However, however you vote, just, just make sure you vote. Um, kind of a civic responsibility. Uh, I, I wanna echo um, Mikey's congratulations to Jeff and Craig. Um, I do wanna say, you know, Jeff, the, 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 the civic service, the amount of work, the years you've put in are remarkable and, and commendable. Um, I have to say at the same time, there are people on the slow growth side of things who believe that a lot of the worst decisions that have been made in the history of Malibu emanate from your being on those commissions and, and into city council. So, but that doesn't take away from the fact that you have in fact given of your time and that is most appreciated, but there's two sides to most stories and in Malibu, um, that's a pretty heavy dividing line. Um, Last meeting, we adopted a resolution with respect to the implementation of the poison-free LUP. Um, and what we did was we, um, we, we did two things. We voted to direct staff to bring back a proposed amendment to the LIP to implement the LUP provision that was approved by Coastal. And we directed staff from, from that point forward to construe the LIP provision that deals with um, CDPs in a specific way. Um, the action item that came back, however, a few days later, and usually we get them the next day, but a few days later we got an action item which said that we resolved to direct the staff to prepare the amendment and to direct the staff to come back with a policy for construing the LIP. And that's just not what we did. And uh, I wanna put that on the record. I think that's important. And I think we need to get that resolved because the, the, the clerks, um, reflection of what the city council did should state what the city council in fact did and not something else. Um, I, we managed to avoid the PSPS today. Hooray. That was great. Of course, we're going to get one next week. We all remember Thanksgiving last year. Um, we get tons of, that's an exaggeration. We get many submissions regarding, um, specific items on the agenda the day of the meeting. Today we got some some substantial comments. We get that that happens every week, every meeting. You know, we need time to consider what pe if people care about us reading what they write and taking it into account in our in our analysis. We really need to get those things sooner. 
Um, I, I can't speak for everyone, although I think everyone's the same. I, I work very hard to prepare for these hearings. I work um, not necessarily the day of the meeting, but up to the day of the meeting and getting, um, getting submissions on the day of the meeting um, just adds to the workload and also makes it more complicated because we've already prepared our thoughts and um, now we got to rethink everything. Um, with respect to the end of the COVID emergency, that's great. It's great if it's if it's consistent with what's reality. Uh, the outdoor dining authorization, we, I think we need to do something about that before that occurs. We've talked about that. Um, on the one hand, there are benefits to continuing it. On the other hand, uh, I'm not going to name specific um, restaurants, but I, mean, I know of at least one restaurant I think has taken advantage of the situation and, and, and is not just dining outside their restaurant, but has multiple places outside that they've taken over. And I don't think reduce the number of, of tables in the restaurant. So that, you know, there, there are pros and cons to that, and I think we need a policy. Um, I don't think the policy should be you need to um, remove the outdoor seating, outdoor dining immediately, um, or maybe even ever, but I think we need a policy for governing how that's going to occur. The, the snack shack issue, as well as the farmer's market, as well as the Malibu Film Society. You know, we're a nation of laws, we're a city of laws. We have to deal with, we have to honor our laws. And we also have um, local um, groups that deserve our, our, our special consideration because they provide a, a community benefit. Um, I, I think the answer to that is we do need to take a hard look at our zoning ordinances and see if there are provisions that can be made specifically for community organizations that won't open the floodgate to non-community organizations, but which can accommodate the kinds of things that are important to us. And so I, I hope that that's something that Zeracis will consider and that will come back to us. That doesn't fix things, obviously, tomorrow, next week, or the week after, but I think that's an approach we ought to be looking at. Um, you know, nobody seems to want to do want City Hall. And, I mean, I, I understand, by the way, that City Hall used to be, I, this is before my time, but City Hall, I understand, used to be a beautiful performing arts center, and it was changed into offices. Um, it would be great if we still had that, and maybe there's a way to have a little bit of both. But, um, you know, I, I do think we should work hard with the Malibu Film Society to see if we can, what we can do to make City Hall work. Um, and I agree with what Steve said. I, I I've not yet seen a hard no presented to us from the third parties that we're being told are saying no, but we're being told there's a lot of others that are being they're saying no. So, you know, I just need to want to understand that better. Maybe the church or some other area is good temporarily, maybe not. Um, the farmer's market, I suggested last meeting, we should look into whether the city hall parking lot can be used. It's not dirt, it's got ample space. Um, I understand it may not be the preferable spot, but again, it, it's a spot that we own and that we may be able to jigger our rules to make it available. Um, so I, I would like that to be explored. Legacy Park, you know, we don't, we, we can't change, we can't just change the rules on something that is um, deed restricted. That's not our ability to do. Um, I, I think Steve's idea was great about contacting the party with whom the restriction exists, but we can't, we can't just unilaterally disregard our laws because we like the result of, of benefiting a, um, of the community. Um, so that needs to be taken into account. A uh, couple comments about the things the speaker said today. I appreciate all of the comments. This pool issue, um, I completely agree that whenever there are changes, and I, and I get that there's a dispute here about whether there has been a change or hasn't been a change, but whenever there are gonna be changes in interpretation, that really shouldn't be done willy-nilly. It should be done through the racist. It should be done through the city council. And um, they shouldn't be done on the fly by the city planning department. That works both ways. I mean, we see, we see application after application where the planning department has reinterpreted the code to benefit a development, to allow something to occur, which previously was not clear whether it could occur. That ought to come before us too. So, you know, be careful what you ask for. But I, I think we ought to have a um, subcommittee, an ad hoc committee that's formed to actually take a global look at all of the uh, ambiguous provisions and make a global recommendation as to how to deal with them. When I was um, practicing law in Delaware, I was on a committee that did that with respect to the general corporation law, which, which governs a lot of the largest companies in the country. And we went through the entire code, identified all the ambiguities, um, also identified um, 
where there were archaic language that needed to be updated. And we just did a whole cloth re-improvement re of it. So I, I think that's something to take account. And I'd welcome the participation of Don, of um, the other speakers tonight, um, as well as slow growth representatives. Um, just flip through my notes here. I think I've covered most of everything. I think Barry Haldeman has stated some of the things Steve said during the Zeracis meeting, but um, anybody who wants to see exactly what Steve said can watch the recording. I think they'll find that Steve didn't say the things Barry attributed to him. Um, Jefferson, thank you for that. Oh, that point about the library. Um, you know, first of all, again, I, I think it's inappropriate for our residents to be cut off when they are saying something that may sound like it's going in a different direction than in fact it's going. You need to, be patient and let people have their say and see where it's going. Um, but I, I agree, the, you know, the library is not necessarily a book repository in the year 2022. And we have $16 million and we have needs for performing art space and we have needs for community gathering space. And we have our, our money that the county is holding for us and we could do something spectacular Maybe we don't have enough now, maybe we'll have it in two or three years, or maybe we can borrow and then continue to fund it with that money that's coming back to us. But we could do something spectacular that's not in the vein of a traditional library and which solves a lot of the problems that the city doesn't have the money to solve because we do indirectly have the money to solve it, rather than giving the money to the county to spread to other cities. Um, and just one, that, that's it. Thank you very much. And pre again, appreciate all the public comments. And thank, thank you, Bruce. Uh, thanks to the public speakers. Uh, Want to do a short uh, update on what I've done. I got a flu shot. Uh, I'm, I was at a scoping meeting uh, for the city college oversight, which tells me that there are planning on being done with construction by mid-November. Can they clear out the parking lot earlier than mid-November? I don't know, but I'll, I'll ask. Uh, I did have a conversation with Marie Castillo of the, of the uh, Board of Supervisors office. Uh, the contract is with the Board of Supervisors office. It's not with the city of Malibu and uh, we have a contract dispute here that we are not a party of. And it's, we can, we can ask for people to do nice things, but we can't force people to change the contracts that they signed or live up to the contracts that they signed. So that's, that's a problem for us. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention was as far as the pool thing goes, it seems like, uh, the update we got from Mr. Molika uh, would lead to a bifurcation with pools that are uh, zero rim being non-permeable and pools that have freeboard that is capable of storing water should be treated as permeable. And I think that's a very simple a distinction to make and people would easily understand why there is a difference. But to treat all pools as if they are zero rim pools doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, but we'll see how that works out. Uh, and I believe that uh, that should bring us to the consent calendar. Has anything been pulled from the agenda? from the consent calendar I'm by the public? To, I'm checking to confirm and no, nothing has been pulled by the public. Do any members of the city council wanna pull something from the consent calendar? Hey, Mayor, I just have a comment that uh, 3B5 had a technical issue on it and uh, we'll correct that. Um, on page three of the of exhibit A, there was um, an Adobe issue. Uh, so just wanted to make that known if you're passing the, the agenda. Okay, and you're gonna you're gonna correct it and bring it back to us, or if we accept it, you're gonna correct it. If you accept it, it'll be corrected. Okay. Can you explain what the what, what the typo was? Yeah, and actually, um, we can show it. Uh, let me see if. Uh, 
Please give us it. one moment. It'll be up on yeah. the screen. Yeah, I noticed that. Yeah, it's just the chart at the bottom um, when we created it's the PDF. last page of Exhibit A. Yeah. Yeah. It's the fee schedule. Yeah, that looks substantially different than what's in the uh, Exhibit A that was sent to us. Yeah. So, so okay. That, that's just the, uh, the, the the technical correction. There's no, no subject changes to the item. Okay. Correct. Okay. Uh, all right. So we're going to leave it in and you're going to fix that for us. Uh, Bruce, did you have one you wanted to pull? No, it sounds like nobody does. So I'm going to move that we approve the consent calendar subject to the correction of the of the page of Exhibit A to 3B5. I'll second. We have a motion and a second to approve with the correction. Can you take the roll, please, Kelsey? Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? Yes. Councilmember Pearson? Councilmember Pearson, you're muted. Yes. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Uring? Yes. Mayor Grisanti? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. It is now 9.04. And prior to beginning item 4A, I think this would be a good time for us to take a 15 minute break. If that's something that everyone's in agreement with. Sounds great. Okay. I'll see you back here at 9.19.
Okay. I want to thank you for that break. My blood sugar is back to normal. It will make me more connection. cheerful. Did okay, you that takes us to item 4A. Uh, and we are, which is two appeals of uh, an action that was taken a couple of years ago. And who's going to present? I will be uh, giving the presentation. Good evening, uh, Mayor Grisanti and members of City Council. The item before you is an application uh, for an amendment uh, to a conditional use permit uh, originally approved in 2010 for the Malibu Inn, uh, which authorized almost the entire building and an outdoor patio to be used as a restaurant. And the uh, interior and the, uh, excuse me, and uh, uh, the exterior restaurant space uh, for 10 uh, entertainment events, uh, a total of 565 square feet remained as uh, retail space. Uh, the amendment includes the uh, conversion of a previously approved banquet hall to retail, uh, which expand expand the total amount of retail to 1,636 square feet. Uh, this restaurant to retail conversion took place several years ago. An application to officially memorialize this change was submitted in 2013. Uh, this change would result in the reduction of required parking spaces uh, for Malibu Inn uh, from 53 to 46 spaces. Um, uh, thus, the number of required offsite parking spaces uh, would be reduced to 23. The amendment to the joint use parking agreement is requested to officially memorialize this change. Um, earlier this year, the Planning Commission approved um, the proposed amendment with conditions. Um, this approval was then appealed by uh, Manny Brothers Estate Group and Pat Healy. Uh, next slide, please. The subject property is located just uh, west of Jack in the Box and north of the Malibu Pier. Uh, the property has been developed with a uh, 7,184 uh, square foot building uh, constructed in 1950s. Uh, according to the tax assessor records. Uh, next slide, please. The joint use parking agreement consists of parking spaces uh, that because of the use of the Malibu Inn as a restaurant cannot be accommodated on the same lots and therefore require parking spaces uh, to be provided on the adjacent surface parking lot uh, located immediately uh, east of uh, the Malibu Inn uh, uh, lot. The existing parking lot consists of uh, 38 to 39 parking spaces, uh, 31 of which are required for the Malibu Inn uh, currently. Uh, this uh, means that about seven to eight parking spaces can be used for public parking or for any other uh, you know, type of parking. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, according to the appellant, um, uh, the planning commission approval was improperly split uh, from the Malibu Inn project. Uh, proceeding with the subject application uh, separate from the Malibu Inn uh, motel application would result in a piecemeal under CEQA. Uh, the conditional use permit and uh, code violations, um, uh, excuse me, there are code violations as well as conditional use permit violations. Uh, and these include noise complaints. Uh, there's also traffic related issues at uh, PCH, uh, lack of parking, loss of uh, public parking and parking agreement with the Malibu Surfrider Motel uh, were outlined by the appellant, uh, as well as the Planning Commission's decision. Uh, you know, their findings were not supported by evidence uh, in the record. Uh, staff contents that the proposed project consists of a separate and independent application from the Malibu Inn Motel and is not uh, dependent upon the approval of the Malibu Inn Motel. Uh, the proposed uh, amendment will convert restaurant space into retail space, which is uh, expected to reduce uh, traffic and parking demand. 
The project would reduce the number of required parking spaces, but the reduction in parking spaces is proportionate to the reduction in the demand of parking spaces as provided in the uh, applicable codes. Uh, a smaller restaurant and even an event space is consistent with CEQA as it uh, qualifies for a categorical exemption. Uh, the Planning Commission added a condition of approval requiring the owners um, or operator uh, to secure offsite parking uh, for large events and obtain parking uh, planning directors approval in advance of those events. As a result of reduction in size of the restaurant and event space and the requirement to provide um, offsite parking for large events should also reduce any current impacts on traffic and parking in the area. The appellants uh, object to the existing use, uh, his, uh, history of violations, uh, adequate septic system, traffic uh, incompatibility with surrounding uses, uh, traffic and parking. The proposed amendment will change the, will not change the nature of the existing conditionally permitted use and instead would reduce the restaurant and live entertainment space which would uh, proportionally reduce traffic and parking demand. Uh, the, pro the project is also conditioned to adequately provide parking spaces for the two large events per month that would generate more parking spaces than can be provided uh, with the within uh, the required parking spaces. Uh, staff received a noise complaint uh, for Aviator Nation, a Dreamland, a citation was issued for the violation, um, uh, a violation of the CUP conditions. Uh, staff and the owners have since met uh, with the operator to address all uh, condition use uh, conditions. Uh, since this noise complaint, no other complaints have been filed and the operator has shown compliance with all conditions of approval. Uh, the two other potential parking uh, violations have been resolved. A private agreement to rent five parking spaces to Surfrider Malibu Motel employees um, has been terminated. And uh, additional signs indicating less than um, less than the 31 uh, joint use uh, parking agreement required uh, parking spaces at the adjacent parking lot were removed and a condition has been added uh, for new signage to be installed and maintain to clearly depict the required parking spaces for Malibu Inn customers. Um, the City Environmental Health Administrator verified that the existing septic system is adequate for all existing uses to operate um, simultaneously. As a result, the findings for the proposed amendment uh, can be made. Uh, the Council agenda addresses in detail evidence in the record that support um, the findings required for the project. Uh, these findings are also summarized in the uh, resolution. Uh, next slide. Um, the resolution includes several conditions that were accepted um, by the Planning Commission, including that the number of patrons for large events uh, be proportionally reduced based on the reduction in uh, restaurant space. No dining or drink service within the employee lounge area, uh, more restrictive hours of operation and offsite parking to be secured and uh, approved prior to large events. Uh, staff uh, also added another condition that requires that the parking spaces subject to the joint use parking agreement be clearly identified as parking that may only be used by Malibu Inn customers. Uh, the project was uh, approved by the Planning Commission and as conditions, staff recommends that the City Council denies the uh, appeals and approves the project. And uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Adrian. Okay, who would like to begin the disclosures? I'll, I'll lead off. I first visited the property in 1978. And over the years, I think I've been in every business that's ever been in there. Uh, uh, when I visited most recently and saw 
what they're doing with the dream space and saw the restaurant with the uh with the as if you're at home on your couch eating off the coffee table i thought it looked like fun haven't eaten there yet mikey you're up okay yeah same probably 1975 or six but something like that um so they've definitely been there over the decades many times as far as the current rendition i have um met with i have met with the manager of the property and uh, um, a couple of times she reached out to me for um just advice on how to navigate getting certain permits this is a number of months ago which is common a lot of people reach out to me for help with permits <laughs> and uh typically that means yolanda gets an email from me very quickly and she did in this case as well um i have also been to the location and was um kind of blown away at what they've done there certainly a vision i could never have imagined but it's very creative and uh that was notable to me I've also met there with Stella, the neighbor across the street, who has sent letters for this um, for today. And she has sent letters in the past, at least one or two that I'm aware of related to um, noise issues. Uh, but I have to spend some time with her um, talking with her about that. Um, I, you know, I didn't think of this disclosure until I was sitting here at all, and it's really a nothing, but the owner of Aviate, Aviate, Aviator Nation worked for me like 20 years ago for just a few months. Her name's Paige, and um, she left me to start Aviator Nation. I, I don't even know how many years ago it was. I have no connection to her. I haven't seen her in decades. I don't even know if I'd recognize her. Um, and um but that just occurred to me just a one-off kind of odd odd thing and um but like i said i'm not connected on social media or I have any clue at all um trying to think i also talked with uh steven and alex hakeem about this um they were concerned i didn't learn anything at all that's not in the staff report i thought the staff report was was very um very complete um i think i th i think that's all my disclosures that i can think of thank you thank you mikey bruce okay i've got three forms of disclosure um first i visited the property on friday night this past friday for slightly more than an hour between 9 40 p.m and 10 45 p.m might have been a little more on both ends, but I was there for that period of time. Um, at that time, the venue was hosting what I was told to be a 300 person ticketed event. I had been hoping to see the venue in ordinary operation when there was not a large event, but I learned a lot about the venue during that visit. Um, and I learned a lot of things that are not in the council agenda report, including multiple things that are inconsistent with the report. Um, I asked some questions of the city staff and learned information I believe to be relevant to the pending application, which is not included in the council agenda report. I watched the recording of the planning commission hearing and learned things not included in the council agenda report. I am happy to explain the things I learned that are not in the report now, or I can wait until council member commentary following the close of the public hearing. So please, uh, please put it now on the record so that it can be commented by uh, during the public hearing. Okay, um, it's gonna take a little bit because I was there for a while and I learned a lot. Um, the headline of what I learned from visiting the property was that it appeared to me that the venue was in violation of its existing CUP in multiple ways, and that it also is problematic for other ways without regard to whether they're in compliance or violation of the CUP. As I approached the venue from the Civic Center area, the first thing I noticed was that cars were parked on both sides of PCH, the entire length of the area where parking is permitted from Dreamland headed towards the Civic Center. That is from the entrance of the Adamson House to the Malibu Pier on one side, and from Dreamland to the end of the parking lane as you approach Sarah on the other side of the roadway. There were a few open spots along the way, but not more than three or four. 
and they were mainly at the outermost part of the area I just described. When I first arrived around 9.40 p.m., I was going to park in the off-site lot adjacent to the venue. That's the, the lot that, that is one of the parts of the um, application. But there was a parking charge, so I decided to park on the street. I saw that offside lot was filled beyond the ordinary capacity with cars double parked and possibly triple parked. I asked one of the parking attendants how many cars were in the lot. He told me between 45 and 50. I commented that that seemed like a lot of cars for that lot. He replied that many of them had been there all day. I didn't really understand the point of that reply, but that's what he told me. I subsequently learned from Richard Malika this today that there are 38 spots in that lot. Uh, so there were between 45 and 50 cars in that lot, and they were, as I say, double parked, possibly triple parked when I saw them. I drove across the, the front of the restaurant in the parking lot um, to head back up PCH to find a space. The primary lot was full, including handicapped spaces that had cars parked in them without handicap plates or hang tags. In total, 25 cars were parked in the primary parking lot, because I counted them. The agenda report says there are 23 spaces. There were valets available for parking in the offsite lot adjacent to the venue, uh, but the valets didn't appear to be available to take cars to other offsite locations. Um, they were all standing at the entrance of the offsite lot. They weren't in the front of the venue itself. I witnessed numerous vehicles pull up to the building, unload passengers, drive off to find a parking space on PCH or elsewhere. Um, they weren't offered valet service. I witnessed a party bus drop off a number of passengers before moving on to park in front of a red curb along PCH where the party bus remained the entire time I was there. After leaving the parking lot, I parked in the first available lawful parking space I could find on PCH, which was approximately a thousand feet from Dreamland on the ocean side of PCH. When I got out of my car, I could hear the loudspeaker off in a distance. It was faint, but I could hear it. First thing I did was walk around the walk towards the Adamson house till I got to the last car parked along PCH. I then walked back and counted the vehicles on both sides of PCH. There were 78 vehicles. There also were multiple vehicles parked in the Jack in the Box parking lot. I went and looked at the Jack in the Box. There were no patrons in the store. I don't know if they had four employees that each had their own car or not. I approached Dreamland from the Jack in the Box after confirming there were no patrons in the store. I have a recording of what I saw and heard as I approached the venue, which I'm going to ask to be shown later. In short, there was a loudspeaker with a person speaking and music emanating from the patio of the venue. I couldn't tell whether the music was being performed on the patio or just being piped out there, but it was very loud and plainly a part of the event. I walked towards the patio. I was greeted by an employee who asked me what I was doing there when I was about 20 to 25 feet from the patio gate. Um, he seemed like a security guard, but I couldn't tell for sure because he wasn't wearing a traditional security guard uniform. I identified myself, explained that there's a hearing regarding a permit application scheduled for this evening, and I wanted to check out the venue. He went back into the gate. The loudspeaker was immediately turned off within a, within a few seconds of him going in there. Then another employee came out and asked me what I was doing there. I told him the same thing that I told the prior employee. Um, he asked if he could ask any questions, answer any questions. I told him I was just interested in observing. Um, I asked if there was an admission fee. He told me it was a ticketed event. It was sold out. I walked around the front parking lot towards the off-site parking lot. At that point, I was greeted by another employee who identified himself as Brian Conway. I think he's going to be speaking tonight. Brian told me he had installed the sound system for the venue, if I remember correctly. He asked me what I was doing there. I told him the same thing I told the other two men. Brian was a very genial, laid back guy. We ended up speaking for about the venue, about Malibu and some other things for about 30 or 40 minutes um, from sometime just before 10 p.m. until sometime after 10.30 p.m. Um, and I normally don't speak to anyone who's involved in one of these appeals, but you know, it just happened. I, I didn't intend to speak to anyone there, but we had a really nice conversation. Brian told me multiple things that are not in the council agenda report. I didn't take notes, but I learned the following things. For the most part, I learned Brian's an enthusiastic advocate for the venue. He perceives the venue offers multiple benefits to the community. Um, notwithstanding Brian's enthusiastic advocacy for the venue, it was apparent to me that Dreamland is not a restaurant. Rather, it's an entertainment venue. Our code calls that a nightclub. 
Brian objected to the term nightclub on account of negative connotations of places like Studio 54 or other places where there's bottle service and people doing coke in the bathrooms. I explained to him that I didn't attribute those characteristics to a nightclub. It's just a statutory term we have in Malibu, which I'm going to talk about later when we have our hearing, when we have our council comments. Um, it was palpable to me that Brian was genuinely excited about the potential for the club. It's equally palpable that many of the patrons at the event were having a great time. The one thing that struck me above all other things Brian said was that he's visited and worked at music venues throughout the country and he views this one to be unique with great potential to be a destination venue and could even host high priced events for major recording artists. He also said the venue could be used by social media influencers. I agree that this venue is unique from what I saw. It's situated across the street from the Pacific Ocean. It has no competition with 10 or 20, within 10 or 20 miles in any direction. And it's in the midst of a small town that prides itself in its quiet rural nature. Where better a place for a venue operator to establish this sort of business? Um, I'll talk about the mission statement later, but you know, it didn't look to me to be consistent with what we view Malibu to be, notwithstanding the comments of Paul and Mikey about how great it looked. I'm confident Brian was genuinely excited about the potential for the unique destination venue. The very things that make it a unique venue, however, are the things that counsel against having such a venue in Malibu. Um, I'll go into those things later. Um, but you know, I knew that there was a complaint about noise. That's why I, I wanted to go see what was going on. Um, I can't imagine that if the people who complained about the noise in the past were there, and listening Friday night, they wouldn't have complained again because as I was standing across the street to Malibu Pier, it, I could hear the music very, very evidently. Also, Brian and I stood outside the entire time. We were near the sidewalk where the adjacent parking lot is. It, it, the music was very loud the entire time we were standing there outside. When, people, when the door was opened, it was even louder, but even with the door closed, you, you could hear the concert going on inside. Um, I, mean, I want to make something clear. Brian was an amazing ambassador for the venue. He had only positive things to say. It's evident that he genuinely believes this is a positive development for Malibu. Um, we just had a different point of view. Anyway, after saying goodnight, I walked across the street. I could still hear the music. I took a few seconds of video to memorialize what I could hear from across the street more than 150 feet away. That could be played later, too. Um, as I walked to my car, I passed two encampments of unhoused people sleeping on the ocean side of the fence, um, at least trying to sleep, because I suspect that they could hear the noise as well. Maybe it was part of their dreams. Um, separate and apart from that, I asked the city staff what the legal occupancy limit of the venue is for the amount of floor space proposed by the amended CUP. Yolanda Bundy told me the building code, and this is in writing, the building code establishes a maximum allowable occupancy load of 237 people for the amount of square feet that this has been reduced to. And that's without any tables and with unfixed seating. Um, I'll be curious to learn, because I, I didn't go in whether the um, sofas and tables were moved out of the um, area, because if they weren't, I understand that reduces the maximum occupancy. Um, that's important information that's not included in the council agenda report. Um, I watched the planning commission meeting. I um, saw the public participation, which included a video of the interior of the venue from across and from across the street. Um, that gave me pause for concern, which is one of the reasons I went and visited the venue. I wouldn't have known to do that if I hadn't seen the video from watching the planning commission meeting. Um, that wasn't part of the council agenda report. Um, I guess an MP3 could have been attached. Um, what I saw from watching that, and I didn't go inside, was that, um, and, and Paul described this, there's, there, there's, no, there's no table, traditional tables and chairs like a restaurant would have. There are sofas and um, some coffee tables. Um, I don't know if that constitutes a restaurant or not. Um, those are the things that I learned. Um, I learned something from Richard today too. I forget what it was. I have it in my notes. Richard, do you remember what it was you? You, you told me today that I didn't know before. You're, you're muted, Richard. Thank you very much, Mayor. Uh, there was also um, a question of if they had notified the city of the meeting. No, that wasn't it. 
it was parking. Oh, oh, maybe it was I learned from you there were 38 parking, there were 30 something parking spaces and there were 45 to 50 cars there. So I already covered that. Okay. So those, thank you. Those are the things I learned. I, I mean, I'm going to do my level best to keep an open mind about the application until the public hearing is held and concluded. Um, but those are the facts I learned when I was there Friday night and from my interactions with the staff. I also had some um, interactions with Trevor. I had some legal questions. Um, I may discuss them later, um, but I understand I'm not supposed to disclose what we talked about in terms of this is what I asked Trevor, this is what he told me. Those are my disclosures. Thank you, Bruce. May, Mayor, Mayor President Silverstein, um, you're, you're correct uh, in terms of our, our conversation, but if there, I believe you mentioned there there was additional evidence, there, there was additional uh, information that you had that was not in the staff report regarding um, video. If, if if that if, if that is uh, if, if that's not fully described, or there's something in there that that hasn't been described, um, we should um, get that out before the public hearing so it can be commented on by everyone. Okay, so I asked Richard and Steve if they could have the video that was used at the planning commission hearing available to be played at this hearing, and I also provided them with the two videos that I referenced that I took. The, the planning commission uh, video is already in the in, in the record, so that wouldn't need to be. Um, you know, put into the put in here and for the public hearing, but anything that's not already in the record, then um, we should um, have that put out before the uh, public hearing commences. If you give us a moment, Mayor, we'll play those videos for you. Okay. We can go with the other disclosures while, while you're getting that ready. So, Mr. Uring, would you like to take sure. over while we're waiting for the video? Sure. Uh, I, I went back also and listened to the, the planning commission meeting. Uh, as a result of that, while well, I listened to the planning commission meeting, I sent some, as a result of that meeting, I sent some questions to Adrian, um, some of which I got answered, some of which I didn't. Uh, I spoke to Stella, who lives across the street. Uh, I watched the videos from the planning commission meeting, which displayed the fact that, and, and I agree with uh, what previously said, I mean, it's a pretty strange layout for a restaurant, whether that constitutes a restaurant or not, I'm not sure. Um, and I did a little research. I asked Adrian to send me the prior C CUPs and, and resolutions that took place because I wanted to read those things and compare them to some of the notes that were in the staff report. And he sent me those and I completed that review and I'll bring that up when we get back to the, the uh, hearing. That's it, Paul. Thank Mayor, you, Steve. We do have those videos ready now. If you'd like to see the new videos from Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein. Sure. Let's see the videos. And there was one more thing I forgot to note. I'm looking through my notes. Um, I asked Brian how many security guards were on duty for this 300 person ticketed event. He told me there were four. He wasn't certain he was act. He was correct. Um, the existing CUP and proposed amended CUP requires one security guard for every 50 patrons. Council Member Silverstein, uh, just a, a couple of questions. Um, you were visiting the venue on Friday just to do an on-site visit as you commonly do for um, other projects that come up and you weren't intending to speak with anyone. I think you said that, correct? I, I don't commonly do site visits, but the, the video that I saw in the, pub, in the um, planning commission meeting piqued my interest. So I wanted to see what this venue looked like and I absolutely didn't go there to speak to anybody. But I didn't want to be impolite. He was a real nice man, and he started a conversation, so we spoke for a while. Okay, and the and the the video you were not intending to go there in video, but it, it, you you uh, uh, based on on what you were seeing there, you wanted to 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 uh, to to share that. Is that correct? It surprised me, so I took out my phone and started taking video. 
Okay. Have you, have you formed any uh, opinions of, about this project or um, you have any, 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 uh, any, any, um, any uh, pre uh, preconceived notions about uh, the decision that you're going to make tonight on this project or um, the, the, the applicants before you? From the time I receive the agenda for every meeting at which we have an appeal of this, uh, an appeal, I begin forming opinions by reading the report and by doing the other research that I do, but I make sure that I reserve judgment until I hear the entire public hearing and listen to the other council members. And sometimes I change my mind, sometimes I don't. Okay. Thank you. Karen, I believe you have the floor. Thanks, Paul. Uh, well, as long as everybody's uh, talking about their history with that location, yeah, I too, I used to go to the Crazy Horse. So I think I've also visited every business that's been there since. Um, as far as what's before us tonight, uh, I had a brief conversation on the phone today with Alex Hakim. I didn't learn anything that is not in the report. And that's my disclosure. Mikey? Yeah, just listening to the lengthy disclosures made me think of a couple more things. Um, I've had food there twice. Actually, the food's really good. Um, so it definitely serves food for what it's worth. Um, they have a full menu and uh, it's actually really delicious, to be honest. Um, and in meeting with the manager, owner, I believe, I'm, I'm not sure the title exactly, with Kelly, um, when she was first trying to figure out, you know, just how to come into compliance on everything, you know, it was, it was, you know, that's, that's an old building. There was a bunch of things to do. Um, I had her add me to the emails she sends out to the city and sheriff when she's doing events to let them know her schedule and what's coming up. And I, um, so I can see it and understand what, you know, and she's doing a great job on that, in my opinion. I mean, it seems very complete. And I also helped introduce her to the sheriff. I said she should definitely meet the sheriff, which she has done. And I know she sends, uh, I believe, uh, Lieutenant Carr, she sends emails on all the events going on there. So I did want to add that to my disclosure. Thank you. And I'm going to add to my disclosure that when I was at the site, I met the, uh, the lady who designed the interior, who I guess is probably the same lady you're talking about, Mikey. Uh, and we talked a little bit about her history and the music business and her her father, her godfather, who used to own the the, the uh, crazy horse. Uh, the Hakeem brothers were there. I said hello to them. Uh, and, you know, looked at it and we talked about how the uh, space had been restructured. So what was a tiny store where my goddaughter had worked not this summer but the previous summer before that when she came to stay with us for the summer and uh it uh so that's that's it and i have one pair of those pants by the way which she gave me as a thank you for hosting her for the summer okay I believe that takes us to uh, appellant team number one will present. Yes, we do have both appellants here, Pat Healy and Brittany Jackson representing the Manny brothers. Brittany signed up first so we can hear from their side and see if they'd like to save any time for rebuttal. Okay, and how much time is available for them in total? They have 15 minutes. 15 minutes for appellant one and then another 15 for appellant two or seven and a half a piece. 15 minutes for each side, unless Trevor is okay. going to correct me. I, I have a question of Trevor before the presentation. I, I know that this is the order in which things are done. I've seen it before, but I, based on the, the, the questions I asked before this, I understand, and I'm not sure everyone has, this is said publicly no, normally. This is an application by the applicant for us to, for us to decide whether to grant the application. This isn't a decision by us whether to agree with the appeal or disagree with the appeal. So why does the appellant go first and not the applicant? This is the number one. I'd say this is the process that's been set up in the city for dealing with these. You know, so we're consistent in the in the, in the, in the 
um, the, the procedures that we apply to this. I, I mean, I believe that the, the origin is that in this case, um, since the since the application was granted underneath, the appellant is there to raise the issues with the decision that was previously made to lay it out there, and then the other side gets the, the chance to respond. The applicant does have the, the, since it is an application, they will have the final rebuttal at the end. But um, it, whoever is appealing the decision is the one who um, speaks first, and that's the procedures that the city has um, put in place. All right, thanks, Chair. Brittany, you are unmuted. Would you like to save any time for rebuttal? Yes, I would like to reserve seven minutes of my time for rebuttal. You can go ahead and start when you're ready. Good evening. My name is Brittany Jackson and I represent Manny Brothers Real Estate, one of the appellants in this matter. In our appeal application, we identified several bases for the appeal. I would like to focus my comments today on one of the key issues, the impropriety of splitting the Aviator Nation and Malibu, Malibu Motel Inn. These two requests before the Council or before the Planning Commission are inextricably linked and must therefore be considered as one project for approval. However, they have been improperly split uh, despite the Planning Commission recognizing their inherent connection. This is in clear violation of California law. The council agenda report provided before today's meeting concedes that CEQA guidelines forbid piecemealing or segmenting projects. So the report fails to acknowledge that is exactly what has been proposed here. The staff report notes that the Aviator Nation proposal is self-contained and is not dependent or contingent on any other development. However, it is being proposed precisely to free up more parking for use by the adjoining Malibu Inn Motel project. The California Supreme Court has recognized that where an individual project is a necessary precedent for action on a larger project, project with significant environmental effects, an EIR must address itself to the scope of the larger project. Aviator Nation is a necessary precedent for Malibu and Motel, and they must therefore be considered together. Courts have held that two requests fall within the same project when the requests are related to each other when one request is conditioned upon the completion of another request, or when the requests are related in time, physical location, or entity undertaking the action. Prior staff reports have acknowledged that Aviator Nation and Malibu Inn Motel are related to each other. The March 24, 2022 staff report states that the request to amend the joint use parking agreement is directly related to the proposed motel on the adjacent lot. That was on page 13. And the April 1, 2022 staff report recognizes that these items are inherently linked because of their common ownership and because the joint use parking agreement was issued for the Malibu Inn Motel to occupy several parking spaces on the adjacent parking lot. Aviator Nation and Malibu Inn Motel are also related in time, physical location, and the entity undertaking the action. They occupy adjoining lots, they are under common ownership, and they have independent driveway access and parking. Accordingly, they must be considered as a singular project in order to comply with California law. There are other issues with the application, including those that have been articulated in the letters sent by my colleague, Marshall Camp, and the letter attachments, um, as well as some of the issues that were articulated by Mr. Silverstein today. Uh, for these re reasons, we request that the appeal be granted. The Aviator Nation applications should be denied and sent back to staff so that it may be properly considered with a Malibu Inn Motel after further analysis, including a full EIR. I thank you for your time. Thank Next, you, Brittany. Next, we can hear from Pat Healy, the other appellant for this project. Good evening. Can you can you hear me? Pam, yes. we can hear you. How much of your time would you like to reserve? Well, what I'd like to do is just speak and whatever time I have left over, I reserve. Okay. That works for us. Okay, thank you. Good evening, Council. I just want to let you know the Malibu Coalition for Slow Growth is also a party to this appeal. 
Um, undoubtedly, the proposed motel and the amendment of the joint use parking agreement um, are in reality one project under CEQA, as the Manny Bodies attorney just pointed out. Uh, and they have to be heard together as one by the Planning Commission. Prior to the Planning Commission hearing, require the NEIR so that the Council, the commission, Planning Commission and public understand the impacts of this proposed parking agreement and motel will have on Malibu residents. The enactment of these parking requirements should be put on hold or considered interim until an EIR process is completed. The EIR must include an updated traffic, parking, and circulation study since the last one was done 12 years ago and circumstances have dramatically changed. There are more traffic lights, social media has brought more visitors, more shopping centers than a college have or are being built. A cemetery has been approved and the pending expansion of Pepperdine is in the works, all of which will affect PCH's fragile infrastructure and traffic flow. In the immediate vicinity, there's been a dramatic increase in PCH traffic and lack of parking availability because the Surfrider Motel has been expanded and four very successful restaurants, Nobu, Soho House, the farm restaurants have opened and traffic flow is further impeded by drivers looking or for, looking for or wanting parking spaces and also trying to get into these venues. The added impact of the motel and the impact of events must be analyzed. On another note, it's odd that the parking agreement amendment is being proposed now when there's no rational need for it. The, there can only be one reason. The owner of both properties is asking for a reduction of the Aviation Nation parking prior to the motel hearing to permanently locked in through the CUP amendment, seven additional parking spaces, which were needed for his motel. By granting this amendment, uh, you will be giving the motel a premature advantage without the proper studies. Today, it's an event venue that incidentally serves food and this should be recognized so it's because it's the only place um, existing today for musical events. Uh, instead of reducing the parking, an increase in aviation nature parking is required and the council has the ability to do this as well as reduce the number of events to make the required findings. Currently, aviation employees also park on PCH during events, taking up valuable parking. Um, and all this uh, employee parking is required in the code to be on uh, site. Um, the air between Nobu and Cross Creek Road is gridlocked in the summer, year round on most weekends, and often during weekday rush hours. Assuming uh, two persons per vehicle attending events, um, I based it on um, 300 attendees, so 150 customer parking spaces are needed for large events and 50 to 60 spaces for smaller events. Um, and so all of all these spaces should be all on both properties, small events can be accommodated, parking can be accommodated as well as employee parking. Uh, there's still insufficient parking to accumulate large events and they obviously are unable to park on site as required by code. The proposed 20 room motel planned on the parking lot meets the definition of a hotel and needs a minimum of 40 parking spaces instead of 20. This hotel project will undoubtedly have a significant impact on the area and must be considered at the same time as the amended parking agreement. Since the council can make changes, we recommend that you enact the following changes and be allowed and that aviation nature uh, be allowed on an interim basis until the EIR process is completed uh, and then uh, you'll know how to make a better decision. The entire adjacent parking lot should be exclusively dedicated for the use of by Aviator Nation, their employees and patrons. When the entire parking lot spaces are not needed, they can be used by visitors to help alleviate the PCH lack of parking. Large events be reduced to one event, one per month. 
This will, will allow Aviator Nation to be a large event venue so that many Malibu residents can enjoy, which so many Malibu residents enjoy and look forward to. For large events, a shuttle service should be required. For small events, find out how many parking spaces are needed for employees, the band, uh, and reduce the small event attendees to the number of parking remaining spaces. Small events should be reduced to four a month. All events should take place in the evening when traffic impact is less. If the events are to continue, the event conditions must be strictly enforced. Um, or uh, if residents continue to complain, the event should be suspended. Aviator Nation, should be required to hire if the sheriff can't patrol it an off duty sheriff to be sure off site behavior is orderly and doesn't create a nuisance to the neighbors. A city code enforcement officer should also be present to immediately address, address residents complaint. The hours of aviation nation's operation should be as the hours as approved in the planning commission resolution. These are my comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pat. Next, we have Stephen Hakeem representing the applicant. Mr. Hakeem, are you available? Yes, hello. Hi, how much time does uh, Mr. Hakeem get? 15 total? minutes. Would you like to reserve any for rebuttal? Uh, we'd like to speak until uh, we have, uh, and whatever time is remaining, leave for rebuttal. Please. Okay. Thank you All very right. much. Before we start. Yeah. Uh, hi, this is Stephen Hakeem. I'm here with my brother, Alex. Uh, before we start on uh, uh, what we had prepared, I just wanted to uh, quickly respond to some of the things that Mayor Portem Silverstein had mentioned. Um, you know, he he went through uh, various items that he thought he 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 started the conversation by saying with things that were against the CUP or in violation, but I still haven't heard one thing which was in violation of the CUP. He stated that he was there until I believe 9:45 p.m. and there was some music on the patio, and the CUP allows for music until 10 p.m. on the patio. Um, you know, uh, we're obligated to provide valet service during live events, and there were valet people there, and we cannot force people to valet their cars. Um, and, uh, you know, if they want to park on the street, that's their prerogative. And, of course, these large events, which uh, Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein happened to be at one of them, can only happen a maximum amount of twice per month, I just want to know. Um, I noticed. I noticed also in the video that we can hear the park. Uh, you know, the cars driving by on the highway louder than you know the music at times. And I just found out this person, Brian, who I guess you had a very nice conversation with, is a sound technician. Um, so I would really not rely on anything having to do with the operations of the venue. Um, he's, you know, so I just wanted to make some of those points and then my brother Alexander is going to go into some, <laughs> some of the. Uh, Thank you, Stephen. Good evening, Mayor Grisanti and City Council members. It is a pleasure to speak before you here today. We greatly appreciate your time and con consideration. I'm Alexander Hakeem. I'm here with my brother Stephen, representing the ownership of the property located at 22969 PCH, also known as the Malibu Inn. For decades now, the Malibu Inn has been known as a place where locals and members of the community can come together, have a good meal, celebrate the arts and local artists, and bring the community together. It is a place where people from all ages, young to old, can gather, create great memories, and share in Malibu's rich history. Before I start, I wanted to give a brief introduction about us and this property. We have invested significantly in Malibu over the past several years and believe in its promise and have always tried to improve the city and make it better any way we can while doing things in a first-class manner. We are not a major real estate corporation. We are a family-run business similar to the mom and pop operations that make up the fabric of what Malibu is all about. We always try and be conscious of what Malibu's wants and needs are. For example, we have never rented to a chain store and instead prioritize the locals and the community first. We work extremely hard and put our heart and soul into anything we do. When we took over this property 13 years ago, I'm not sure if you remember, but this property was run to the ground and had lost all of its licenses. After listening to the stories and voices of the community, our appreciation for this establishment grew even more and so did our love for its rich history, which we tried our best to salvage. 
It took us two years to get the new CUP for this property, which is in place today. And while doing so, my brother Stephen and I managed the restaurant and waited tables at the Malibu Inn to keep the restaurant and operations going. In getting a new CUP for this property, parking, service area, hours of operation, hours of liquor sales, use, were all dissected in great detail and ultimately approved by the Planning Commission. It was then appealed to the City Council and was approved once again. Lastly, after being in operation for several months, the property had another review by the Planning Commission and certain conditions of approval were modified and approved, being that the property had no issues and the CUP was in full conformance as it is today. The CUP has been in effect for close to 13 years now, and the operations have been running smoothly by our tenants who occupy the premises, and our tenants are aware of and strive to operate within the confines of the CUP. If that is not the case, we would like to be made aware of it immediately and the opportunity to correct it appropriately. In fact, we have reached out to code enforcement and the planning department to request to be notified of any complaints within one business day so that we can take immediate corrective action. It is also important to note that in 13 years of the CUP being in effect, the property has had no complaints regarding parking or traffic issues. You also have a letter that was sent to the city council from the old operator of the space, Kathy Harvey Escobar, as well as a letter from the current valet operator for Aviator Nation and Dreamland attesting to this fact. Furthermore, and this is very important, the main reason why we're here today, eight years ago, we took a large portion of the restaurant and converted it to retail. This was done through the direction of Joyce Bezlinski, who was the head of the planning department at the time, in conjunction with Craig George and Jim Thorson, the previous city manager. We also received a certificate of occupancy dated January 13th, 2014 from the city, showing this conversion was done and went through all the necessary departments, which you should have in your file. After receiving the planning approvals from the various departments and the certificate of occupancy being issued, we then signed leases based on these parameters. The conversion to retail is what is triggering the reduction in parking pursuant to the requirements of the Malibu Municipal Code. By doing this conversion, we have greatly de-intensified the use of the property, eliminating a large portion of the restaurant service area, which in turn does not require as many parking spaces. In other words, this administrative process does not seek to reduce parking in the way that the appellants are framing the issue. Rather, it is an effort to rectify the parking counts to reflect what is actually required by the Malibu Code. That rectification happens to result in a reduction due to the less intense use of the land. That is the only change we have made. We are not asking to increase any hours of operation or add more service area or add more occupancy. On the contrary, we have actually reduced the occupancy in the service area. We merely took a restaurant away and substituted for retail. This change was also voted on and approved by the Planning Commission on April 4th, 2022. Importantly, the Planning Commission added several conditions of approval to the project, some of which are burdensome to the operations, some of which are burdensome to the operations, which we're seeking to remove as conditions. We worked very hard to get the original CUP for this property and the tenants signed their lease with this CUP as their basis. We feel as though these added conditions of approval are unnecessary and unwarranted and would like for them to be removed and for the business to operate based on the existing CUP. The conditions we are seeking to remove are as follows. Condition number seven, the hours of operation should not be modified as this has no bearing on the change to re change to retail conversion. Condition 12, which imposes a requirement for a 42 inch barrier wall dividing the space. We are open to having the space blocked off for events only but not permanently divided as the store also serves as another ADA restroom for the restaurant. Condition 13, six month event schedule approval is unnecessary and extremely difficult to forecast. We currently need to provide three day notice and this has worked for 13 years. Condition number 14, related to new parking signs. This condition is not imposed by the planning commission but was added by staff to the proposed city council resolution. Additional signs related to parking will just be confusing and superfluous given that the parking will be largely operated by valet anyway. The points raised by the appellants in the appeal have no legal merit, as will be discussed in further detail by our counsel as needed, and it is clear to us that the appeals were filed for ulterior motives. One of the appellants is Manny Brothers Real Estate Group, which operates the Malibu Beach Inn and who has an independent incentive to try to block any competition from opening up nearby for fear of losing clientele. The other appellant is a representative from Malibu Coalition for Slow Growth, which has a stated policy of opposing any project that seeks a variance in the city and has publicly accused the city of passing out variances like Halloween candy. Each of the appellants has their own motives for opposing the motel project that are not based on any legal merits. And furthermore, this has nothing to do with the motel project. 
the city council should be cognizant of the purely obstructionist as opposed to merit-based nature of the appeals. Do you have our slides, please? Thank you. This is a simple slide showing the original retail space, uh, only about 500 square feet, and then they expanded. Next slide, please. And they took over this entire uh, dining room area and uh, expanded into that space. So it's pretty black and white. Next, play, next slide, please. This is an email saying um, that they wish to reiterate that both the restaurant, live restaurant and retail area of the Malibu Inn building will need planning approval for submittal into plan check prior to permit issuance. Ultimately, we'll need to issue a CFO for each business prior to them opening. This is from Craig George, um, and uh, it says we need to talk to Joyce and go through all the necessary channels. Next slide, please. And then this is a certificate of occupancy with a date highlighted showing that the CFO was then granted and the change was done and is in effect today. Thank you very much. I would now, now like to please pass along uh, my time to Sina. We are accompanied by our attorney from JMBM, Sina Samimi, who will be addressing some legal ish issues raised by the appellants. If you could kindly unmute him, we would like to give his give him the floor now. Sina, if you could please go ahead. Honorable Mayor, Council Members, I want to just touch on a couple of things. The first, we, we were uh, a little bit surprised. We were expecting uh, Mayor Pro Tem, Mr. Silverstein, to recuse himself, uh, not just for the comments that he made, but uh, there's also a history of contentious litigation between Mr. Silverstein and the appellants, the Manny brothers. We believe there's an unacceptable probability of bias on the part of Mr. Silverstein. Silverstein. The litigation has been widely publicized and reported on and we do not believe that Mr. Silverstein can consider this matter in an impartial or unbiased way. Uh, now I want to go to the main point of the appellants, and I just want to briefly hit on this. Um, the uh, piecemealing, they didn't really define what it means, but piecemealing refers to an attempt to evade full environmental review that would otherwise be required under CEQA by artificially splitting a project into smaller subparts which would appear innocuous uh, compared to the total project as a whole. In contrast, activities that operate independently and can be implemented separately are treated as separate projects under CEQA. Even the cases cited by the appellants acknowledge this. They say that the, the piecemealing occurs when one request quote is conditioned upon completion of another request. This is a relatively black and white test because here the projects can obviously be implemented independently. Let's take each scenario. First, if there was never a Malibu Inn Motel project, this rectification of the parking numbers to reflect the requirements of the Malibu Code could and should be done anyway. Conversely, regardless of the outcome of this appeal, the Malibu Motel project can move forward and be approved as long as it can satisfy the parking requirements of the Malibu Municipal Code. Neither project is conditioned on the other, and each can move forward independently. I've, I've recently litigated this issue, this very peacefully, piecemealing issue. I'll make myself available to the council for any additional questions. Uh, I know this area of the law very well, and simply put, they're wrong on it. Uh, and obviously, the city in the staff report agrees with this. Uh, we'd like to reserve the rest of the time. Thank you very much. Yeah. So that brings us to public comment, I believe. Yes, and so we have about 19 speakers from the public here. The first few are Shelby Mead, uh, Susanna Owens, Judy Edinger, and Kelly Ferrano. We'll hear from Shelby Mead first. Very good. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Hi, everyone. Long meeting, my goodness. Um, we hung in here. First of all, I just want to say that I have been inside the venue um, in many different iterations over the years, and I can't express enough how awesome it is to have a place for us to have music and community in Malibu, from Richard Gibbs's composer brunches every Monday morning, which I don't know if you've attended, but they're pretty amazing. I was able to work with Kelly and the team to bring the World Surf League in to do an event a couple of weeks ago for the longboarding finals that were across at first point and get to work with Kelly with um, the Stockwell family and Helena across the street and with the hotels next door and see how our community works together, all those businesses, which is wonderful. 
So the gentleman who's, um, I don't know him, Bruce is his name that didn't go inside. You really should have. And uh, they run a good event. They run a safe event inside. The sound outside, which I believe the Hakeem brothers mentioned, the PCH is louder than the music that was on the porch, if you go by. And that sounded to me just like the music coming from inside that was on the stage. So to make that a big deal is just kind of silly. Um, we have a lot of people that want to do events there from, you know, film companies to different people that reach out and say, Shelby, where can we have community events in Malibu? And Dreamland is a wonderful option for us. So it would be great to have you all figure out what's going on here with all of this parking, but most people park on the street. I know I do. Um, I don't actually valet at the venue, but there's always a place to park if you plan ahead of time. So I don't need to go any further, but I think what they're doing is great and let's continue it and figure out how to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Susanna Owens, followed by Judy Ettinger, Kelly Ferrano, Bill Sampson, and Brandon Jenner. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. Um, I'm Susanna Owens. I wanted to say that I'm against this appeal and I'm in support of Aviator Nation. I've been to the venue several times before it was Aviator Nation and have also been recently for dining as well as an entertainment event. This place is exactly what Malibu needs. It's a first class operation. I arrived for the event and was met by a valet attendant who took my car seamlessly. Um, also super easy when I wanted to leave. Um, there was no traffic or cars lined up behind one another. I wanted to note that I observed that the music, um, it wasn't on the patio. Um, people were outside and the music inside was not loud enough to disturb neighbors at all. I was curious about the retail component, how it would play into the restaurant. And I noticed that they had like a draped, a large red curtain so no one could enter the retail area. Um, the venue feels kind of like a lounge, which is super nice for eating and listening to the music. I love that the um, I love that the venue supports the locals as they have done a lot so far for the community and the owner is also a local from Malibu. Um, I think it's a bit ridiculous that one of the neighbors is complaining about this venue um, when their house sits directly on PCH across from this venue that's been that's had live music for over 50 years. Um, again, thank you for your time. Let's support this business. Such, um, it's doing great things for the city. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna. Our next speaker is Judy Ettinger, followed by Kelly Frano, Bill Sampson, Brandon Jenner, and Stella Allen. Judy, are you available? Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, great. Hi, my name is Judy Ettinger, and I've watched the previous hearing and have read the staff report for this case and I am against this appeal. I have also been coming to this location for many years, since even before Aviator Nation existed. I think Aviator Nation did a wonderful job keeping the charm of the place intact. I love how you can shop and grab a quick bite to eat or a coffee, and I think their food is really good. I think we should be helping the businesses in the city since they have been affected by the pandemic and the wildfires, which have downsized and affected the population of Malibu. This is a good business for Malibu and a big plus for the community. We really need to be adding businesses right now. And this establishment has been here long before the city was even incorporated. I feel this appeal should be denied. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Kelly Ferrano, followed by Bill Sampson, Brandon Jenner, Stella Allen, and Nick Eliopoulos. Hi, Hello. Kelly, are you available? Yes, I am. Thank you. Hello. Thanks for having me. Good evening. Um, I am Kelly Ferrano. I'm the managing director and partner of Dreamland, um, the greatest honor that I've ever had in my adult life. Um, I'm also a mother of two young children and a Malibu resident, a female businesswoman and entrepreneur who, together with the founder of Aviator Nation, Paige Mykoski, poured blood, sweat, and tears into the creation of Dreamland during a pandemic, no less. It has been um, an in, a heavy lift, but also my greatest joy to bring this dream to life for the Malibu community while ensuring that we strictly respect our CUP, honor the local needs, and embrace 
our shared appetite for access to the arts in one of the greatest artist communities in the world, Malibu. A brief history about myself, as Paul mentioned um, briefly about. Um, my legendary father was a tour manager for Led Zeppelin, The Grateful Dead, Rolling Stones, Pink Floyd, and Neil Young in the 70s. Uncle Neil owned the Crazy Horse Saloon in the 70s, and like I mentioned, it is truly my um, greatest joy to be now calling that place my office. Um, it is um, in my family blood. We own 25 um, successful restaurants throughout the country. And operating this business um, as it relates specifically to RCUP and the code is of utmost importance to me. And as anyone can attest to who has met me, who has experienced our operation since reopening in July, would say this. We are a full service restaurant. We are open seven days a week for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We are allowed two large live events a month and eight small ones. Um, again, following the rules is something I do. I'm a mother after all. Um, I think the point here is that what everyone needs to understand is I signed a lease a few years ago during a pandemic that allowed me um, certain operational hours and parking spots and um, the ability to service this community that is so meaningful to me that is already lacking in community gathering places that is starving to thrive in arts and wellness and experience and shared um, commonality. And we break bread at Dreamland in a different way. Yes, we sit on couches and we gather and we end up meeting friends and families come. We, we welcome young and old. And if you haven't been there, I want you to come. You should definitely come and, 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 and definitely these preconceived notions that we're a nightclub club, you know, are, are sort of ridiculous. Um, I myself can't stay up past 10 o'clock. This is past my bedtime. But Brian Conway is a wonderful asset. He is a sound technician who is a consultant for us. I'm glad you had a good experience with him. And of course, he's gonna speak directly to um, Kelly, our quality. Kelly, that's your time. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see Bill Sampson in the meeting, so we'll see if we can circle back to him later. And next we'll hear from Brandon Jenner, followed by Stella Allen, Nick Eliopoulos, Jefferson Wagner, and Hap Henry. Hi, Brandon, are you Hello. available? Hi, yes, I am. Thank you all for your service to the city. I, I greatly appreciate it. My name is Brandon Jenner. Um, I'm born and raised here in Malibu. Uh, this is a town that I adore so much that I've chosen to raise my three kids here as well. Um, as someone who's also spent some time learning about the history of Malibu and the incredible debt that we owe to those who came before us, I understand the importance of restrained, responsible, and thoughtful growth. Uh, this is my first time speaking to City Council, actually, and it is simply my humble hope that my story might add a little bit of perspective on how we envision Aviator Nation dreamland fitting into this community. I grew up in a very musical household and was witness to world-class musicians and artists while hanging around my father's home recording studio. Uh, the schooling I received watching my dad work ended up being vital to my own musical career, but it would have meant very little if I hadn't also had local places to perform in Malibu and hone my craft in front of peers and friends. Now, here we are in 2022, I'm 41, and we are once again on the verge of losing one of our most important, revered local establishments. I consider us so very lucky to have a group of people running the old Malibu in space who are committed to preserving the crucial role that this historical building has played in our hometown. They understand the importance and connection between music, art, and a well-rounded community. So tonight, as many of us, I'm sure listening, longtime residents still mourn the loss of sacred places like the Crazy Horse, the Trankus Club, the Doom Room, and the Old Malibu Inn, I would really like to encourage you to do everything within your power to preserve a place that I know is so important to our local community and its future. And I'd like to end my statement with a rhetorical question for all of us to ponder as stewards of Malibu and its youth. In a world where we agree and even insist sometimes that the arts are a crucial part of the curriculum in schools, shouldn't we do everything that we can to preserve and protect a place for artistic expression within our own hometown? I appreciate your time. Thank you. 
Thank you, Brandon. Our next speaker is Stella Allen, followed by Nick Eliopoulos, Jefferson Wagner, Hap Henry, and Anne Domine. I believe, yes, oh, Stella is under Robert's account. Oh, yes, I am. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Okay, thank you so much for staying up this late to listen to us. Um, first of all, I, I, I am the neighbor across the street. <laughs> My name is Stella, and I feel really um, beaten up here because I'm not trying to close the aviator nation or dreamland down or anything and i feel that's what people are are saying um my only concern here as part of this application which which spurred out from a parking dispute was i just want to make sure that the the conditions that we um, fought so hard for 12 years ago stayed in place um and i just that's why i'm here now um one also one other issue a lot of people have said mr silverstein has um, said some incorrect things. I, I I did actually videotape myself the event on Friday night, and it was a little loud. And in between the cars going by, it you can hear it from from our home across the street. I did submit that, and I sent it to Adrian um, Fernandez and Kelly in a um, Kelsey. I'm sorry, in an email. So I I guess it didn't get a chance to get uh, shown here. Um, so I have had noise complaints for over the last 12 years with every operator and, and i and believe me i i understand sometimes uh people don't know or they they get carried away with what they're doing and i love music and i am um, i go to concerts all the time and i have been to dreamland and i think it's wonderful and i think kelly has done a great job and i really like her and um i just want to make sure that there's a balance of interest between dreamland and the neighbors and the residents around us um you know i and our neighbors just want to make sure that we don't get bombarded with loud music as we have in the past with with uh, 300 people walking out and creating a whole scene or music till two in the morning. They used to have karaoke there at Casa Escobar till two in the morning with nobody there. Um, one of the other things also with Dreamland, and I haven't gotten a chance to speak to Kelly about this, is, is the outdoor patio music. And uh, the other day it was louder than actually the music inside. And I've, I've caught video of that a couple of times. And maybe the people that are working inside just forget to turn down the volume or something. But I, I would hope that somebody's watching over that. And I just want the management at Dreamland to just be aware of, of us residents um, and neighbors and, and hopefully just, you know, keep us in mind. Um, that's, I think um, that's all I have to say for now. I, I, I do hope that Dreamland is successful and, um, and does a lot of good, good things for the community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stella. Our next speaker is Nick Eliopoulos, followed by Jefferson Wagner, Hap Henry, Anne Domine, and Lonnie Gordon. You Hello, me? council members. My name is Nick Eliopoulos. I've lived in Malibu on and off for many, many years. I remember going to uh, this venue when there was sawdust on the floor and it was kind of a Pepperdine hangout. I've even seen artists such as Tom Petty and Neil Young play there. And this is a much different venue now. Back then it was a lot more busy, it was more rowdy. Uh, there were a lot more issues. The place was in much disrepair before uh, Aviator Nation went into the space. And now it's a beautiful venue. They've, they've made it into an amazing space. Um, it's no longer in disrepair. I've been following this for, for many years now. They're trying to build this hotel and and work with uh, uh, the uh, old Malibu Inn. And I'm very much against this appeal. I just want to say after reading the appealant's letter, it's obvious that the Manny brothers are trying to tie this appeal to a potential motel development next door. A motel development that would add tremendous value to the city, not only in tax dollars, but would add uh, hotel rooms that Malibu desperately needs. The hearing has nothing to do with the motel. It's simply a calculation of converting restaurant to retail, which is a disintensification of the use of the land, which in turn results in less parking. This should have already been done many years ago, and the city council now has a chance to memorialize this, that change, and this con conversion has already been done. I hope the city council will follow the planning commission and staff's recommendation. I hope the Manny brothers realize that what they're doing is wrong. We should try to help our neighbors and local businesses, not try to thwart everyone's efforts to make the city better. This is uh, brought by Manny brothers to our own personal benefit. 
and this appeal should be denied. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Jefferson Wagner, followed by Hap Henry, Ann Bonin, Lonnie Gordon, and Colin Drummond. Hey there, Jefferson. Jefferson, Candice, you should see a pop-up asking you to unmute. If Jefferson's unavailable, we can try circling back to him and we'll hear from Hap Henry next. Hey there, Hap. Hi, good evening again. Um, yeah, this this venue is a place I that has been a part of big part of my life and many others here on this meeting. Um, and it's a place that I'd like to see succeed. It's a place that I believe serves a valuable role in our community. At the same time, I have significant concerns regarding parking and traffic in this specific half mile or so stretch between the pier and Nobu. Um, it's it's already a problematic area and I don't wanna see us move in a short-sighted direction and exacerbate problems that are already, you know, worse than they were 10, 15 years ago, as has been discussed. Um, so let's make sure that we do this right and do it in a way that doesn't come at a significant detriment to the quality of life of those who travel up and down the highway and those who who are neighbors to this venue. Um, but let's also do it in a way that makes sure that the venue uh, can operate in in a manner that makes sure that they can continue on with their business. So I'm confident we can reach a solution on this and thank you for your time. Thank you, Ham. Our next speaker is Anne Donine, followed by Lonnie Gordon, Colin Drummond, and Joe Drummond. Are you available, Anne? Yes. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh, great. Okay. Well, um, first of all, I wanted to say that um, we, uh, I am um, representing Malibu Township Council, and I'm speaking for the appeal regarding the joint use parking agreement. However, um, it isn't that we're opposing the opera operation at all. It's that we want to make sure that they have adequate parking. And it appears as though we have they have insufficient parking for the operation. And so instead of reducing the parking, it should be increased. Now, since Malibu was incorporated in 1947, the Malibu Township Council has re represented its members in the Malibu area, and it, we remain a strong advocate for reasonable governa governance, responsible environmental public policy, and responsible development. And as such, we are very concerned about the propriety and validity of commercial development and parking, and of these, these two land parcels on 22959 Pacific Coast Highway and 22969, uh, which would be Aviation Nation. Um, so they would need to be adequately supported by by the good uh, by enough parking. The proposed joint use parking agreement, which we're calling JUPA, J U P A, is a result of and perhaps a ruse for piecemeal sequential commercial development. And it is strategically presented to exclude and circumvent the mitigating of actual parking needs for both the existing commercial development's business operations as Aviator Nation, including Aviator Nation's operation as an event center, and the resultant peak traffic generator or generation. Aviator Nation's historic failure to accommodate its parking needs on site for large scale special events of up to 300 attendees and that um, far exceeds the added parking capacity of the proposed joint use parking agreements because the two parcels have already and previously been utilized and proven inadequate for large scale special events. Special event attendees impermissibly park on Pacific Coast Highway and displace public beach parking for extended periods of time. 
if approved, the joint use parking agreement would not accommodate the parking demand generated and could actually reduce the amount of parking traditionally available for use by Aviator Nation. This could make the already untenable traffic and parking conditions in that area even worse. And that's your time. Okay. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lonnie Gordon, followed by Colin Drummond, Joe Drummond, Richard Gibbs, and Satchel Lieberman. Hi, Lonnie, are you available? I am. How are you tonight? Um, so I'm just going to follow up on this. Um, this is uh, on top of the state beach parking and the Malibu Pier parking, which currently cause traffic backups on PCH. Um, I'm not against what Aviator Nation is doing, but I am against what the JUPA were approved and the worst traffic backup and depletion of PCH parking that could occur during peak traffic or JUPA large parking events. The cumulative effect and impact of the current land use as a standalone fee parking lot at 2295 PCH and Aviator Nation at 22969 PCH generate and displace parking demand throughout the neighborhood. Standalone parking operations are prohibited used by the city of Malibu zoning and the state adopted, state adopted, I'm sorry about my voice tonight. <laughs> it's always gets gruff at this time of night, Malibu local coastal pro programs. Fee-based parking shifts people to look for parking on, the, on street locations, including the roadside of Pacific Coast Highway which causes traffic to slow down from Aviator Nation patrons seeking free parking opportunities, including backing up maneuvers and illegal U-turns. The state of California's Los Angeles Regional Water Quality Program Board has not allowed the wastewater discharge permit for the proposed 20-room hotel previously reviewed by the City of Malibu's Planning Commission for construction on the vacant lot at 229 Five nine PCH, which is now subject to this proposed JUPA for Aviator Nation. I did have more to say, but I'm going to let someone else take that on. Thank you. Thank you for Thank your you. time. Thank you, Lonnie. Our next speaker is Colin Drummond, followed by Joe Drummond, Richard Gibbs, Satchel Lieberman, and Barbara Burke. Hey, Colin, are you available? I am. Thank you. Um, I'm going to continue to. Uh, read um, with the group. Um, Aviator Nation's septic system accommodates only 92 restaurant patrons, yet the Planning Commission permitted recurring large events up to 300 attendees until 2 a.m. on holiday weekends, exacerbating peak traffic demands, especially during summer. Uh, Malibu has a history of uh, approving joint use parking agreements, which cause uh, disastrous and potentially deadly uh, traffic and parking problems, including the land parcels for well-known commercial restaurants, Nobu and adjacent Soho House, less than um, one half mile east of Aviator Nation and, and this proposed uh, Jupa. The concurrently proposed uh, hotel for the parking lot parcel does not comply to Malibu's general plan CB1 zoning code or LCP because it fails to design by design uh, to qualify as a motel by definition due to having food bar service, swimming pool events on the roof and significantly inadequate parking. Hotel, uh, hotels would require two parking spaces per room and hotels are not permissible in this zone. Before consideration of any JUPA, the required zone change for the proposed hotel and amenities is required. The combination of these adjacent business and uses, both current and proposed, are from the same or affiliated developer owners and must be evaluated together rather than serial or piecemeal. The impact for traffic parking deficiencies, internal parking circulation, and Americans with disability compliance remain unresolved and impractical to evaluate the cumulative effects um, uh, by these separate uh, yet concurrently pending applications. As a matter of law and the environment, the proposed um, hotel design 
remains ineligible for development, and yet this premature proposal for Jupa has been a appealed uh, by two Malibu entities. Malibu Township Council concurs that piecemeal serial development in this instance will circumvent analysis of cumulative development. The proposed adjacent hotel has proceeded nonetheless as a non-compliant proposal in flagrant disregard of the known wastewater generation and discharge limitations. The two projects also share the same traffic signalized driveway, so they should be studied together prior to DUPA consideration to remove parking conflicts and facilitate internal traffic circulation and safe exiting onto PCH. Such as when a car is parked in the spot in front of Aviation, you can't drive through to get to the light to make a safe exit. The continued non-compliant use of, of both parcels and the unmitigated off-site impacts are contrary to planning policy and necessitate uh, evaluation by EIR. Colin, to... that's your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Joe Drummond, followed by Richard Gibbs, Satchel Lieberman, Barbara Burke, and Brian Conway. Hi, it's Joe. There's a slideshow. The staff report statement that it was de uh, determined that the project is beneficial by reducing the parking demand of the site when in fact currently insufficient as observed on October 22nd and by Mr. Silverstein, employee parking at at least of at least 20, a loading area for musicians and roadies need another five to 10 parking spaces. Staff report further states that there is a lack of proof of traffic backup, which is only why a complete parking and traffic study must be conducted to EIR standards. It's clear the applicant's goal is to reduce parking for Aviator Nation and allocate it to a non-studied hotel, which requires two parking spaces per room by zoning definition. Again, a hotel is not permitted in a CV1 zone. The proposed hotel would need an enormous amount of grading, construction of a 70-foot high retaining wall when six feet is the limit, multiple variances, and a zone change. The planning staff report states condition number 14 has been added to the resolution requiring appropriate signage is installed and maintained to ensure parking spaces required for the Malibu Inn adjacent parking lot area are not used by non-Malibu Inn customers. I dined at Aviator Nation for brunch on Saturday and the adjacent parking lot was full as you can see in the screen and the Malibu Pier parking lot across PCH was also full on that cloudy day. The pier was packed with visitors while only four people and max five staff was in the restaurant. The total parking on the Aviator Nation side was noted and only 16 spots versus 21 reported, which needs to be checked. Deficiencies for total parking, ADA van accessible parking and 80% full size parking spaces. The city should have an ADA compliance specialist to conduct an assessment of the entire aviation, Aviator Nation facility. I did observe several non-ADA compliance steps leading to the front entrance door. The offsite parking of 1,750 feet offered far exceeds the 300 foot maximum allowed by law. The city recently denied another applicant's offsite parking proposed for 300 feet away. Thus, consideration for parking exceeding this for Aviator Nation must also be denied. Valet parking is impractical for walking 300 feet for timely and efficient parking of vehicles. The liquor license requires full restaurant service, but they are using lounge tables and have huge long bar. The space is designed for large concerts and nightclub events. Noise impacts exceedance from Aviator Nation is documented in the record and justifies noise analysis by an EIR along with recurring large events and the rooftop bar of a proposed hotel. We request you approve the appeal denying the JUPA and request that you direct staff to combine these two parcels development to be evaluated together and require an environmental impact report to identify and analyze the cumulative app impacts of the proposed hotel and Aviator Nation's parking, ADA, and large scale event attendance and to impose mitigations that protect and preserve traffic flow on PCH, public parking, and prevents noise disturbance to the surrounding area. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Richard Gibbs, followed by Satchel Lieberman, Barbara Burke, and Brian Conway. Mr. Gibbs, are you available? Richard, you should- Yes, say yes, that. yes, yes, I saw the prompt. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I feel like, um, I'm about to enter into one of those uh, Saturday Night Live skits, you know, point counterpoint, but I, I won't even do it. All right, so Malibu has historically had as many four concurrent music venues. 
One by one, they've been forced out of business by economic vagaries, by outsider development, by overzealous and misguided regulation, or by poor management. The last one to go was the venerable Malibu Inn. Locals were disheartened to see that the venue was converted to Casa Escobar, which ultimately failed as a restaurant. Aviator Nation has brilliantly, brilliantly brought it back to life as a community gathering spot. They have been extremely conscientious in adhering to the sometimes Byzantine regulations regarding a venue like theirs. Nine years ago, I started the Composers Breakfast Club of Malibu, with just a handful of Malibu composers getting together every Monday morning for breakfast at Coogies to discuss, to discuss what is new in our corner of the industry and to help each other out. We started inviting other interested composers and musicians to join us. After outlasting and outgrowing three restaurants, Coogie's, Malibu Farm Cafe, and Allo, we found a home for three years in the little beach house, part of the private Soho Club. We were averaging about 75 attendees every Monday morning and always had a featured guest speaker or two, replete with video and audio presentations. Past presenters have come from all over the music industry and well outside of the music industry. In March of 2020, we, like everyone else, went virtual via Zoom every Monday morning. And now we are meeting in person again at our fantastic new home, Dreamland. Dreamland is perfect for us. A proper stage, good sound system, plenty of parking, great food, and most importantly, it is not a private club. It is open to everyone in the community. Our past speakers, uh, They've included Flea from the Chili Peppers, uh, Riza from the Wu-Tang Clan, history professor Ed Larson from Pepperdine, uh, classical guitar virtuoso Christopher Parkening, uh, Josh Tickell, director of the documentary Kiss the Ground, Stuart Copeland, founder and drummer of The Police, Nolan Bushnell, the founder of both Atari and Chuck E. Cheese, Jonathan Davis, lead singer of Korn, uh, Diane Warren, nine-time Oscar-nominated songwriter, and Mike Paul Hughes, leading rocket scientist at JPL. We need this community. Greenland is perfect. Our ethos is quite simple. We gather to help each other and bond as a community every Monday morning. Come one, come all. I ask that you are not, that you do not restrict the building of fellowship and the enjoyment of the arts in this arts-based city. Thank you. Barbara Burke, Brooke, I'm sorry, Barbara Burke notified staff that she's unavailable to speak tonight. So our next speaker is Satchel Lieberman, followed by Brian Conway and Helen Mudiman. I want to start by thanking the uh, City Council for allowing me to speak. Um, Councilman Pearson, thank you for the kind words about the food and everyone else that commented on that. I really appreciate that a lot. My name is Satchel Lieberman, and I am the executive chef at Aviator Nation Dreamland. Um, and I'm going to tell you right now, you know, I work between 60 and 80 hours a week to ensure that this is a restaurant. You know, we do not have traditional restaurant seating, but that does not mean that we do not have traditional restaurant service. Um, I've been working really hard alongside members of the community to create a menu that really serves the community and gives back to the community. When I'm not in the restaurant, I'm meeting with local produce vendors, whether it be farms or people I meet at the farmer's market, not only to ensure that we have the highest quality produce possible to feed the community, but to ensure that that money stays within the community. So my only goal here is not to change the amazing community that Malibu has, but to give back to it. I'm currently a resident of Malibu myself. I live four, mi uh, four miles away from the restaurant. And I spend all my time and focus trying to make this the best place that it can possibly be. Um, we consider ourselves a safe haven for creatives of all types, whether it's musicians, photographers, writers, whatever it be, um, chefs. This is where they can come to feel safe and express themselves. Um, so we do have live music, but more importantly, we are a restaurant at heart. And that's really what we try to focus on more than anything else. So thank you. Thank you, Satchel. Our next speaker is Brian Conway, followed by Helen Helene Mudman. Are you available, Brian? I'm here. Can you guys hear me? We can hear you. Great. Uh, so thank you, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tim, esteemed council members. My name is Brian Conway, and I work for a company called Nomad Sound. 
I've consulted and executed multiple sound installation projects for Aviator Nation, including Dreamland here in Malibu. My primary objective is to ensure that the production quality of each of the approved events allowed under the CEP is world class. And I can attest to Friday's show that I feel like we, we really, we hit that world class mark for our first ticket event and we're really excited about it. Um, it was a, a pleasure to meet uh, Mayor Pro Tim Silverstein and, um, and it's been, it's been an incredible experience to have the Composers Breakfast Club and Richard's community and then having Brandon Jenner play and just really seeing what this space can, can become and how it's already is a part of the community. And all I want to do, and I think anybody that works at this, at this facility, all we want to do is amplify the incredible venue that the Malibu Inn was and now is Dreamland. And that's pretty much all I have to say. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Helene Ledeman, and then we'll see who we can circle back to. Hello. Hello, Helene. We can hear you. Or we could for oh. a minute. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Um, so, yeah, I'd just like to say um, that so you can't please all the people all the time, and the arts, especially by its nature, is very subjective. And so one person's beautiful art is another person's noisy pollution. And Ted Newton's observation of uh, when it's too loud, you're too old. It makes me wonder if this is why all humans tend to lose their hearing as we get older and that we have a way of being able to tolerate things that we become a bit curmudgeonly about. Um, anyway, seriously, if the debate is that the Dreamland venue is in anywhere nuisance, I sympathize, but I implore us all to work together to find solutions that can enable us to all live and let live. There are various ways that new technologies can assist, you know, with uh, ways of uh, organizing parking and uh, all the, the new cars that are coming in to drop people off and all this kind of stuff. Um, but Dreamland truly is a very precious resource to our community um, and uh, we need to keep it because I can attest to enjoying fabulous food at this event, uh, at, at various events I've been to. And uh, it is one of the last remaining venues, certainly in this area, and it's bucking the trends of the disappearance of these types of establishments um, that we have seen happening throughout the world. Um, at an alarming rate, so especially after the effects of COVID, the management has shown a great tenacity to have survived these recent years, and I believe they deserve our full support as they've demonstrated their love and dedication to the arts, and uh, they're the last man standing in Malibu. But I understand that the NIMBYs don't like things in their backyard, so they don't share my view, but it seems to me that Dreamland is the last haven for our creative community that people have come to support from miles around and i believe the management's hearts are definitely in the right place and they deserve our support the arts venues are so very important to our communities as a gathering place and as well as opportunities to share ideas showcase amazing humans and inspire us in great to great heights and i fear that restricting this business um, will have devastating effects on the uh, profitability of this venue and that this could actually cause its demise. And if this is not the hidden agenda, then it would behoove us to work together to find solutions for ways to maintain this venue and uh, even forming new venues over time. Um, as this venue, um, if, we, if we don't support it, it won't, you know, it won't thrive. So uh, put our money where our mouth is and find ways to allow it to remain as a valuable asset to the communities that enjoy the delights of Dreamlands, who work so hard to deliver this wonderful product. Am I being shut up? No? Oh, sorry, I thought I heard something. So just to let me say, don't let the NIMBYs shoot us in the foot. Live the American dream. Let Dreamland thrive. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Helene. And Mayor, I still don't see Bill Sampson in the meeting, but we'll try to circle back to Jefferson Wagner. Okay. Jefferson, you should see a pop-up now asking you to, you to unmute on the iPad. Jefferson, if you're at your device, please unmute for public comment.
Mayor, it seems like Jefferson may no longer be available okay. or isn't able to unmute. Uh, so with our last speaker, that concludes public comment. Okay, that brings us back to the appellant team number one rebuttal. So yes, we'll hear from Brittany again, Brittany Jackson. Hi, Brittany, are you available? Yes, I'm available. And Brittany, you have 11 minutes and 45 seconds for rebuttal. Uh, in Mr. Hakeem's comments, he stated that my client filed an appeal for the ulterior motive of competition. My client does own nearby property, but that is not relevant to the issues that we've raised here in our appeal. The appeal is rooted in the requirements under California law to properly review the impact of the entire project. Numerous courts have made it clear that it is improper to split related projects in order to obfuscate the real impact of the full project. Our concern is ensuring that this process complies with CEQA requirements, and we are concerned that there has not been adequate analysis and disclosure of the full environmental impact. In any event, the proposed project should be held to the same standards as have implied to other proposals brought before the Planning Commission and Council. Mr. Hakeem's counsel also briefly addressed the legal requirements under CEQA that forbid piecemealing. He argued that there is no piecemealing if the projects could be in implemented independently of each other. However, one of the cases cited in the letter that my firm submitted on October 21st held that the fact that the possibility that two acts could be taken independently of each other does not mean that the acts are not integral to each other and should therefore be considered as one project. As I noted in my initial comments, the staff reports in March and April 2022 specifically described the reduction in parking at Aviator Nation and the Malibu Inn Motel as directly related and inherently linked. The effect and purpose of the reduction in parking is to free up more parking for use by Malibu Inn Motel. Aviator Nation and Malibu Inn Motel occupy adjoining lots or under common ownership and have interdependent driveway access and parking. California courts have also held that the term project under CEQA should be given a broad interpretation and application. This broad interpretation is to ensure that proposed projects aren't chopped into bite-sized pieces, which when taken individually may have no effect on the environment. If the request for the joint use parking agreement for Aviator Notion and the Malibu Inn Motel are considered separately, then that is exactly what will happen here. If the appeal is denied, then that will provide the necessary parking that Malibu Inn Motel needs for its proposal. That necessary parking and the proposal and approval of it would not have been considered properly as part of the full scope of the Malibu Inn Motel project in violation of California law. Therefore, this request in Malibu Inn Motel must be considered as a singular project and we request that the appeal be granted so that the full scope of the project of Aviator Nation request to amend the parking and the Malibu Inn Motel project can be properly considered together. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Brittany. And next we can hear from Pat Healy. Pat, you have 10 minutes and 45 seconds for rebuttal. Thank you, uh, Kelsey. I just wanted to say that Malibu Coalition for Slow Growth is actually trying to help Aviation Nation because the Planning Commission took away parking spaces from them, which is needed for their events. Um, so you should be supporting our appeal. Also, once the owners questioned or wanted to amend the con conditional use permit, they opened it up for the city to make a, to uh, expand the rights of Aviator Nation if they wanted to and if it was feasible. We, there's no reason at this time that the owners uh, want to reduce parking except to help help get the parking spaces their hotel needs. And that's, that's not right. So um, we suggested 10 different things that we thought would help balance the need for 
for the neighbor's privacy and uh, not create a nuisance and also allow Aviation Nation to thrive. So we would like those to be considered tonight, but if the council is unable to do that because of time and, and other things, we suggest that this remain open, that the neighbors be consulted, that Kelsey be consulted, find out what their plans are, and then, you know, amend the CUP accordingly. And if you decide an EIR is necessary, then um, require one, uh, and uh, then consider, definitely consider both, um, both projects uh, uh, because they are intellect interconnected. So um, I'm hoping that um, this is what the council will do. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Pat. I believe that brings us back to council discussion. The applicant does have a few minutes left for rebuttal. I think we I'm can sorry. hear from Stephen Hakeem first. I'm sorry, you're correct. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you, Stephen. Yes, okay, yeah, this is Alexander Hakeem. Thank you. Um, I wanted to just discuss the parking quickly. I know that it's been brought up. Uh, at the time the CUP was granted 13 years ago, parking studies were done at length for large events of over 100 people. And it was deemed that we were able to sufficiently park all necessary cars on site using the additional spaces on the adjacent lot. Also, when there's a large event, valet, park, valet attendees are required which helps with adding more parking spaces and regulating traffic flow. Also, when large events take place, it seem, there seems to be plenty of street parking available as well. Also, not that we need it, but typically when events take place at night, the Malibu Pier is closed, which frees up another 96 parking spaces. There's also a traffic light at the pier, which could, which could direct patrons directly across the street. Also, when the CUP was granted, Uber did not exist. The amount of cars that drive and park to come to the live events now is far less than it was 13 years ago when the CUP was granted. In summation, we have had and continue to have no history of any parking or traffic related issues at this property. If anything, we are de-intensifying and reducing the occupancy count. Um, we would also like to please again, uh, eliminate the unneeded added conditions, conditions seven, 12, 13, and 14. Um, and again, condition seven is talks about the hours of operation. 12 imposes a requirement for 42 inch barrier wall. 13 requires a six month event schedule. Um, and 14 relates to new parking signs on the adjacent lot. Um, thank you very much. Our council is available. Please, Sina, would you speak now to, regarding any legal issues? Thank you. Sina, you, there you go. Hello, uh, just want to touch on one more thing. Uh, counsel for the Manny brothers did mention that they had cited uh, to some case law. The case law is pretty clear, and I'm going to quote from a California Court of Appeal case uh, banning ranch conservancy. It says, no piecemealing occurs when projects, quote, serve different purposes or can be implemented independently. That's a black and white legal condition, and it's obviously not satisfied here. Importantly, even if this CUP amendment application is withdrawn entirely, the applicants could still move forward with the Malibu Inn Motel project, as long as the project satisfies code required parking. These, these two projects have no relationship to one, uh, one another, as long as the Malibu Inn Motel project, when it does get considered, satisfies its own code required parking. Uh, there's no way that these two projects can legally be considered as one project under CEQA. Indeed, uh, just as another piece of evidence in favor of that, the, the applications were submitted four years apart. Uh, the motel application in 2009, the CUP application uh, for the amendment for uh, AV Nation in 2013, and that doesn't even consider when they were originally submitted and when they were originally granted. So uh, the obvious conclusion of the legal piecemealing issue is that it's just uh it's just the front and there's there's no real there there on the on the piecemealing argument um the other thing i, I heard and i just want to briefly talk about is that 
somebody mentioned the loss of beach parking. Let's be very clear. There's no loss of beach parking through the CUP amendment. This is parking that is required for the restaurant. And that's now being reduced because the restaurant space is being reduced. And the rectification of the parking numbers to match the requirements of the municipal code does nothing to impact beach parking one way or another. That's all I can. Thank you. Well, I, I dread to say it, but I think it's time for council discussion. Mr. Mayor, can you close the public hearing? See, I knew I did something wrong. Not wrong. That uh, closes the public hearing, and now we will have the council discussion. Bruce, you want to lead off? Well, I want to lead off with just some questions um, before I make any comments, which I'm going to wait and hear from some other people first. Um, I guess Richard or Adrian, whoever wants to field these, um, does the record reflect how many events with more than 100 attendees occurred pursuant to the existing CUP? How many of them are allowed? No, how many have, have in fact occurred? This year? No, under the existing CUP. Uh, we don't know the answer to that question. Okay. Do we know when the events with over 100 attendees have occurred under the existing CUP? When have they occurred? Um, okay. We, um, the applicant is currently notifying staff yeah. when those, is that not the, okay. No, uh, this, story, this, is a, this is a 10 year old CUP. Mm -hmm. Do we know when the events have occurred that have been over a hundred attendees pursuant to that CUP? The answer is we we have not been uh, unfortunately uh, due to uh, staff issues and uh, you know uh, turnover we just uh, were not aware of the conditions that were associated with this project so we okay. were not uh, keeping up with the conditions of approval. Adrian, no need to explain why the answer is no. And, and the by the way, no. I think it's it's incumbent upon the applicant to provide that information to you as part of its application, in my view. So. Uh, that, that was not in any way intended to suggest that you haven't done your job. Um, do we know what the parking and traffic has been like over the past 10 years when this this uh, when this venue has had over 100 attendees? Is that in the record? No. Okay. Um, do we know how many security guards have been employed at in the various instances in which this venue has had over 100 attendees? We we don't know that. They haven't provided that information. No. Okay. Um, when is the last time a traffic study was performed to evaluate the impact of two events per month with more than 100 attendees at the subject property? We don't have a traffic study on the property. Okay. So at least not since 2010? I would say, I hope you can hear me okay. I would say that to answer your question, answer your question, Mayor Pro Tem, uh, parking has not been looked at since the 2010 hearing. Okay. And traffic has not been looked at. That's correct. Okay. When is the last time a study was performed to determine the safety of the subject property from earthquakes and floods? That's a finding we have to make. Adrian, I would say once again, I doubt that this triggered that level of review again. So I would say 2010. I don't even think in 2010 any information uh, regarding uh, earthquakes and other hazards were were required to be submitted. Okay. Um, there was discussion of the septic and the ability to handle up to 300 or more attendees at an event. When was the septic last inspected to determine its ability to handle up to 300 or more people in one in one setting? I think uh, I'm not sure if that's a, a question for Yolanda Bundy or the Environment yeah. Health Administrator. And he should be on the call. Was it done in connection with this application or is it from some prior time? I don't know the answer to that. I, I defer that question to them. To, yeah, I think it would be best if uh, there we are. 
Good evening, City Council. Paolo uh, Quinto, our environmental health administrator, is here this evening. So um, if he can um, please be on mute, he can help us with that question. Yolanda, I am asking him to unmute, and then we'll set him up with permissions to unmute himself. Thank you. Paolo, you do have the ability to unmute yourself and uh, go on camera in a moment if you need to. Simple question: Just was was the study was the septic inspected for three hundred or more people in connection with this application or not? Hello, it looks like you're unmuted now. Hello, you are unmuted, but we can't hear you if you're trying to speak into a microphone. Yeah. I think we just heard some. I can skip this one if it's going to unduly delay us moving forward. Maybe when he comes back, we we can we can bring the question. Okay. Up. okay. If if phase three of the um, sewage system is not pursued, um, what is the life of this septic system? What does the record reflect as the life of the septic system, and and what happens if the sewer system is not extended and this system needs to be replaced. Are they able to do that? Um, yes, uh, they have a um, they have an easement uh, on the adjacent property for a future expansion of the existing septic system, provided uh, the existing septic system fails in the future, they'll be able to um, replace it uh, and, and place it on the adjacent property. And that won't be impacted by any external agency action that prohibits further septic in this area? That's correct. Okay. Um, when did Dreamland begin table ser service of a full dinner menu? Do we know that? We don't have the answer to that. We don't know the exact timing of that. Okay. The record doesn't reflect that. When did Casa Escobar last serve a full dinner, me dinner menu? Do we know that? We don't know when they left. Um, that's we typically when businesses you know leave their facilities, we are typically not notified, so we don't know the precise time you know when they. So, okay, so we don't know how it. we don't we don't know for what period of time this was not operating as a restaurant. Is that accurate? That's correct. Okay. Um, at this particular restaurant, as it currently exists, does the record reflect at what time dinner ceases to be available? From for customers, I don't know the answer to that question. I, I I suppose we can go to their website and and find out, but I have not been it's to not the restaurant during dinner time, so I don't know the answer to that question. It, it's not been it's not submitted as part of the application. That information. Um, when dinner is served, it's not. Um, you know, it, they just you know, simply provide um, their information and, and uh, in their application, they, um, you know, uh, they uh, agree to uh, operate under the conditions of approval that are applicable to the property. Okay, so so we don't know when they stop serving um, food. Do we know how long they remain open after food service ceases, if at all? How long who remain open? Do we know how long this establishment remains open after the dinner menu is closed, if at all? We don't. Okay. Um, do we know the ratio of the revenue from food sales to other revenue of the um, business? No, we don't have that information. Okay. Do we, do we know whether food service is incidental to other functions of this operation? We know that. In order to comply with their 
uh, ABC license, um, they do, the alcohol has to be incidental to the restaurant. Um, so they have to have a bona fide restaurant for their alcohol uh, license to um, comply with the ABC requirements. Do we know whether this restaurant food service is incidental to the other operations of the venue, which include more than alcohol service? No. No. Okay. Are minors permitted to dine at the business when it's open other than when an event is occurring? At all I times. I've, I've seen minors uh, in the premise, um, and uh, I don't see any signage that would restrict minors from entering the premise. Right. So you're assuming they can be there until one in the morning or whatever it is, as long as they're with an adult? Um, I, I I don't know if they have any internal requirements where they will not allow them after a certain time. I, I don't have that information. Okay. Um, how many restaurants in Malibu don't allow minors at any point in time in the restaurant other than when they're having some kind of a special event? I, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't, I don't okay. even know if there are any other restaurants that have events uh, that are allowed like um, the Malibu Inn. I'm excluding the events. I mean, we have other restaurants that serve alcohol, right? Many of them. Correct. Do they exclude minors at any point in time from their restaurant operation? Richard, are you aware of any? We can't, we can't hear you. I think you're nodding no. <laughs> I'm sorry. Even the ones that have bars uh, approved with them, I'm not aware of a, a, a minor uh, limitation being placed on the CEP. Okay, that's what I would have thought. How many tickets were sold for the event this past Friday night? Do we know? No. How many of any guests were permitted to attend without a ticket? Do we know? We don't. How many employees were there besides for the guests? Do we know? No idea. How many band members? Don't know. Who else was there? Besides you? <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> um, were the sofas and tables removed from the building, uh, from the from the restaurant area, that what the so-called restaurant area for the event on Friday night? Uh, you know, I I was not at the event, so I have no way of knowing that question. No, 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 no that's fine. The, yeah. the question is is have you has that information been provided to you? I'm not, I'm not faulting you for not having the information. N no, that okay. information has not been provided to us. In fact, uh, I'd say the furniture would have to remain. Um, as it shows on their site plan, even while they're having events. Okay. I've been, I, Yolanda, she can speak if, if she, if the information was incomplete or incorrect, but Yolanda informed me um, that the occupancy limit for an event at this building under the building code, assuming freestanding space, that, that fixed tables and chairs are, 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 there's not fixed tables and other things, is 237, I think the number was, Alanda, is that correct? That is correct. Um, so, good evening, City Council. I, um, I was asked to respond for the maximum occupant load. And as, as on the email, and I'm just going to read the email that I sent you on Saturday morning. That way we are clear on what I stated. There are variables associated with providing with an accurate number for maximum occupant load. The interior configuration, the minimum width of any means of egress components, and the accessible path of travel requirements are important factors in determining the maximum occupant load. Having said that, so that I so for the intent to provide you with a response, assuming that the total interior net area is 1,184 square feet, and the full area function for this is an assembly function without fixed seating and in a standing space, the maximum allowable occupancy is uh, 237. An occupant load um, for a building is determined by dividing the floor area under consideration. 
by the occupant load factor assigned to the function of this space. This comes out of the building code and the fire code. I provide uh, you with a reference, table 1004.5 uh, of the California building code. It also, it's also the same number for the fire code, which established the function of the air of the use and it gave us the specific factor. So if you divide 1,184 square feet per five square feet per occupant, that will give you a total of 236.8. So we run that up. So I just wanna be clear and that's 237 occupant load. Okay, and, and it may be a different number, but the record that we have before us doesn't reflect exactly what the right number would be, right? Um, the uh, information that I provided you is just by the area you're giving me. I have not analyzed the floor area of the space. Could, could I know, be, uh, Yolanda, could it be more than that number? If you if we're talking about um, the specific area that you have given me, 1,184, yeah. that is the worst case scenario. Okay, so it can't um, be more than that. It might be less. Yes. Uh, okay. if, Mm -hmm. That's all I needed to know. Um, was valet parking provided for, oh, never mind, I, I, we, we know that that one didn't occur. Um, does the record reflect how many security guards were on duty on Friday night? Yeah, I think you asked that question before. And yeah, the answer is uh, we don't know because yeah. we weren't there. Yeah. I, 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 did, I didn't ask that one. Um, no. do, okay. do we know what arrangement, never mind, we know that one. Um, how many vehicles were used by occupants of the property, including cars that dropped off and picked up guests? Do we know that? No. Nope. Do we know how many were parked on the premises? I mean, I counted them, but does the record reflect that? No. Okay. Um, record doesn't reflect other than my counting how many were parked on PCH. Is that accurate? Correct. And it doesn't reflect how many might have been parked elsewhere? Um, yeah, we, we don't know that, uh, but I do need to make a point about that. So the original CUP did account for uh, Patriots parking on PCH as well as parking offsite on other properties. And so that was contemplated and it was part of the city council's approval. So right. they, they realized that um, the parking spaces that were being required um, we're not going to be enough for large events. And right. so and, and that was an, would go somewhere else. Right, Adrian. And that was pursuant to the parking study from 10 years ago, right? Well, again, I, I there was no traffic there was, study. A, there was no parking study uh, or or traffic study. And, and uh, oh, so, the, so, the city so the city council 10 years ago didn't do a parking study or traffic study either before the, they there, gave them 340 people there for is, free to, to my knowledge, and maybe... Um, uh, we have somebody here in public works that can answer that question, but um, as far as um, as far as I know, that was not a requirement because the use of the space was a restaurant, and before um, the CUP was issued, and so and there was no change in in use, so uh, there was no trigger for a traffic study or parking analysis. Okay, so so are. Are you are you saying maybe you are not, that before the 2010 CUP was granted, they could have two events of up to 340 people per event per month at the prior restaurant? I, I don't know the answer to that, but it was considered a restaurant at the time uh, prior to the CUP being requested, um, and so the need for the you know the need for traffic study or parking analysis was not was not triggered at that time, which is why it wasn't requested. Okay, so so not only do we not know for, for the past 10 years whether the traffic can accommodate 300 guests at twice a month, we don't even know it from 10 years ago, right? That's my understanding. So it, who knows when we know it from, if at all. Um, did, now, I watched the Planning Commission hearing, and I, I thought I heard someone say this, I could be wrong, that the employee lounge is for employees and their guests. Do you, first of all, is that accurate? Did somebody say that it was for employees and their guests? 
no in fact uh it it was it's always been uh contended that it would be only for employees no no guest uh would go in there and um okay okay there's so there's no such thing as know, an employees there's no such thing as an employees guest right correct okay um the Brandon Jenner event, how many how many people was that? Do we know? Is that a 300 person thing or a 100 person thing? It was over 100 people uh, per the uh, notification we received from the applicant. How how many? Between 100 and 300. We don't know how many. No. Okay. Um, and if I understood Richard Gibbs correctly, he he has 75 people or so when he has his um his group. Is that accurate? I'm not sure how many people, but it's less than 100. It's less than 100. Okay. Mm -hmm. Those are my initial questions. I'll have comments later, but I'll defer to other people who might have questions. Mr. Uring. Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, I don't want to go I, subsequent. Okay, let me go back. I listened to the Planning Commission meeting raised a bunch of questions. A lot of the questions have been raised by Bruce. Same thing. I wanted to know, have they been complying with all the requirements of CUP? I didn't get a, I didn't get a tight answer to that one. I asked them to try and contact the owners and get me good head counts of the number of employees that were there. Uh, we did not get an answer to that. But one thing does trouble me. And, and Adrian, can you go to page 10 of 16 of the agenda report for a moment? You there? Uh, yes. Okay, go down to the third paragraph. And the one, two, third line down starts to read, it says, large events were originally approved to use street parking along PCH and any other adjacent office parking spaces that the owners also owned or would be able to secure at the time of the event. Can you tell me where you found that approval? I'm sorry, you said page 10 of 16? Page 10 of 16, yes. It's the third paragraph down from the top. Mm -hmm. Paragraph starts, as approved, the required parking spaces, da 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 da. And the third line down below that reads, large events were originally approved to use street parking along PCH. Okay. You can, tell, can you tell me where that approval, where you got that approval? Yeah, so I provided a paragraph from the staff report that was uh, uh, written in the report that went to um, the city council at the time they made a decision on it. So, so you're, telling while, me, you're just telling me the staff report now constitutes approval, city approval? Well, the, the staff report uh, described the project um, and in the staff report, they, you know, part of the project description was that uh, parking uh, for overflow would include um, people parking on PCH. So that's. It was in the staff report. It wasn't in any resolution though, right? That was, that's correct. Okay. And let me go back because at the one, one hour, 33 minute mark of the planning commission meeting, mm -hmm. you made a statement that said the, the uh, parking on PCH had been approved with the resolution and the staff report. And I sent you an email with that date on it and that time and said, show me where the, the approval is. And, mm -hmm. and I asked you to get the resolution and you sent me the resolution. There was nothing in there on that. So it was only, it was only identified in the staff report. It was not identified in any resolution, any specific approval by anybody. Is that a fair statement? Um, I did not look in the resolution. I think the question, and, and I could be wrong, but I thought the question you asked in your email was, uh, where can I find this uh, language in the staff report? So as soon as I found it, I said- I said, can uh, you direct, no, I didn't, my, my, my question said, can you direct me to that language where it's approved? That's what I asked you to give me. And right. what you gave me was the staff report. So the staff report is where I found the language uh, and I stopped looking after uh, I provided that information. So I did not go through the resolution uh, to see if there's any other reference in the resolution. Well, let me ask you a question. If it was only approved in the staff report, does that give them the right to park on TCH? 
not that it gives them a right, um, but um, it was, again, part of the project description and it was presented to the planning commission as the, you know, as it was presented to the planning Something commission. that would happen as a result of the project. It, it was presented to the planning and, and your and city council. In your language of the planning commission, you said it was approved in the resolution and the staff report. Right. So I may have spoken if I said in the resolution, but I did remember and, and I maybe not. I again I haven't done the research on whether it's on the resolution or not. But I did oh, find my, that language in the staff. My report. point is this. My point is this, okay? Uh you know, I I read the staff report. Well, I mean, okay, I, I read the staff report and I'm assuming what you guys have got in there is is accurate. I don't want to have to fact check staff reports to find out what's right or what, what isn't. And telling the, the planning commission that it was approved in a resolution was not accurate. Uh, telling us that in this in your staff report here that it was approved, I can't find any any approval other than some statement in the staff report. And I just want to be real careful in doing that stuff, okay? Uh, I think saying it was approved is not a correct statement. And here's my problem. My problem is, look, we have underparked almost every business we've had in Malibu. Pick one. You know, the Sands Motel, Nobu, Soho. Uh, and if we're going to send people out of PCH to park, I, I mean, I think we're going to run into a problem there because we are taking away parking spaces that are supposed to be used for the public. Uh, there was some statement that said they had another building down the road that they could use. Is that correct? Adrian? I'm sorry, say it one more time. They, they had another building down the road that they, they could use to park cars? Yes. Okay. Is that the one that was just leased by the... Uh, uh, that's my understanding, yes. Okay, so they can't, they, they're going to be able to use that. It's probably going to take away some use for that, right? That's correct. Okay, so now we're, we're putting more cars on PCH. And then what we did, apparently they had the five or six cars from the, the uh, Surfrider Motel that were parked on the property. We get rid of that agreement. And those cars are now back on PCH. Is that a fair statement? Yes. I mean, we're just making the case worse for ourselves, guys. And yeah, you know, just, we're just, and, and since 2010, I mean, I think we'd have to be naive to say that the, the traffic situation along PCH hasn't gotten a whole bunch worse. So doing something without some kind of a study uh, just doesn't make a whole bunch of sense to me. But Paul, I'll take it back to you. Okay. One of the things that I have noticed in my years in Malibu is that if you want to find a place to park, you wait until the beach crowd goes home. That's why most events are held at night. And, and if the beachgoers are no longer using the parking on Surfrider Beach, it's natural for people who are going to the restaurant on the pier or maybe across the street to what was uh, the Malibu Inn to park there. After all, Bruce used that one of those spaces. Uh, if you had tried that at three o'clock in the afternoon, there wouldn't have been a place to park there. We're not we're not competing with beachgoers here. And and if you're down near Nobu, yes, it's totally overcrowded. There's no way there's going to be anything to park. No way to park there probably until midnight or later. And as far as the clock tower building uh, being leased or whichever one their their rental, I think they didn't. They rented the Sand Center out recently, didn't they? That wasn't the the clock tower building. I personally have parked at the clock tower building to go to that location. And and what you find happening after businesses close is, and in the evening in the in the tall buildings. Those spaces, in many cases, are rented to whoever shows up. And because there's a night watchman there, and he goes, you can't park here. Really, how much is it to park here? It's 10 bucks. Okay, here's 10 bucks. And I, I think that using, making use of that parking is not a bad thing. And I don't, I don't understand what the object people are going to park on Pacific Coast Highway if there's nobody else parked there. If if they're holding things during the middle of the day, they're not going to be parking on Pacific Coast Highway because all those spaces are gone already. And if if you have questions about how the events were run 
you have the people who run the, the place here in the meeting. And you can ask the chef when he stops serving at night. You can ask uh, the people, you know, how many people they had for that event. If you're concerned with how many people were there for Brandon's show, you could ask Brandon. I'm sure he'd know. But I don't, I don't see the point of asking staff and not asking the people who actually have the answer to your question. So that's that's what I'm saying. And I, I think that we are in danger here. There's, there's a large group in Malibu who's intent on turning Malibu into a retirement community. And if that happens, I'm gonna have to leave because I'm only 69, I'm not old enough to retire. I mean, you can be old at 30 if you want, but I don't, I don't want that with my life. I like interesting things to be available. And I, I think that music is a wonderful thing. I just bought my first guitar in 10 years. You know, this is, and Mikey, I see your hand. You haven't spoken yet. I think Bruce was up before me, though. I think Bruce already spoke. I, I it, think it I, should I, be that we go I, around once at least before we start going back over and over and over. I agree. I had only put my hand up because no one else had at the time. But yeah. okay, absolutely. I'm easy. Well, whatever, whatever you guys want to do. Um, I feel like we have a disconnect in our town right now. I, I feel like some of us are pretty much trying to put a clamp down on community events and the rest of us are trying to encourage more community events. Now I know that's an unfair statement. It's on purpose because that's just how I feel. I'm not going to battle on details with a couple of you guys on that. It seems like we're looking for a problem that I don't know exists. I think what's interesting to me, my first statement would be, why is this is a huge issue now after all this time and money has been spent on this venue. And now we're, <laughs> now we're looking at it. Uh, so we got to fix that timeline. That's messed up. I mean, how is anyone going to come and make a restaurant we all want to eat in if they like think, well, you know, two years later, after spend all this money, maybe they'll say no. So I, that, that just is a point of reference confuses me. I think when we listen to all the speakers and a lot of people, everyone had the point that they felt passionate about. To me, the most credible person here on the negative impacts is Stella, the neighbor across the street. She lives there every single day with the traffic noise, the peer noise, potentially noise at events at Dreamland. And why I say events, I love the question about, is this a restaurant? Well, if you have eight small events and two big ones in a month and you're not a restaurant, what the hell are you doing? You're dead. You're done. It's a restaurant. It's got great food. I've eaten at it twice. One time all by myself. It was early. They just opened. I just walked in and sat there because I was, you know, we we're going to have this hearing. I wanted to see what it looked like again. Have the tacos. They're awesome. Um, but coming back to Stella, even Stella said, and when I talked to her, she sort of said what I'm, I'm going to interpolate both, both times I talked with her. She's like, I just worry that not so much Kelly because she communicates great. There's been a couple little things and I just want to make sure that what if she goes away and what if in the future it doesn't go well? That's what CUPs are for. That's what code enforcement's for. And if Kelly and Dreamland go out of control, I feel confident Stella's going to let us know. Absolutely. We're talking eight small events, under 100 people, actual events, and two potentially bigger ones, which, of course, you have to be able to book. It's not an automatic. It's not just... You just don't book people that bring in big crowds easily. It's actually, you got to know what you're doing. You got to earn it. 
And to me, not only is this a historical site, this is in the right zone. So no impact Stella, I get it. That little group of houses there. You're in you're in the hot seat. You're you're in the middle of it right there. And as was said by somebody, all of this too, and I'm thinking of my daughter who moved into town because it's so damn boring in Malibu, she's gonna slit her throat because she's young and wants to have fun. She and my and my son, who does live in town, they don't go to an event without Ubering. I'm not saying everyone Ubers. I'm not saying there's not traffic. I'm saying it is a different world than back in the crazy horse days. Um, I don't, I, I, I seems like we're looking for issues when I don't perceive there is one. And I think Stella is a credible witness to where they're at. Nothing against, I understand people are concerned about the motel. I get it. The Keens want to build a hotel. These are two different projects. And if we're talking about Dreamland, they don't control anything else but their project. They simply don't. They don't control the motel. They have nothing to do with that. So I don't I don't think that's, I don't think that's really valid. I think the staff going through this item piece by piece has made a case they, they should be allowed to operate. I don't think there's a case here that there's something complete out of control. I don't know. Maybe there'll be a, another noise violation at some point. I don't know. I've seen Kelly. She turned to me. I guess I don't know who told her to call me. I have no idea. How do I do this right? I want to do this right. And if anyone's actually spent the time to talk to her, that's all she says. I want to do this right. And so far, she's doing her best to do it right. She wanted to clean up. There was a ton of code shit she ran into, excuse my language, from the old establishment that was there. It was never cleaned up. She cleaned it all up, and it took her months, and she paid rent for all those months to clean up other people's issues. Yeah, it's a different vision, something I would never have dreamed of. But it's it's quite a vision. I don't know why we get to judge that. So to me, the motion I'm going to have, I, I don't believe this appeal. I think this appeal should be denied. We have a store that is now taking more of the space that used to be open for events, and now it's not. So we have less people. So deny this, we're actually bringing more people in for events, which makes no sense to me at all. I think we have a professional running it who has a history in this. I don't know who else we want. If we have a big restaurant there, another big restaurant, I think way more crowded all the time. It's not even close. Dramatically more traffic. Is that what we want? That makes no sense to me. I don't I don't get that from a from a people amount of people there. Hang on, Bruce. You can have a give me a second here. Just I got stuff all over different pieces of paper. So yes, I, I think and 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 Bruce, you were asking all these questions about all these stats and running their business. Is that what we're doing with every business in Malibu? I mean, they need to report every day how many people are parking where and who and what and all that. I that I don't, I'm not, sh I get you were trying to make a point, but it was like a scary direction to go, in my opinion. And the Hakeems, if you're listening, I'm reading item 12, and I'm not reading it has to be a permanent wall, which would make no sense. It says a fence or a wall. It doesn't say a permanent blockade. You're right, during an event, I don't think they want people wandering during an event into that store. It's, store. it's at night. I'm guessing that, but I'm not reading Hakeem's. That has to be a permanent wall. That's not the language I'm reading in 12 there. So my motion is to deny the appeal and um, see if we get a second and I'll let everyone else, I know there's other hands up. I'll let everyone else talk. Thank you very much. I'll second that motion, but I also have some things to say. 
Okay. I just want to say Paolo's here too, if you wanted him to. That was, that was one thing I wanted to ask. Should, should Paolo speak and then we'll continue here. Uh, yes, City Council, I'm sorry about that. Um, good evening. My name is Paolo Tinto with Environmental Health. And to respond to Bruce Silverstein's question, um, the inspection passed on uh, March 15, uh, 2021, and uh, the operating permit um, is set to expire on May 1st, 2023. And uh, responding to what if the septic system fails, uh, there is a designated 100% future uh, dispersal area located at 22959, and uh, um, that was run through a covenant um, uh, back in 2003. Are there any other questions? No, thank you. Appreciate that. Okay, if I may continue, and thank you, Paolo. Um, I read this staff report in great detail, and I'll just say one more time for the record, this is a historic location in the commercial zone of the city. I've listened to all the comments from the appellants, from the applicants, uh, from the public, from the council, from the staff members. The motel project is a separate project. That's abundantly clear. That's not before us tonight. Um, I think Richard Gibbs has lived here I don't know how long, I'm guessing around as long as I have. He's brought something that's vital to the city in trying to bring together creative people on a Monday morning where we are getting fewer and fewer venues all the time. What's the goal? Like Paul said, is it a retirement community? Like Mikey said, there's so little to do anymore for anyone of any age. And yeah, my kids Uber everywhere they go to. Why wouldn't they? Um, think of some of the things that that site has been used for in the past. And I realize that's not what we're considering right now, but let's just remind ourselves. Dick Dale, Steele Pulse, Lenny Goldsmith, John Watkin, the Martinez family, Brandon Jenner, all the fundraisers for local philanthropies that have been held there, the Malibu Guitar Festival, all of the youth sports teams that have had their end of season lunch or dinner there. One thing after another, that's the fabric of this community. And we have somebody who's trying to continue that. So I'm ready to vote on this motion. Mikey, Mikey made it, I seconded it. I'm ready to vote. Well, I'm glad to call the question, but I feel like Bruce's hand has been raised, so well, go ahead. Okay. So um, I didn't make any comments before. All I did was ask questions. And in response to Paul's point that I should have asked the applicant, um, I've actually been advised that it's best once the hearing is closed to keep the hearing closed. Uh, so the questions were, they've, they've had their chance to make their record, and I wanted to know whether the facts that I had questions about were in the record, because it's the applicant's obligation to make a record to satisfy us to approve their application. Um, you know, I hear all the people that speak, all the all the public speakers, and it, it the, again, it's just, just, as, just as my conversation with Brian Conway went the other night, it's, it, it, the passion is clear and, and the desire is clear. And I, and I get that. And, you know, I didn't grow up in Malibu. I came here 11 years ago and this is a cool place for me. I, I think it's pretty cool also. You know, Mikey made the comment that it seems like some people just don't want to have gathering places and the rest of us do. And, I'm going to take the rest of us not to have meant there's a minority that don't and there's a majority that do. He just meant that one group doesn't and one group 
does. I don't really think it comes down to gathering places, but I think that, that that's exactly what's going on here. There are, there's a segment of our population that actually takes the vision statement to heart, that Malibu is a unique um, ocean. I, I don't have the words committed to, to heart, but it's, it, it's we, we abjure suburban and urban conveniences to have this rural environmental paradise. And um, there's a lot of people that, that live here that gravitate here not to go to venues, to, have, to live in a sleepy, quiet town, or sleepy and quiet as it can be anyway. And they're not retired necessarily. They're just people that abjure the hubbub that other people love and they get excited about. And, and then there's, there's other people that live here that love it. There's people that live here, I'm sure, that would love to see it look like the Vegas Strip. And that's an exaggeration, but I mean, you know, so there are different, diff residents have different views. And we have a vision statement though, that actually adopts one of those views. And that is the law. Um, I happen to think the, the vast majority of the residents are of the vision statement um, variety. I could be wrong, but I think they are. And again, in any event, it doesn't really matter because that's what the law is. It's the law because that was clearly the vision of the founders of this city which includes some of you, um, and it has gone awry over the years. Um, Mikey made the point that this is about dreamland. This isn't the owners, I mean, the motel next door. It's, this is the owner's application. Let's, let's, let's not, you know, and let's, let's recognize what's going on here. Nobody cares about seven spaces. I mean, as seven spaces. That's because that's what the application is, reduce seven spaces. There's no doubt about it that Hakeems want the seven spaces so they can build their motel or to make it easier to be able to build a motel. And by the way, their lawyer, this is, this is something I've experienced, I've witnessed over the years, is lawyers often when they make the last word, they actually say the thing that helps the other side the most. That sometimes you're supposed to just stop because you're ahead. And the last statement their lawyer made was that he cited some case and said, it's not tied if the other project is completely independent and can be implemented without this one. There's a serious question of whether the other project can be implemented without the reduction of parking spaces. We won't know that, however, until that comes before us. Um, but again, it's, it is the Hakeem's application. And, and same reason, why are the Manny brothers opposed to it? Because they don't want competition across the street. They don't want that motel. It has nothing to do with whether they're, it has nothing to do with whether there's going to be seven less parking spaces or not. They don't want a hotel. But you know what? They're allowed to make their legal arguments. And if their legal arguments are correct, it doesn't matter what their motivations are. Just as, just as if the Hakeems are correct, it doesn't matter what their motivations are. And Pat Healy, she's part of that group that wants to keep Malibu calm and consistent with the vision statement. And there's nothing, not only is there nothing wrong with that, that's actually what we're supposed to be doing is honoring the vision statement and the mission statement. So this is this application is denominated a appeal and to amend the CUP and JUPA. But a, if we voted to deny the appeal, let's let's say Mikey's motion has been seconded and we take a vote, we go around, go around and we unanimously say let's deny the appeal. We haven't moved the needle because we still need to grant an application. We need to make findings because we have to independently make every finding required to support the grant of the application. It's a fiction that this is an appeal. The appeal is what got the appellants before us and forced the application to be considered by us. Denying the appeal, full stop, doesn't get anywhere. I mean, so I'm not even sure what that motion means, but we can vote on that when, we, when I'm done speaking if, you, if, if, if we're ready to call the question. Um, this is de novo consideration. We have to go through the code. We have to find, as a matter of fact, and that's why I was asking all those questions, a series of, fact, of findings. I don't, I'm not capable, and I don't believe the city council is legitimately capable of making the findings that are required to grant the requested amended CUP and JUPA. It's elegant. The, the, the applicant wants us to look at this very elegantly. All we're doing is taking some restaurant space away 
and I question whether it's a restaurant, the mere fact that they serve food doesn't make it a restaurant. We have de statutory definitions and the statutory definition of a nightclub, I'm sorry, of a restaurant is that the food service has to not be incidental to some other business. And if this business makes a lot more money on other things than it does on food service, it may well be incidental. And I asked the staff, do we know whether the food service is incidental? The answer is no, we don't. I asked a lot of other questions that, are, that we need to know the answers to, to make the findings in a responsible, legitimate way. Um, so, what I was going to move is that we do one of two things. One is that we either, by the way, if we deny the application, it doesn't mean that they don't have a CUP. They still have the exact same CUP that was granted 10 years ago. They may be in violation of it. They may not be in violation of it. That's to be determined at another time, but no one's revoking their CUP tonight, no matter what we do. Nobody's shutting them down, no matter what we do. The question is, do we have the basis to grant them an amended CUP? Do we have the basis to make these findings? And here's my problem. If we make the findings even with an inadequate record and give them the new CUP, six months to a year from now, if an investigation is done and it's concluded, this isn't a restaurant, it's a nightclub, where 300 people is really too much, we will have solidified the permissibility of it as of today based on today's record. And it will take a completely different record to revoke that than it would have taken without amending it. So my, my proposal was gonna be, we either deny it, which means it's, it's, it's the status quo, or we give the applicant an opportunity to ask us to send it back for further fact finding so we can determine whether we do have a basis to grant the application, because I don't believe we do. Alternatively, I have a motion which contains a number of- a motion on the floor. I, I, I understand that, I'm just talking. I'm not making a motion. So I have a motion prepared, which actually grants the application, although I don't believe we can make the findings to grant it, um, but has a number of conditions, separate and apart from the conditions that were placed on this by the planning um, department. Planning Commission, I'm sorry. Um, I won't go through them right now, but my, my point is, is once your motion to deny the appeal is voted on, we still have more to do. We still have to decide whether we can make the findings. We still have to decide what conditions, if any, to place on it. And I'm actually going to ask for the opportunity once this motion is voted on to make that motion. And if this motion is either gonna get voted down, in which case, I'm not sure where we still have to proceed, where this motion's motion is going to get approved, in which case we still have to proceed. I mean, Trevor can ex Trevor can explain that. Merely denying the appeal doesn't get us anywhere. We have to make findings to approve an application. Trevor, that correct, Trevor. Yes, I, that's why I was going to. I wanted to clarify the, the motion whether it was just to deny the appeal or was a staff's recommendation, which includes adoption of the resolution that approves the um, the the uh, the amendment to the CUP. I believe Mikey is probably going to be willing to adopt the recommended action. Yeah, I meant the recommended action. I'm sorry, I didn't go all the way. I was trying to let other people speak, okay. so I apologize for that. Karen, will you accept that uh, clarification? Yes. All right. Well, okay. I'm, I'm not. We got a motion and a second. All right. Nothing's changed. I'm not finished my comments then. Um, I don't believe we can make a number of the findings that are required to adopt the staff's recommendation. Bruce, you walked into this I'm with an opinion. No, no, and, no, Paul. And, and you, you, you've been this way the whole through. Um, actually, I've heard a lot of things that have persuaded me that some of the conditions that I thought ought to be placed on it ought not to. So I did keep an open mind. And by the way, I want to address the comment that I'm somehow prejudiced because the Manny brothers filed an, a, a filed a lawsuit in which we were named and I was named as defendants. I don't even understand the logic of that. That would mean that if I was anim, if I had anim, anim, if I was animus, animus. yeah, towards the Manny brothers, which I don't, because I respect people's rights to bring lawsuits, and their lawsuit was dismissed, and they didn't pursue it. But if I had an animus towards them, how in the world would that make this a bias against the Hakims 
who are on the other side of the Manny brothers. I actually think the Manny brothers made legitimate arguments, but I don't even, I don't understand the logic of that. Um, but in any event, I don't think we can make the following findings. And if you're gonna make them, make them, but I'm entitled to say which ones I don't believe we can make. I don't believe we can make finding three um, because the appellants, uh, okay, I don't think we can make proposed finding three. I'm not gonna go into the details. Um, MMC finding A1, that the amendment will not affect the finding previously made and the use is still a conditionally permitted, oh, I'm sorry, this is the quote, a restaurant with an interior capacity excess of 125 people is conditionally permitted use in CD1 zoning district. So what? If we don't know whether this is a restaurant, and, and again, you need to look at the statutory definition, not your common sense belief that because they serve food, they're a restaurant. The statutory definition of a restaurant includes a place, I'm sorry, is a place that serves food, but not if it's incidental to its primary business. And we don't have a record to determine what the primary business is. Food is available seven days a week there, it, Bruce, it, come it, on. It, you can make food available seven days a week and make $1,000 a week off your food and make $10,000 a week off entertainment. You're not a restaurant. Your food service is incidental to your restaurant business. You are a nightclub. That's the way our statute works. I don't think we can make MMC finding A2. I don't think we can make MMC finding A3. I don't think we can make MMC finding A7. I, I, if you make those findings, you are ignoring the law of Malibu. You are just doing it because you want to approve something that you like. It's a shiny object, you like it, and you wanna give it to the people that are here testifying on behalf of it, and you're, der you're derelict in your responsibilities to the residents of the city if you do so. Thank and you we'll for have an election and find us. And we'll have an election in a couple of weeks and find out where the residents stand on that. Okay. You know what? I may find out that I'm 100% wrong, and actually I'll have a different view if I do. But you all may find out you're 100% wrong too, and this is irresponsible. We should send this back for more fact finding so that we can determine whether this is an appropriate application. It won't prejudice the applicant. They will still have the CUP that they have, which actually lets them have slightly more people until it's determined whether they should have this CUP. This is all about getting more spaces for the motel. That's what this is about. Go ahead, you can vote over now. Can you please call the roll, Kelsey? Councilmember Pearson? Councilmember Pearson, you're muted. Yep, I am. Uh, yes, thank you. Councilmember Fair? Yes. Councilmember Yuri? No. Mayor Pro Tem Silverstein? I remember in the planning commission when the first application was made, um, Commissioner Smith said, hell no. I think I'll join him, but he was looking in the other direction. Mayor Rosanti? Yes. Motion, Motion carries. Okay. Fortunately for us, 4B has been delayed. I want to remind the mayor that it is uh, well after 1030, dramatically after 1030. You're right. Dramatically after 1030. We will leave the library for yet another day. It's 12.07 and I'm, I'm gonna adjourn the meeting. I, can I just ask a question? Sure. It, what we just did then approved all the conditions that the Hakims were opposed to, right? We, we approved the, the, uh, the recommended action of the staff. The resolution that's attached to the uh, staff report. It's the same CUP that the Planning Commission approved. Uh, it's the one that's in the staff report. I believe there was a minor change about signs about parking or something. There was a okay. All right. Does this have to come back for a resolution to be approved or we're done now? It's done because the, the resolution is fully attached and is adopted as proposed. Okay, thank you. Okay. I think we schedule 6A for the next uh, the next meeting. Yes, Mr. Mayor, we'll bring that back for the November 14th. Thank you. And I don't recall us agreeing to uh, a, to adjourn in memory of anyone. So we're adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Adios. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.